Council meetings after tonight, and uh, then we'll have an election, and then we'll start fresh. So the way we like to start our council meetings off, we just uh, had an in-camera session. We like to start off with singing of old Canada. So I'd like to start by calling up Juliana Berry. She could come up to the microphone. Is Juliana Berry back there somewhere? Oh, there she is. Now hold on. Now hold on one sec, kiddo. Yes, you can bend that down if you like to bend the mic. One that one. Whatever one you prefer. Just make sure the little red light's on. And I'm going to just read a little bio uh, first before we get started. Mm -hmm. So no, I understand your mom is the real estate agent from Revel Realty. Is that right? Yeah. Okay, good. That's good. Well, I was told by the broker down there that we should mention that. <laughs> <laughs> he said he'd give me a discount off my next listing if I did that. So hopefully he's listening. So Juliana, you're nine years old. You're in grade four at Cardinal Newman School here in Niagara Falls. I understand that you started your dancing at the age of three. You've been studying at the Linus Hand Drama School since you were six. You've performed in The Little Mermaid, both with Linus Hand Productions and at your school. You're involved in competitive dance at Miss Kathy's Dance Studio. You're always at the top of the pyramid, and your smile and expressions always steal the show. So I understand also you'll be performing in the high school musical playing at Ridley College this summer. So Juliana, we're looking forward to having you sing Old Canada. So whenever you're ready, kiddo. not an easy thing to do and it puts a lot of pressure with all the people watching in the cameras <laughs> just want to say you did a fantastic job we're really proud of you and good luck with high school musical thank you all right great job <laughs> thank you. Gentlemen, we're, or, oh, was he just doing some technical things? We're all good? Okay. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start this council meeting off. First issue of uh, business is the adoption of the minutes of the May 8th council meeting. Moved by Councillor Morocco, seconded by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Oh, did you have a comment, uh, Councillor? No, you're just in favor. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you for that. Disclosures of a pecuniary interest. Do we have any disclosures of council? Councillor Campbell, Councillor Strange. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, check number 415856, made out to myself. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Yes, Your Worship. Check number 41826, made out to myself. Okay, thank you for that. And I believe there's one for myself too, but I'll bring this forward later in the meeting, uh, Mr. Clerk. I just don't have it at my fingertips right now. Yes, Councillor Creator? There's also one for myself, and I'll have to bring it forward, same as the mayor. Okay, thank you for that. 
So now we'll move on. And I apologize for the noise. Uh, we, as you know, we've got the new cladding going on the outside of the building, and uh, they're still working away. So it's good news, bad news story. So <coughs> mayor's announcements. Uh, we've got some obituaries. Uh, Russ Stout, former employee in our business development department, passed away. Uh, Raymondo Montana, the father of Charles Montana of our municipal works department. And also Robert Bob Smith from Crawford Smith and Swallow, who recently passed away. So her condolences to all the above and to their families. I'd like to th thank council representatives, Councillor Strange for representing the city at the annual ride of silence in the Kent school graduation. And to Councillor Morocco representing the city at the annual Niagara Regional Police tug of war with the Niagara Falls, New York police. And Councillor Crater representing the city at the schools in bloom seed bomb event at the Fairview Cemetery. Announcements, uh, congratulations, Councillor Strange, for the second annual KO for Kids charity event, <clears throat> the boxing event where 100% of the funds raised goes to support Pathstone Mental Health and the Box Run Charitable Foundation. We understand there was upwards of 1,000 people in attendance. Uh, congratulations to Councillor Strange for spearheading the event. I know uh, you brought me to meet the, uh, the red boxers one night and the blue boxers the other night to encourage them. Very difficult thing that these people do. They're non-boxers training to go into the ring uh, for a great cause. And, uh, is, and I know you're joined by counselors Peter Angelo, uh, Campbell, Crater, and Thompson. Did you wanna sure. say anything about it? Yeah, it was a great night. And um, Cario, I'm sorry. And, and Councillor Thompson part of I, the, I said that. committee, so he's part of the committee. Of course. Part of the job. <laughs> I didn't say that part. <laughs> so I wanna thank everyone for coming out. Um, the last four months, these boxers who never put a glove on a love before, trained their butts off and you came down and. I tried to actually start kind of a donation. Everyone could punch you for five dollars, but you can go for it. I um, want to thank Kim Rossi and, and all the boxers, the uh, Noel Buckley from the, um, from the Scotia Bank Center, Boxing Terror, all the officials, all the sponsors, because she <coughs> just an amazing job. Um, Carla Cario for singing the national anthem, and so our 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 donations this year, we made, we just found out almost $83,000. Wow, great job. Well done. For Mental Health, Ronald uh, McDonald House, and Childhood Cancer Research to Max. So thank you very much, and we're hoping to top that uh, next year. So thank you. Well done, congratulations. Uh, our youth forum was hosted by our Mayor's Youth Advisory, and you can see the Mayor's Youth Advisory here in the front row. Uh, Councilors Iannone, Crater, Thompson, Campbell, Morocco, and Peter Angelo attended the event. Many topics were covered, including transit, culture, public health, and the youth voting age. Water for Life exhibition opening took place at our museum, the Niagara Falls History Museum. Congratulations to city staff, Clark Burnett, Kathy Moldenhauer, and the team for a great night at the museum. We hosted more than 30 artists from all over the world. World-class art was on display here in Niagara Falls, and art with a, me with a message, all addressing the issue of access to drinking water all over the world. The exhibit is on until September the 9th of this year. Uh, I was also joined that night by Councillor Campbell and Councillor Morocco. The Hope Awards for Pasto Mental Health took place recently with a special guest speaker being Ste Stephen Page of the Bare Naked Ladies. I was joined by Councillor Thompson, Crater, Campbell, and Morocco at this event. The annual Ching Ming Festival took place recently uh, at the Fairview Cemeteries uh, in recognition of Chinese heritage. I was joined by Councillor Crater. Uh, the Rotary Rib Fest took place this past weekend. It was a very hot weekend. And I know Councillor Morocco was a part of the event that took place and it was a successful uh, Rib Fest at the Niagara Square and looking for a new location for next year. The B City designation, the City of Niagara Falls staff did a great job. Mark Richardson, Jeff Holman and team engaged in the community. Uh, where the green burial section is at the back of the Fairview Cemetery, it's been enhanced with 10,000 pollinator plants. We're now the 13th city in all of Canada to be designated a bee city. And I got to hold one of the frames of bees, which was kind of neat too. It's neat being able to hold. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I was just glad I didn't get stung. That was my biggest thing. I was uh, excited. Uh, the Jewel and Cell Spa Grand Opening took place in the Good Life Plaza, the town and country area. I was joined by Councillor Thompson for the opening of that. We had last weekend the Playground uh, Opening Blitz Day. In conjunction with our Parks and Recreation Month in Ontario, we had a great day where we opened up five city playgrounds. Glenview, Stamford Lions Park, Gus Monroe, Westfield, and Prince Edward Park, plus 
our outdoor fitness equipment was a major highlight on the Lions Legacy Trail right out front of the Gale Center on Stanley Avenue at Thorold Stone Road. If you go by now, you can see people working on it all throughout the day. It's a pretty neat thing to see. People are actually breaking in to, to the area to work out. So now it's all done and finished properly and they don't have to break in. They can go work out for free in the fresh air, the sunshine, and do the cross training. Walk along the trail, work out, and then continue. It's a great opportunity that a lot of bigger cities have. Well, now Niagara Falls has it too, where you can go exercise and work out for free. Already all the parks are set up with equipment and we've seen a huge jump in usage and activity. And some of the features specific that we talk about, number one, accessibility. Uh, number two, we've got uh, AstroTurf with recycled tires underneath, so if you fall, you don't get hurt. There's no broken glass, there's no needles, there's no cats doing their business in the wood chips. Mm -hmm. It's a much better situation, they're very, very busy. And we're joined at the ribbon cuttings throughout the day with counselors Morocco, Thompson and Strange. And a big thank you to Paisley, Janbury, and our city staff who came along with us for most of the day to make sure all the openings were a success. Canada Day is coming up very soon. It's gonna happen on Queen Street, July the 1st, Sunday, July 1st. The highlights will include a one in 5K run for the St. John's Ambulance beginning at Oaks Park at 9 a.m. Then the parade will be at 11 a.m. along Victoria Avenue to Queen Street followed by opening ceremonies at 12.30 at City Hall in live performances, Greg Fruin, art show, car shows, Kid Zones, Toronto FC Trophy will be on tour, Inflatables, Chill Zone, Wing Fest. It's gonna be a lot of great events and it's all gonna be free. The other events kick off the weekend from Friday at 4 p.m., Jazz After Four, to Saturday, Busk for a Cause, from 1 p.m. till 7.30 p.m. Lots of ways you can enjoy the Canada Day weekend. And lastly here, uh, Marie Henry left a bequest to the city. Uh, later in the evening under tonight's bylaws, the city's gonna receive a bequest from the estate of Marie Henry. As part of her last wishes, she left a substantial gift. Spe uh, she specified that it would be used to enhance the Willoughby Historical Museum. She left $93,000 during her life. During her life, Marie was a longtime advocate and supporter of the museum and rural history of Niagara Falls and she wanted to make sure this money was left behind for a legacy. Over several decades, she was a member of the Willoughby Historical Society, the Museum Committee, and the Niagara Falls Board of Museums. Miss Henry fostered important partnerships with local historians and organizations. When resources were limited, Miss Henry used to volunteer to help keep the museum running. Whether donating a simple can of paint or extending an invitation to someone new, Miss Henry always was looking out for the best interest and inclusion of everyone around her. She was a mentor and a friend to many. She'll remain a key figure, figure in the legacy of the museum. So in honor of her wishes to respect the real and simple value of the museum, staff will determine a fitting project in the spirit of Marie's long involvement and dedication to the museum. We'd like to acknowledge Maria tonight for what she's done. And one last thing I'd mention is uh, Chief Boudelier, we're very proud of him. Uh, we understand that his son Justin came first out of a class of 1,400 engineering students at U of T. So this year he's gonna go do research in India uh, for the summer, and afterward he's gonna continue his postdoctoral work at MIT. So Chief, congratulations, we're very proud of you. <laughs> Next council meeting will Tuesday, July the 10th. So on with the rest of the agenda. So first up is recognition of Josh Horton. So if I could call Josh up here to receive some recognition. Josh here, okay. You can meet me up in the center, Josh. And uh, Frank's his coach is here too. Frank, you wanna come up and join us as well? Give me some protection. Congratulations. I've got a little read up here. Oh, I got the wrong one. I gotta grab the wrong one. No, it's good. Okay, let me just grab the other one. So, Josh Horton is the winner of the Provincial Gold Medal 
at the 2018 Ontario Jiu-Jitsu Open. So I'd like to read a little bit about Josh, give you some of his background, and then maybe if his coach has got any comments. And then we've got a couple little uh, gifts that we're going to give to him in recognition of great job that you've done. So Josh is 12 years old. Leading up to the Provincials, he's been training with his coach, Frank Angaro, two or three times per week. His coach has called him nothing short of a prodigy. Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is often regarded as a discipline whereby smaller, weaker people can successfully defend themselves against bigger, stronger, heavier opponents by using the proper techniques. Therefore, it takes precision and elite skill to excel. Coach Ngaro recounts, Josh Horton's gold medal win was like this. He won all of his matches and won a gold medal in the most spectacular fashion of any match I've ever been involved with. Coach Frank says that Josh was getting beaten in the gold medal match and his opponent had thrown him around and was pinning him down the entire match. He was down 11-2 and in need of a submission to win. With only nine seconds on the clock, Josh escaped the pin down, somehow managed to get on top of his opponent, submitting him with one second remaining on the clock. Josh's discipline and success in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has inspired his coach and many other students around him. Congratulations to Josh on your Ontario Championship gold medal. Well done, Josh. So the first thing I'd like to do is present uh, Josh with a certificate on behalf of the city and city hall. This would be a good photo op, so if you guys want to come up here, bring your, uh, your gi. Is that what it's called, a gi? Bring it, bring it. It's called a gi, yeah. It is a gi, okay. You want to hold it up a little bit? Where are we looking? Right here first, right here, Mike. Okay, and Dale. Thank you. Get that? So first we present with a certificate. That's uh, for you. And secondly, give Josh a, uh, this is a City of Niagara Falls backpack uh, with some swag. Just a little reminder, so when you're, uh, you got some stuff to carry, a little water bottle and whatnot, I'll just kind of remind you, we're proud of you. We're proud of what you've done. And he sets a great example for other youth in the city. Congratulations, Josh. <laughs> Coach, would you like to say a few words? Um, yeah, Josh sets a great example. He's in our, our started in our Bully Busters program, uh, which is a, a program that's designed to give kids the tools verbally and physically to deal with bullies. Um, but not just an inspiration and a leader to kids. Uh, I don't think a lot of people would have got up with nine seconds left uh, after the round that Josh had and put the effort in the last ten seconds into winning the match. Uh, I told his parents, I think 99 out of 100 people would have just kind of sat there and let the clock tick down, but um, that was really something else. So it's, uh, it's uh, definitely a leadership trait and uh, something that I think all people uh, can learn from. Very impressive. Well done. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, he's a Prince Philip student. He's going to end up, uh, he's going to Meyer, by the way, uh, uh, guys. <laughs> so anyway, we're really proud of him. And, and you know, any great athlete or uh, performer needs a great coach. And, and you need a great coach that believes in you, that's going to work with you. And you need committed parents that are going to drive you around to all the practices, to all the competitions, and the money. Right, it's a team effort, and I know uh, uh, any successful individual has a team around them helping them get to where they are. So hats off to the parents, the family, to the coach, and everybody that helped them get to where he is. Well done, Josh. Josh, I just, is there any way that you could put that submitting move on? On the mayor? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but that's not okay. <laughs> so, not right now. Thanks very much. Okay, Pat. This for you. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, we should say something. Wait, hello from Josh. You're from everybody from Josh. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, I just want to give some recognition recognition to my coach. Uh, it's been a long journey, and I uh, I appreciate all of his efforts that he's put into coaching me. Uh, okay. <laughs> Mom and Dad. <laughs> 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 and how the experience was it overall was a good experience did you yeah were you nervous I was very nervous so what made you dig down deep and not give up with the last nine or ten seconds uh, well she had given up 
she had thought she had won the match. She was on top of me. She just started to let go, and that, that's when I knew I had to sweep her, and I got off. And I didn't even do the proper techniques. All I knew is that I had the choker out, so I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> the choke was proper. It's all bad. Famous last words. Okay, next on the agenda, I don't know how we top that, but we're going to invite the Mayor's Youth uh, Advisory Committee. We've got Erica George and Jacob Zhang, co-chairs of MIAC, who are going to give us a year-end update. So you guys can come up to the microphone. It's all yours. Perfect. Do we have the slideshow? Yeah. Okay. Right there. Where? Oh. <coughs> you might want to pull that mic up to you, too. Uh, Jacob, I don't know if you, yeah. So you both got a mic, yeah. All right, so the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee of 2017 to 2018 year. Now, so what is our mandate? Well, to provide a voice for the youth of Niagara Falls while advising council of important issues uh, for the city's younger population, and to encourage facilities and programs that will enhance the quality of life, health, and well-being of youth in our community. To really provide a voice for the 4,000 youth in Niagara Falls and really allow um, politicians and decision makers to hear what we want and what we are, what's important to us in our uh, city. So MIAC is made up of three subcommittees as well as our whole committee. So our first subcommittee would be Youth Voice and then we have Giving Back and Just for Fun as well. Now the main committees. So f when we started off the year, we started off the year with our leadership day. At our leadership day, we did team building activities to get to know one another. And we also identified all of our strengths and weaknesses to try to bring together all of our positive attributes to see how we can work together as a team and be the most productive team that we can possibly be for the city. So the City of Niagara Falls Youth Volunteer of the Year Award. Uh, each year a person is uh, selected and this year MIAC has the opportunity to choose <coughs> the recipient. And Mohini, uh, alumni of uh, Ma Niagara Falls Mayak was lucky enough to receive uh, her, this award and she's currently very involved in the community helping out many organizations so congratulations Mohini. And the Jim Mitchison scholarship presented by the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee we will uh, announce the recipient later tonight but uh, she is very involved in her school community as well as the uh, greater provincial and um, city community. Um, another initiative that we do as the Mayor's Youth Advisory Council is that we help out at Santa Claus Parade. So we use all of our committee as well as encourage other volunteers to come to help have the day run smoothly to have a good event. We we're also fortunate enough this year as a MIAC, we received an Ontario 150 uh, grant from the government and we were able to implement this to do a mental health summit, which was for uh, students and teachers and everybody alike um, throughout the community. And we're going to invite Daniel up to come speak a little bit more about this. Greetings to the council and everybody, all of the guests. Um, so this committee, like Erica said, we invited students. We had um, two portions to the uh, wellness summit that we put on. We had the daytime portion where we held sessions with guest speakers uh, about mental health for the students to listen to. And then we had a nighttime portion as well where we had Valerie Pringle come and speak to the community. So that was open to everybody. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna talk to you about is um, also important in our committee because it's something we do outreach um, we call it our night at the community uh, soup kitchen. So we actually did two nights this year. We go to the community soup kitchen and we help to serve the um, hot meal to people who need it and can't provide it for themselves. Uh, we went in the, I believe, November. So we went in a uh, winter time this year and we also went during March break. And then the final thing I'm going to talk to you about is the community clean sweep. So everybody knows about the adopt a street campaign. So we do, we have, um, we adopted the Morrison Street, uh, and we go from approximately Oaks Park to Portage Road, and we clean up that street. So we went twice this year, and we keep the street clean and pretty. <laughs> So the Rotary Adventures in Citizenship. So each year the Niagara Falls uh, Rotary Club uh, do select, uh, um, give Mayak an opportunity to select one of their uh, members to take part in a four day 
trip vacation to Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Essentially showing um, Parliament Hill, uh, the Canadian History Museum, and many aspects of Canadian life, as well as the City Hall in Ottawa, and to really let us understand what it means to be Canadian, and to really get us understanding of everybody in different provinces. Oh yeah, so basically it was um, every, there was representatives from each province in Canada, and we all kind of just bonded over this four day. <laughs> so the Mayak promo video uh, has been in the works for many, many months and years, <laughs> but we finally got it going, and, and we worked with Reese Fisher and Stillman Entertainment to bring this idea to life, really incorporating the five high schools in Niagara Falls and allowing youth to be in it to really show what is Mayak and who we are and how we can give a voice to the youth in Niagara Falls, as well as any grade eights or any um, people who are, want to continue to be on Mayak or want to be in the future to be on Mayak. And we're gonna invite all of our chairs up of our subcommittees to talk about their specific subcommittees. So Sonia. Hi, my name is Sonia and I'm the chair of the Youth Voice Subcommittee. So this year for Youth Voice, we had we planned two major events and our first one was held in October of 2017 and it was the Niagara Student Summit. And so this summit basically provided um, students the opportunity to experience the classes and electives that weren't really offered in their schools. And so the day kind of started off with our keynote speaker, Eric Wolfel, and then um, they continued with the sessions in the end. And uh, the day went great. I think the students loved it and overall it was a great experience for all students. Um, so our second one was the Youth Forum. It was held uh, this May actually um, in the Yuck Yucks room at the Fun Zone. And so the main point of this Youth Forum was uh, to talk about a variety of topics that um, like impact the youth. And so um, we will be providing a report to, to Council about the overall results of it. And I wanted to thank all the council members that were able to attend the afternoon session because I think the students really enjoyed it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Bianca, and we're the co-chairs of the Giving Back subcommittee. So this year we hosted a Christmas party at the Reverend Roof Retreat for the children there. And so we decorated cupcakes, we played a few games, as well as going bowling. And we also were able to host two skate nights this year where we raised money for a project to share. We also implemented different activities during Mental Health Week. So we had therapy, t uh, therapy tales come for the students. We had uh, mental health trivia to promote mental wellness as well as like coping with mental health. And we also had a photo booth to promote Mental Health Week. We also provided prizes and we selected a winner for the Niagara Catholic District School Board poster and video contest. So hi, I'm Chantal Tran and I'm a member of the Just for Friends subcommittee. So this year, after a lot of planning and persistence, we were able to pull through and hold our annual School of Palooza. <laughs> And School Palooza this year had many changes. One main difference being the location, as it was held indoors um, in the Scotiabank Convention Center, unlike previous years being held on Queen Street. And despite the concern among the high school students being that the event was very different, the outcome was a lot better than we had anticipated, um, as School Palooza went very well and there were very few issues. Um, all student, students from all five high schools were able to come together, show their school spirit, as well as enjoy a fun afternoon filled with games and activities. As the vice chair of MIAC this year, I was asked to close the, um, our deputation. So um, I'd like to first thank all of our annual sponsors. So these are people, they've been longtime sponsors for us. So we'd like to specifically thank the Canadian Tire uh, Rotary International and the Niagara Falls Fun Zone. Next, I'd like to thank our other sponsors. So these are just yearly. They um, not every year they come, but usually. Uh, we'd like to thank the RBC, Brock University, the District School Board of Niagara, Niagara College Canada, Niagara Peninsula Energy, Niagara uh, Rankin Construction, and Walker Industries. And we'd also like to thank Council for letting us be here today to talk to you. Hello.
So now we have the pleasure of introducing the Jim Mitchinson Scholarship. So the scholarship was developed by the Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee to recognize students who give back to their communities and their schools. We recognize that there's a lot of scholarships out there who is based on grades and um, just GPA or averages, but not so much focusing on the MIAC qualities and characteristics that define a leader. So Erica will continue to give some background as to why it's called the Jim Mitchinson Scholarship. So Jim M Mitchinson was a dedicated to giving back to the city of Niagara Falls throughout his life and embodied the values of leadership and involvement throughout the community. Jim Sum, Tom, was looking for a way to honor his father. It was agreed that the scholarship was an excellent fit and he will be generously funding the scholarship in his honor. We would now like to invite Tom Mitchinson and Nandana Parak to join us at the front with the mayor. City and uh, City Council together. Okay. So Nandana is graduating from Ann Meyer Secondary School. She saw these great uh, grads coming out of Meyer. She's been extremely involved in school activities for her entire career. She's been involved in the Key Club, instrumental and student-led service group, helped grow the club to over 40 members. She worked to help children from around the world. She's the VP for the Model United Nations Club. Uh, oh, check. Can you that? <laughs> she founded a new club, the British Parliamentary Style Debate Club. She's currently the VP of Student Council. She's also volunteered many hours in our community, such as Code Niagara, volunteering at the Greater Niagara General Hospital, volunteering at the Temple, fencing. She's also an accomplished fencer. And that's with swords, not with building fences, uh, Council, <laughs> just to make sure so we're clear. She placed 14th in Cadet Women's Sabre in Canada and also fenced on the Brock Varsity team. She's volunteered fencing camps and she's helped teach youth to fence as well. So I'd like to now ask Tom if you'd speak and maybe say a few words and uh, help us uh, recognize this uh, incredible young lady. Yeah, she's a wonderful representative of the community, I have to say that. And as a Former graduate of A. M. Meyer Secondary oh, School. Oh, <laughs> I told Nanai that I did that before her father was born. <laughs> uh, anyway, I just wanted to say that my uh, community service was a, a big, big, big part of my my dad's life, and uh, I'm really pleased to have been able to find such a nice uh, mix between what he stood for and what. Uh, people like Nanai uh, uh, can uh, realize in their school life. So uh, it's just wonderful to be able to honor her today, and I, I really appreciate the city's willingness to allow me to um, be the sponsor of this award ongoing. So I hope it's a long history. say a couple of words, what the experience has meant to you and all your uh, years working your way through the community. Um, well, I'd just like to start off first by, of course, saying thank you to the MIAC um, Mayor's Youth Advisory Committee, of course, Mr. Mitchinson and City Council and all of Niagara Falls, but also um, a big thank you to my family, um, my parents, my grandparents, um, and of course my school, my guidance counselor, and yeah, these experiences have, they've been, they've been an integral part in my high school experience. I came from a really small school, um, from elementary school, going into a and Meyer knowing exactly one other person. So joining student council and key club and model UN and everything else that I did were, you know, they helped me to make connections and meet new people, make friends, and yeah, it was, they really helped make my high school experience even more great. So thank you, awesome. thank you everyone. <laughs> So let's get for a picture. This is a good time. Come on and tell me to everybody. We'll get a nice picture. Are we too far away for you? Or? It's good. It's perfect. Thank you. Do you want to see what that is? Sure. So, go ahead. Okay, 
So this check is for the scholarship that we have now presented to <laughs> you. Um, so it's a uh, two, two five hundred dollar um, scholarship, I guess. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. So ladies and gentlemen, I want to say uh, she is a classic example of the Mayor's Youth Advisor. They're all represented in this front row. I want to acknowledge uh, Beth Angle. Beth, if you please stand up so we can acknowledge you. This is our staff liaison. <laughs> she works tirelessly every year with our group. And people often ask, parents often call, how can I get my kids onto the Mayor's Youth Advisory? Well, we don't make that decision. It's made by the principals or the guidance counselors. And it is definitely a select group. Unfortunately, everybody can't be in it. But what I can tell you is it's a good group of people that work off each other's energy. You know, you ever hear that saying, sometimes the vibe attracts the tribe. And the vibe is very high level uh, vibrational. They're a great group of people. And so many of the Mayor's Youth Advisory have gone on to do incredible things, whether it's at Harvard, whether it's, they've gone on to do incredible things. They're a great group of kids. It's not just about looks good on the resume, it's about self-development and leadership because these are the leaders that we're passing the torches off to in the future. And I can tell you, the future is well at hand with this kind of group of people that are engaged, that care, and they're very, very bright. Matter of fact, when I look at their resume sometimes, I wonder what I did through my high school years. <laughs> so on behalf of the city of Niagara Falls, specifically thank you to all the mayor's youth advisory, but specifically tonight as well, our special honoree, we'd like to give special recognition. Can you help me do that, please? Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Oh, yes. Sorry, uh, Councillor uh, Thompson. Uh, I had to get up for a minute uh, because I'm probably the only one in the room who had the opportunity to sit on so many committees with Jim Mitchison. He was a personal friend for many, many years, Ohio Brass, right? And uh, I can uh, certainly confirm uh, his passion for the city and all of the work he did. And it's so nice to see his son here to uh, uh, put that scholarship forward and recognize young people in the community. He was a great guy, good friend. Thank you. Thank you. I don't want to rub it in. <clears throat> yeah, I should have. <laughs> I told you they were smart. They're running out of council chambers. <clears throat> Next up on the agenda, we've got the Niagara Arts Showcase. We've got Phil Lococo, we invite him up, president of the Niagara Arts Showcase. He's gonna address council on their upcoming signature event. Welcome. Thank you, Mayor Diodati and, and council. And uh, hello to my fr fellow citizens in the gallery and at home. I'd like to first tell you a little bit about Niagara Arts Showcase. Niagara Arts Showcase is a nonprofit registered organization that supports Art, artists and musicians in Niagara Falls, and we have a mandate to also bring artistic and cultural experiences to the citizens of Niagara Falls and in the Niagara region in general. We have um, exciting news that I'm privileged to share with you today, that our signature event, the Carmel Fine Art and Music Festival, which has been going on for about four or five years now, started at Carmel uh, Monastery and now has moved to Fireman's Park. Um, successfully last year with about 1,500 1, guests. This year we're looking to double that and then some. We're looking at having 4,000, maybe 5,000 people this year. We are going to have that kind of success because we have been working very hard behind the scenes. Our board of about 15 different citizens uh, who are connected throughout the community uh, have been looking to make this an amazing uh, addition, an amazing example of what's being produced from the city's culture plan. The culture plan is becoming a really successful element of the city's fabric and we're very glad to be part of it. 
this year on Friday, September 14th, 15th, and 16th at Fireman's Park. We will be uh, having hosting several events uh, that uh, start off with a, an evening gala on the 14th that will include uh, a 140, a 100 by 40 foot tent in behind the building at Fireman's Park in which we'll have a full a AV complement with stage and uh, screens and we will be featuring, <coughs> excuse me, we'll be featuring uh, music by a Juno award winning, um, uh, I'm forgetting their name. there we go, Liberty Silver. <laughs> Liberty Silver would be playing with, uh, with uh, uh, a couple of other up and coming acts. Uh, and we, um, on the Saturday, we'll be featuring bands in the amphitheater and on that stage. And it will happen again on Sunday when the uh, theme will be a country theme on that stage. Inside, that, inside the building at Fireman's Park during the whole weekend, there'll be 50 artists, um, uh, vendor artists, selling their, uh, their beautiful pieces of uh, their souls because that's what artists do and out in the in the fairgrounds there will be art installations that will be interactive and educational uh, there will be a family focus there will be a kids zone that is going to be bigger and better than ever and uh, we're very much looking forward to all the partners that we have worked hard to uh, get on board. And those include the Stanford Center Volunteer Firemen, the city itself has given from the Culture Fund, the region of Niagara, the First Ontario Credit Union, Niagara Energy, uh, Niagara Peninsula, Peninsula Energy Inc., the Niagara Native Center, OPG, Google, the Meeting Place Church, the Slate Communications, uh, Stevenson Rentals, Canada Service Corps, um, Canada, the Canada Cultural Spaces Fund, Niagara Symphony Orchestra, Carousel Players, Heartland Forest with their handmade puppets and a troupe. We have Adventure Rooms, the Confucius Institute from Brock, and about to sew up uh, partnerships with uh, the Trillium Foundation. Anton uh, Gaber from the With the Water of Life project will have a presence at our festival, which you just heard about. The Factor Music Foundation, Fallsview Casino, the Niagara Chapter of the Musicians Union, and the Can Ontario Arts Council. We have worked really hard to get all these people on board. We have a much bigger budget this year, and we're looking forward to having uh, everybody hear about what we're up to and coming out to the park on that weekend to celebrate the amazing artistic culture that Niagara Falls has. Now, in order to uh, pull this off, we might need a little help from council, and so we have an ask and that ask would be uh, a list of a few different things. Uh, we would need to declare the Caramel Fine Art and Music Festival a municipally significant event. Uh, we would like the uh, council to waive any fees or permits regarding the planning of the event. Uh, the, we would like to extend the noise bylaw until 11 o'clock on September 14th and 15th. And we would like to provide uh, to any, the city to provide any assistance with promotion on the city website, newsletters, and social media, and relief from the sign bylaw so that we can place signs throughout the city to let the citizens know about what we're up to. Um, and there might be, there is a, finally one other uh, consideration that will involve our partnership with the uh, uh, Winter Festival of Lights, who are do kindly donating several different uh, uh, art pieces, you might call them. If you recall, on Dufferin Islands, there's a very large moose and a very large deer, and they will be out on the grounds, lit up while the concert's happening on the Saturday night. And uh, they may help us with presenting a fireworks show at the end of the Saturday night pr performance as well. It will be nice to see a professional grade fireworks show for the citizens of Niagara Falls. We're proud to be able to help make that happen. So, uh, Ms. Jim, uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, sorry, uh, and Council, I hope you uh, take those uh, requests under consideration, and uh, thank okay. you for your time. We're happy to make that. Okay, M moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Campbell, uh, that we uh, grant the requests that were in the presentation by Mr. Lococo for the Fine Arts Festival. Uh, if there's no further discussion on that, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and, and we got approval on that. So you're That's good to fantastic. Go. Thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, Thank you.
Okay, next up, we've got the Alistair Young Endowment Fund recipients, and I call up Lori Moffitt and Dino Fazio, co-chairs, to introduce the recipients. Good evening, City Council, Your Worship. Appreciate the time allowing us to be here. <clears throat> Regarding the Alistair Young Arts and Culture Endowment Fund, for a bit of brief history, in 1997, Mr. Alistair Young generously donated a 1932 Ford Roadster to the then Arts and Culture Com Commission. That car was raffled off, and the proceeds raised from that sale were used to establish an Arts and Culture Endowment Fund to, to support artistic development in Niagara. Recipients of the fund are residents of Niagara Falls and active artists in any creative arts field, as well as involved with the arts community on a volunteer basis. An award of, of $1,000 is, is awarded every year, and this year we actually had a tie between Jana Jaros and Aaron Berger, so they will share in that prize. Uh, I'll read uh, Yana's uh, bio. The flow of rocks, the movement of wind, the synergy of light, and the sound of lapping water. Working primarily in acrylic on hand-built canvas, Yana Yaros is a visual artist whose paintings are journeys through the wilderness. Her style is influenced by many sources, including music, books, current events, theater, nature and contemporary, as well as historical Canadian artists. Utilizing color, shading, line, and observation of structural formation, she evokes the scene in front of her. Her love of camping trips within the wilderness and around Lake Superior in Northern Ontario led her to focus on the landscape and its experience, capturing the moment with varied brush strokes, some jut, some flow, some subdue, calm, and some jump. Yana trained and graduated from the Ontario College of Art and Design University in interdisciplinary arts. She also attended Fleming College and holds a diploma in cultural heritage conservation and management. She currently works in the arts, heritage, and cultural fields and is an active participant in the arts community and is focused on developing her art, both creatively and from a business perspective. She's joined local arts organizations and strengthened her skills by attending weekly life drawing sessions. During the last two years, she has become involved as a volunteer art model coordinator, presenting a workshop for existing and would-be artist models, and has taken over running the weekly studio session and has written a handbook, Life Modeling and Art Models Guide to Posing and More. Mr. Aaron Berger has been active in the Niagara Falls Arts. Yes, please, let's give it to her. <clears throat> and we will be bringing them both up too. Don't think we're not going to just. You know. <laughs> we're just going to take them and go. Mr. Aaron Berger has been active in the Niagara Falls Arts community for close to 20 years, <coughs> making his theater, his theater debut at age 15, acting at the Fire Hall Theater, and eventually studying dramatic arts at Brock University. He started playing music professionally at 17 by performing cover songs across Niagara Falls. His artistic path has been a winding road since then. His goal is to make art resonate with people that makes them feel deeply in whatever medium he is working, whether it be music, acting, or public speaking. His aim is to connect in an honest and heartfelt way with the audience. In order to do that, he needs to reveal something of himself. This is why he thinks it takes courage to be an artist. Aaron has had extensive community involvement, putting many hours into serving and cooking at community of meals, helping with drum workshops, playing music and singing songs. Aaron has participated as a performer at fundraisers for Jillian's Place, Hannah House, for people whose houses burned down, for rescue animals, you name it, he's, he's performed at a variety of events. He consistently brings a unique enthusiasm and grace to community events and his big heart and great sense of humor. Aaron has performed, composed, and written five prominent historical projects in Niagara, including Petticoats, Boots, and Muskets, a musical satire of the War of 1812. He has performed music, uh, played, sorry, he has had his music played professionally in plays and film and performed or written and or collaborated on five musical albums, three of them being his own. And he has also created a one-man show called Back from the Brink, featuring songs and personal stories with a focus on mental health and resilience, which featured prominently on CBC's radio, The Story From Here. Your Worship, I'd like to bring forward Ms. Jana Yarls, and Mr. Aaron Berger. Congratulations. 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 Congratul
see it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get it on me or anything. It's so beautiful. Stop laughing. <laughs> Do you have something in your hand? I do. <laughs> 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 sure. I'll pretend. Uh, maybe say something? Uh, share uh, with your experience? Uh, well, I'd like to thank the RP Heritage and Culture uh, Committee and uh, for uh, providing this award. Um, it helps definitely in the professional development and in the education and the journey along the way. Very appreciative of the financial support. Being an artist is very difficult. Many of us struggle to make enough money, so very grateful for that support. And I want to acknowledge Laura Moffitt with her work with Fire Hall Theater, and uh, you know all the all the people here who do work for youth and support youth in whatever their passions are, including art making. Thank you for doing that, and there are big ripple effects for all those actions. So thank you for that. Thank you. Now, finally, the the wolf guy. He's got to be dying sitting with that costume on. The Great Wolf Lodge Car Wash. I'd like to introduce our fire chief, Mr. Boudelier, who's going to let us know why we've got a wolf in the council chambers. <laughs> Your Worship, uh, if I may take a second. <clears throat> for the past 10 years, Great Wolf Lodge has been running a car wash for charities in our community. In 2016, Great Wolf Lodge approached the fire department and the police services to do a joint effort by holding a car wash for two years. In 2017, the Niagara Regional Police were able to use the money to support the Special Olympics, which were held, as we know, in the Niagara region. This year, the money is going to the Firefighters Charity, which happens to be Camp Bucko. Camp Bucko is open to burn survivors between the ages of seven and 17. The camp has grown to over 70 children attending the week-long camp in August. There is no fee for them to attend. They are a registered charity providing the program through generous donations from firefighter associations, service groups, and other public and private organizations. As a board of volunteers from across Ontario plans for camp all year, with the donations they receive, allows them to fully fund each child's stay at the camp, their transportation, and provide them with the souvenirs from camp, otherwise known as some swag. And if you're at the camp car wash this year, um, one of the campers that's here tonight was wearing some of that swag and it was a beautiful hockey jersey. The residential setting encourages campers to participate in a variety of social, recreational and therapeutic activities that promote self-esteem. The development of leadership skills fosters personal growth and at the camp, kids have a place where they can be themselves without feeling different or alone. And tonight we have Keith Simmons, the general manager and vice president of the Great Wolf Lodge to say a few words and to make the presentation to Patrick Howlett, a board member from Camp Bucko, Addy Villardo, a Camp Bucko camper, Ken Henry and Justin Canistro are chairmen of our fundraising committee. Keith? Yeah, you wanna come right up here, uh, Keith? You can, we can bring everybody up here. If you guys wanna come up this way. We have a warm wolf and a young Addison who has a soccer game, so we will be brief. <laughs> An amazing group here, I will be very quick. Um, three things. First of all, community. We feel an incredible privilege to be part of this province, this region, and this great city. 
Number two, the Wolf Pack. We're 740 strong under in our little log cabin on the Niagara Parkway. We've had the incredible opportunity over the years to, I think we've given over a million dollars in this region, in this province. And thirdly, um, our incredible partners of the last two years, the NRP and the NFD, Niagara Regional Police and the Niagara Falls Fire Department. We've had a two-year partnership, and it is especially an honor for us today to pass over this wee little check from four hours of car washing. It got close to the 420 of the lineup, but we brought her in. Um, so uh, we're really happy to, you know, 131,000. Wow. That's crazy, right? <laughs> it's a total honor for us to be able to do this. Um, the fire department, Jim, uh, Justin, um, thank you so much for the hard work that these folks do. Ken, this is for you to take back to the fire hall. This is just a little bit. These guys for nine years, guys and gals, have pushed through so many vehicles, like a thousand cars in an hour. That's pretty wild, wasn't it? <laughs> I came back from the airport and this one was just digging in. You know? uh, so you're going to get to soccer now? <laughs> so, uh, I'd like to say thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be part of it. I'm going to break protocol with one big. Arr 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 Is that working? <laughs> well, it works. Yeah, it works. Yeah. Right. That's it from us. So, ladies and gentlemen, and for anyone, I got to tell you, as I drove down Stanley Avenue, or uh, uh, Victoria Avenue, you got to imagine there's police all along Victoria Avenue, cars, the parking lot's jammed, the fire trucks are out there, the firefighters are out there. The water's going and the cars are lined up right down Victoria Avenue, the entire way just beyond the 420. Unbelievable. And to all this to raise almost $132,000 for, for charity. Uh, how about a, head, a total tip of the hat for a great <laughs> Uh, we're just going to jump back to the last report real quickly. Uh, the Alistair Young Endowment Fund. And uh, Mr. Clerk, could you just uh, walk us through the uh, report we have to take action on? There was just a corresponding report. Uh, we thought it would be best to list it with the check presentation. And then, of course, I uh, didn't bring it to the attention of the mayor at the appropriate time. But the recommendation there is that just that uh, council formally acknowledge uh, uh, Aaron and, and Jana, the 2018 uh, Arts and Culture Fund recipients. Okay, thank you for that. I've got it moved by Councillor Campbell, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you very much, Mr. Clerk. Mm -hmm. uh, next up, uh, we're almost through this first part. Regional housing. Uh, Karen Frazier is here to address council regarding affordable housing, mixed income neighborhood policy. So Karen Frazier. <coughs> Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, ladies and gentlemen. Um, did anybody lose their power last night? I was in the middle of doing this uh, report and my power went out for over an hour and when I got back to my laptop, nothing was there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, um, I'm kind of not knowing if I'm on track or not. But we had an electrical problem at Palmer Park last night where the, the pole caught on fire, two phases crossed. Oh no. And everybody that was, by the way, at Palmer Park couldn't leave Palmer Park because the fire department was there. They couldn't leave and eventually they allowed them to drive out across the field to get out onto Stanley Avenue. So that's what happened with your power. Oh, okay. Sorry to hear about that. Freak accident. <laughs> right. yeah. Could you pass this two, two pages? Two pages each. Okay, so I'm here to talk tonight about affordable housing. 
during the recent provincial election, uh, affordable housing solutions were spoken of by all four parties, some with more feasible plans than others, but it was then, as it is now, a very important issue. I also heard from the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce and the Council of Canadians and much of the public. I, have, I myself have been on the Speaker's Bureau of the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network for over a year and I uh, could fill in the first half of my presentation with all sorts of statistics on how dire the um, situation here in Niagara Falls is, but I'll skip all the, all the sad parts and hopefully we'll go on to something a little bit more proactive. Uh, where we stand right now is the region has a number of different programs um, like Housing First, Niagara Renovates, Welcome Home, Niagara, and community programs, all of which are important but are after the fact, after people are in trouble. So what I'm hoping today is that this deputation, um, we can agree to do a few simple steps that will lay the groundwork for affordable housing in Niagara Falls. We have um, the downtown secondary plan that uh, <coughs> has been written up for all of us to make use of and um, uh, council staff, citizens and developers have all had a chance to, to go through it. And we have five years ahead of us to make this plan benefit the community of Niagara Falls. Uh, that's the way I see the plan, that we're all working together to make it um, happen. I know that there are many council reps, staff and citizens working in the arena of affordable housing. Um, they seem to be working at different levels and different um, initiatives. And um, sometimes because everybody's doing their own work in their own corner that uh, a little bit of confusion comes forth. Uh, one of that is just the di different names. We have mixed income neighborhoods housing for all, uh, neighborhoods first, and others. But the main theme of them is that the city promotes affordable housing by being firm with the developers and builders that one out of every five units be affordable. That means one of every five units of every apartment building, condominium, and townhouse be affordable. That doesn't mean that we are mixing incomes of opposite extremes in one building, but that one-fifth of the units are approximately 30% less than the most expensive unit in the building. All that means is that one-fifth of the apartments don't get granite countertops or six-foot showers. Why would the builders be upset with those kind of savings? Months ago, I went to a meeting and we were talking about this concept and one person said, oh, the developers aren't gonna be happy with that one. It's never gonna fly. But I thought back to um, when the accessibility rules first came in, the builders weren't happy to incorporate something new back then. And then um, the builders were not happy when green space rules um, were instituted, but they learned to live with it. And I'm certain the same thing will happen with affordable housing expectations, as long as city staff and council will stand by the policy. As far as I can see, that starts with small and important changes for all of us. The downtown secondary plan says that there's an, a, a potential to bring an extra 2,500 people into the downtown area. And it might surprise you that people that are in regional housing, 70% of those families 
actually have income, like they're working families. So I think that we have to be proactive and ahead of the curve. Small details may help. I have a few motions that include small changes that hopefully will get us down this path. Originally, I was supposed to do this deputation months ago, but time and circumstance got away from me. And now I feel like there's even more pressure than ever because not only do we have only a few council meetings left in this year, but next council um, might look a little bit different. And um, I know that you are all um, supportive of affordable housing and I'm, I'm sure the next council will be too. But my concern is not so much with the new council but your directives to staff in the meantime. I, I'm sure a lot of new proposals will be coming through the door in the ne next six months, and I hope tonight will help staff know in which way they can move ahead. So I have a few motions, and you have a copy of them. Um, the first motion is council to receive and accept the region's uh, neighborhood first report. You have, um, you have the, the front page of that report. The report is actually 50 pages long, so I didn't want to do that to you. But this report has actually been kicking around regional uh, council in the regional building for the last two years, and it just keeps getting forwarded to other c committees, and nothing has really um, been done too much with it, um, but it's full of good ideas, and some of those ideas might be um, might not work for Niagara Falls, and some ideas, you know, work better for Toronto or whatever. But I'm hoping that staff can can glean from that. So, council to receive and accept the region's neighborhood first report in principle, and send a copy to the city of Niagara Falls planning department with instructions to initiate possible outcomes as it pertains to the city level. And that the Niagara Falls City Council reconfirms their support for the region's neighborhood first report. <coughs> and that Niagara Regional Council, Niagara <coughs> Housing, Smarter Niagara's uh, Steering Committee, and the Housing Working Group, and the Niagara Poverty Reduction Network um, are all copied on this motion. So that was the first motion. Okay, well did you want to just do all three motions? Sure. And then uh, we've got councillors that do want to speak to this. Okay, uh, motion number two was that city, Niagara Falls City Council invite the, um, the applicable Niagara Regional Housing staff to present an update on the Regional Neighborhood First Report at Niagara Falls City Council. And I just kind of put a star thing in there that this is time sensitive for us and for you. And then motion number three um, just was a little bit off that track. I noticed that this downtown secondary plan does talk about affordable housing, uh, mainly led through the, re the region, but it's only one or two sentences, whereas in the grand Niagara secondary plan, it's talked about much more in depth. So I thought that the two plans for one city should, should correspond and um, be the same for both parts of the city. And the consistency is the key to lowering administration costs for different parts of the city. So those are the three motions. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got Councillor Campbell. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, <coughs> I'm going to make a few comments and then direct comments to uh, Alex, if he could. We've been working on a, a committee uh, with regional representation as well as uh, an ad hoc committee with respect to homelessness. And uh, it's moving forward to the point where perhaps, Alex, you could give us uh, some direction as to what's going to happen in the foreseeable future. And I do believe, Karen, this will include all the things that you're looking at. Okay. Hopefully. <laughs> it's going to be a good start. Okay. Mr. Levitch. Uh Yes, Your Worship. You might recall that uh, Council uh, set up an ad hoc committee on homelessness in January. 
Uh, we've had a few meetings uh, on that. We met last week with uh, Adrian. I'm sorry, I forget her last name at the region. And, and, um, and um, Kathy Cousins at the region. And uh, we've agreed to move this to the next step, which is to meet with the uh, uh, housing providers now. There are a number of providers who are providing um, homes for those without permanent shelter. And um, so we will be meeting with them in the near future in talking with the regional representatives. They identified there is some uh, funding options, uh, but it does need to work through a agency that is already providing um, some, um, some supportive services to the community. Um, we also talked about the uh, need of shelters as being just one form of housing in the continuum. So in terms of housing, not only do we need to provide emergency shelter, but we also need to provide long-term affordable housing. And so we will be looking at that. And uh, this council is probably aware that uh, we have a consultant looking at our uh, uh, motels and hotels along Lundy's Lane and other sections of the city, which do provide shelter for those without uh, permanent homes. And we are looking at that as a means to uh, providing uh, shelter for people uh, as a permanent residence. Um, the consultants will be bringing back an update report, if not July, that then to the August meeting, and we hope to have a conclusion of that study in the fall after the election. <coughs> so uh, there are a number of initiatives that we're working on, and I hope that addresses uh, Councillor Campbell's uh, question. Yeah. Thank you, Your Worship. It's just that in this process, we've discovered that there are a lot of well-meaning organizations in our communities that are all operating in silos. And the communication between the silos is minimal. And we're hoping to break down those silos so that we can put together uh, a plan that's going to help with all the concerns that have been presented here tonight. It's my understanding that the region had to leave provincial dollars, correct me if I'm wrong, Alex, on the table because they couldn't find anybody to take those funds to move things forward in our community. So this needs to be done. I, I do believe we're on the right path. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Council, I'm guessing, number one, we don't have this neighborhood's first report, so we can't make specific motions to something we don't have, but certainly part of the motion could be to, that we receive could, could we uh, Could I make a motion sure. to, to, to move this, these recommendations forward to the committee that we're working with at the region? Um, uh, sure, I just, like I say, I'm worried about the timeline, and I'm worried that, like, I know there's so much work that has to be done for those that have already, you know, in dire straits. I just saw that this was a plan to uh, catch people before they get to that well, point. I, I, I but I know it all has to be worked together, so it's I think great. if we could have done it yesterday, it would be done. Yeah. And it's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to move forward, and I, I, I'm pleased to see that it's, it is. Great. Okay, so, so that would be my motion, Your Worship. Motion okay. by Councillor Campbell to move this forward, including the, Niagara, the neighborhood's first report to the committee to be dealt with, seconded by <coughs> Councillor Morocco. I know Councillor Crater would like to speak to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karen. Uh, and by the way, congratulations on running in the last oh. uh, provincial election. Thank you. Congratulations. I, I didn't want them to cross pollinate. So. They didn't. Um, <laughs> I just have one comment, Your Worship. We're fortunate to have our regional councillor, Selena Val Patty, here, who is actively involved at the region in affordable housing. And Selena, would it be appropriate through you, Your Worship, to maybe make some comments? Because a lot of things that are being brought to our attention are through the region. Yeah, great idea. Thank you. Councillor. Thank you very much for that, um, Councillor Crater. I almost said Alderman because I go back a little ways. And thank you so much for your interest in this because there is such a great need for affordable housing throughout all Niagara communities, particularly <coughs> in Niagara Falls, where the waiting list for a single person waiting for housing is 16 years. Yeah. So that's a lifetime. No, we have never left money on the table because <laughs> we weren't ready. But the thing is, and, and now there are 40 units planned for Niagara Falls in this year. Um, the thing is that sometimes we have to be shovel ready. So it goes to the community where the shovels are ready. And yes, you are right. There's so many groups working on this. And sometimes in silos and one doesn't know what the other is doing. But the, 
the real point is that everybody understands that affordable housing is critical. It's one of the determinants of health. Secure housing is as important as food, a job, and every other determinant of health. So we are moving along at the region. We have um, an ASD, an, an alternative social housing report, coming on July 19th. We may be making some changes in the way we deliver housing. I think we need to make changes, Your Worship, because we can't keep doing the same things and expecting different results. But the secondary plan downtown sounds great if we can get one in five units. There are developers in the room, I know. I don't know what their thinking is, but it sounds doable and I hope the council passes this. And I Thank know you. there's so much happening that those, uh, the second motion about having updates, uh, verbal updates here at council. Uh, so that you can answer questions when people give you a call. I think that's one more piece to the puzzle. Okay, so we've got the motion, uh, duly seconded. Uh, yes? Uh, the motion again is that we're gonna, did you wanna maybe repeat that, uh, Mr. Campbell, Councillor Campbell? Well, the intent of the motion is to take the uh, information that Karen has presented to us tonight and move it forward to the committee that's, uh, that's already working towards uh, the goals that she's looking to establish. Affordable housing um, in these centers that Alex is a member of as well. So it'd be all part and parcel of our planning. And they're working with the region as well in their public health department. Okay, so we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved unanimously. So thanks very much, Karen. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. Okay, next up we've got Street Hoops Canada. Karen Stern and Michael Kemp would like to inform council of their upcoming three-on-three -three basketball tournament. So welcome. Uh, so good evening, and that'll be all I say. <laughs> <laughs> do we have the yes. presentation up? How do we do um, oh, you do this? I can't. Yeah. Stand up. Okay. Well, thanks, Council, uh, Council and Mr. Mayor, for having us today. Um, seems that, like it went by very quickly. We were just chatting with you about this last year. Uh, you can see that we're going with a different brand this year. We actually created this as a committee because last year, you guys know, we brought in Gus Macker. It's an American company. Uh, Costs us a little bit of dough to bring them in. Um, and we are all about giving as much money to the charities as possible. So trying to cut as much cost out as, as we possibly can. So eliminating that cost was, was big for us. And now this gives us a bit of a sense of pride that we've created our own thing. We can grow it the way we want to grow it. And essentially the ultimate goal is to, to create a Gus Macker type of brand here in Canada with, with Street Hoop. So um, I'll run through what we're looking to do again this year. Um, yeah and uh, what the tournament's all about and the success that we had last year. So um, it was really put together in about six weeks last year and we were able to bring in 116 teams down to Queen Street um, and brought in about 2,000 spectators throughout the weekend. We were fortunate with weather that it was 33 degrees every single day, so no rain, but uh, a little bit hot for the players. But at the end of the day, everyone had a great time. It was very competitive and um, we really started off on the right foot. So now we're just moving that Gus Macker brand into Street Hoops. And the goal this year is to get up to 250 teams. They say uh, with Gus Macker, you usually double the amount of teams that you have after your first year if you had a good first uh, weekend, which we did. So that's what we're really hopeful for. Like everything though, the everyone procrastinates as much as they possibly can. So no one has registered really for this tournament up until the day, the, the deadline day. And that happened to us last year. So we had about 116 teams register within a two week period. So the push this year is again, getting early registrants in as soon as possible so I can actually sleep at night and get this thing off the ground. Um, so Street Hoops Canada was founded on the, the principle of skill development and fun while bringing play back to the streets. Our events are designed to be fun, inclusive, and provide opportunities for people of all ages to hone and show off their skills in, in the sport of basketball. 
Um, we are going to be adding a slam dunk competition this year, a three-point competition, a free throw competition, and the $100 cash prize will be given to each winner of those competitions. So it adds a little bit more fun to the event. Um, the other thing that we're going to be adding is a corporate challenge. So it would be amazing to get a uh, City of Niagara Falls team put in on the Friday afternoon. Um, maybe a fire department team put in. Maybe a police team put in. And again, the, the corporate challenge is much like they did at the for the Wise Guys um, charity a few weeks ago in St. Catharines downtown. Just local businesses playing against each other. It's not overly competitive basketball. It's just more fun and a different thing to do through, for the company rather than just you know going to another golf tournament or something like that. Get out and uh, show off some of your basketball skills. Um, chatted about the, the slam dunk competitions already. And then uh, the biggest thing, guys, and again, the reason why we went this route um, <coughs> and the reason why, unfortunately, we couldn't do it down on, on uh, Queen Street this year, we're utilizing the brand new facility at Ann Meyer, the outdoor courts. And um, again, it's just a, a cost savings for us. We don't have to rent additional baskets. They've got eight beautiful ones there and the courts are fantastic to use. So we're gonna be housing a lot of the games on those courts and then we're gonna be bringing in rollaways on the, uh, the parking lot as well. Um, but the, the, whole, the main thing here is to raise as much money as we possibly can to go back to the two great charities that are gonna be receiving the dough. Okay. Um, and again, the, this was the, the value to the city based on um, uh, this year's numbers that we're, we're hoping to get, direct economic impact of $280,000. And again, that's based on everything that goes into this tournament. You know, us renting the equipment from different uh, local businesses to actually other businesses utilizing all of the participants that are coming in and they, they get to go to their great, um, their businesses. So we're expecting a thousand uh, participants because it's four, four uh, players per team at 250 teams. And then with that, you have parents and, and siblings and friends that come along for the weekend to watch. Um, two city teams. We are, okay, so this is what we're requesting for support uh, to invest this year. So two city teams would be incredible for the Friday afternoon. Um, the costs and permits associated with logistics, uh, bleachers, assistance, managing streetscape, access to fire hydrant, parking permits, and help with business development, and of course, team participation. Well, that's it. And that's it. Okay, do we have, uh, we got Councilor Morocco. That's great, it was a great event, and a lot of work that he's put into it as always, and thank you so much for coming here and doing the presentation. So I'd like to move the recommendation. They're looking for, uh, what was it, uh, street closure? And logistic support? There would be no street closures. No, because it's an event. We started, so we started there. We've moved back a bit, but certainly. So support from the council. Yeah, so it said bleachers. Yeah. It said uh, uh, teams, teams, couple teams. Yeah, teams. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Jeff Holman and Alex Rovich and our Spud Web team of uh, Wayne Thompson, Kim Fader, and Vince Curio. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 All right, so are there any other questions or suggestions? Okay, seeing none, we'll, we'll call the vote on the motion. I want to do the slam dunk. Okay, <laughs> Councilor Thompson wants to do the slam dunk competition. That's great. I look forward to that. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Yes. Okay, and that's unanimous. So thank you very much. Good luck with it. Thanks, and we guys. look forward thank to you. the weekend. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, next item, uh, the new official plan. We've got Dave Hayworth here, policy consultant. He's going to address us in this regard. Thank you. Okay, good evening, um, Mr. Mayor, Councillors, Regional Councillors, staff and residents. Um, I'm a bit of a shoe in tonight. I'm gonna give a very brief introduction. My name is Doug Giles. My colleague is Dave Hayworth. We're with the Planning and Development Department at Niagara Region. The reason we're here tonight is to give you a brief overview of the new regional official plan. Um, just to give you some context about the uh, current regional official plan and why we're doing a new one is the first regional plan was adopted in um, 1973. Um, since then, there has not been a comprehensive review of the <coughs> entire regional plan. What has happened is there has been updates to chapters of the regional plan over a period of time. What happens when you update chapters is, is a lot of chapters are connected to one another. And as you update one chapter, you lose that connectivity. Um, and over, you can imagine over the last 35 years, things have significantly changed. Development patterns have changed. Planning policy has changed. And the direction of growth has changed across the region. So what we are doing is um, we received permission from the regional council to embark on the preparation of a new regional official plan. Um, it's a five-year process. We're into the first year. The deadline for the completion of it is in 2021. Um, and it is, it's a very long process. It includes a lot of um, discussion. It includes the consideration of a lot of issues. Um, but what I'll do now is I'll hand it over to my colleague, Dave Hayworth, who will go through some of the detail. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council Members, Regional Councillors, and the public. It's nice to be back in uh, Niagara Falls Council Chambers and uh, appreciate the opportunity to inform and engage our local partners on this project. Um, as Doug mentioned, we initiated staff resources back in 2016 to do a new official plan. We're holding a special meeting of council on July 5th to hear how the public visions now are growing and developing and what they have to say about a new official plan. And that's a statutory requirement. In the meantime, the region, with the input of area planners, has been framing required priority background studies, which is primarily what I want to speak to this evening. In terms of preliminary objectives, we want to promote and achieve great development outcomes that contribute to complete community solutions and a quality urban experience, facilitate opportunities for economic growth, protect natural and agricultural resources, and adequately respond to the challenges of climate change provide clear policy direction where necessary and discretion where appropriate, address provincial requirements, regional mandate matters, and provide guidance to local area municipalities. And the new official plan will be processed under section 26 of the Planning Act. Um, you've probably heard a lot about municipal comprehensive review at the region, which was previously um, focused on growth management only. So now, under the changes to the provincial planning documents, it incorporates growth management as well as all the other sections of the official plan and has to be looked at comprehensively and approved. The growth management is approved as part of the new official plan process. Uh, as I mentioned, we're going to be doing some priority background studies, and we're trying to provide a lot of input from the public, our stakeholders, our partners, et cetera. Um, the background studies, uh, the process is we'll compile the background, we'll gather input as we summarize that background, we'll develop options, we'll gather input, 
We'll develop recommendations, we'll gather input, and all of that will inform policy formulation, and there'll be uh, input gathered from stakeholders, the public, and all the uh, agencies as well at that stage. This uh, slide basically shows the, the puzzle of, of all the interrelationships of the priority background studies. Everything is interrelated. We have four under growth management program we're proceeding with and four under natural systems and resources program that we're proceeding with. And I did notice on your agenda this evening, you have the regional approved frameworks for the aggregates update, climate change, and growth management on your agenda tonight. So under growth management, we have the land needs assessment or land budget, employment land strategy, urban structure and housing strategy. And employment lands, urban structure and housing strategy all inform the, urban, the land needs assessment. In terms of the land needs assessment, we wanna determine the amount of developable urban land needed for residential and employment purposes to 2041 identify any excess lands, which are lands not developable by 2041. Uh, we're looking at alternative greenfield density targets to the required 80 people and jobs per hectare. Opportunity to rationalize urban area boundaries and ensure that sufficient lands are in the proper location to accommodate growth. And urban boundary expansions can occur if there's not enough land regionally, but they can also occur if there's uh, excess lands, provided there is a de-designation of lands within the region. And it has to be more than what you're expanding. In terms of employment land strategy, we want to ensure sufficient and marketable supply for traditional industrial employment. Identify regional employment areas, which are areas of business and economic activity for long-term employment development. Uh, we're currently working with the local <coughs> municipalities and area planners at this stage in identifying uh, important employment areas. And the employment strategy will be informed by the region's annual employment inventory. Urban structure. So uh, under the provincial planning documents, we have to develop an urban structure. Um, the urban structure is a significant component uh, to achieve the 60% intensification rate under the growth plan and while protecting established neighborhoods. We want to identify a hierarchy of settlement areas according to the provincial guidance material. That may not be as complex. It could be something simple. That is something we have to work out with the province. We, but key is within settlement areas, we have to identify intensifications to direct growth to areas best served by combination of transit, uh, public transit, public works, and community infrastructure and services. And then we have to assign population and density accordingly. Uh, some key components of a draft urban structure we've started to discuss with area planners. This is very preliminary. Uh, the downtown St. Catharines Urban Growth Center, which is provincially recognized downtown Niagara Falls and downtown and Welland emerging urban centers. And, and there's an, a bit of an overlap in Niagara Falls with the GO Transit Station area, recognizing that. The other part of the urban structure is the GO Transit Station areas where we've been developing secondary plans. Other regional growth areas, uh, these can be areas like uh, what we've identified in the Brock District Plan for the, the, the Brock District, and we're now undertaking a district plan for the Glendale area. So those could be other regional strategic growth areas. Regional corridors, which we'll have to identify, and local centers and local corridors, which will be in your own local official plans. Housing strategy, and we talked, there was some discussion on some of these elements this evening. We want to promote an appropriate range and mix of housing forms, promote choice, aging in place opportunities, and affordability, set affordable ownership and rental housing targets, that's a provincial requirement, identify tools to support affordable housing, a provincial requirement, and align with housing and homelessness action plan, another provincial uh, requirement, and we're in uh, dialoguing, you heard this evening some comments about having to everybody work together, everybody's doing a bit of something, and, and we've been dialoguing with the other divisions of the, the region with respect to the Homelessness Action Plan, trying to coordinate that, and as well, uh, there'll be outreach to, to the areas and our partners on, on how to coordinate that as well. 
So that, that, that concludes the growth management part. Uh, in terms of rural and natural systems management program, we have agriculture, natural environment, aggregate resources, and climate change. In terms of agriculture, we want to recognize uh, agriculture as a primary driver of the regional economy, protect the unique land, update specific policies such as agriculture-related and on-farm diversified uses, consider area planners uh, comments, there were some very good comments raised regarding viability of certain agricultural lands, refinement to the province's agricultural systems mapping, addressing wineries in terms of permitted uses and, and their flexibility and what they can do, importance of agricultural impact assessments, which is a provincial requirement, and the importance of compatibility between the natural heritage system and the agricultural systems, and there was some concerns uh, about green, uh, greenhouses for cannabis raised at uh, Regional Planning Committee as well. For natural environment and water systems planning, this is a very significant component of the regional plan, um, partly because um, natural heritage and agriculture, in a sense, define the limitations of where you're allowed to grow. Uh, so some of the key aspects uh, raised, and we've discussed the frameworks with area planners, et cetera, is the accuracy of mapping for natural heritage and trying to get it as right as possible and as current and updated as possible and identifying what is truly significant under the provincial frameworks that we have to work under. We want, need to establish criteria and identify features for provincial compliance, example, woodlands. Uh, specific topics for consideration that have been mentioned uh, that we'll look at, it, offsetting shorelines, watercourse mapping, et cetera. And education is a priority component of the engagement process. What I will say in, in, with respect to this, um, w for the natural heritage framework, we will uh, be looking at the mapping and accuracy of mapping and watershed planning early on in the process and having those as specific uh, discussion items early in the process. In terms of aggregate resources, most of this was started under Imagine Niagara. If you remember Imagine Niagara planning to 2031, we're now planning to 2041. The background work was basically all complete. With the changes to the provincial planning documents, all we wanted to do was update them uh, were necessary, so we did a technical addendum. That's been approved, and now we're ready for developing policies for aggregate resources. Climate change, this is also a requirement to look at uh, from the province, and you can see by this slide basically all the different factors that influence climate change, and they're all uh, policy matters in the growth plan. So a lot of what the growth plan uh, speaks to addresses climate change and we'll be addressing that as part of the new official plan. In terms of engagement process considerations, we will be engaging the indigenous peoples early in the process. Some notifications went out to that effect. We want to carry forward essential information and direction. We want a clear understanding that one policy decision impacts another. Opportunities for council members to feel involved. Uh, consideration and identification of the regional mandate through the process as we develop the background studies and the policy formulation. Broad-based and personal consultation and provide strategic facilitation where necessary. And moving forward, obviously we're complying with Planning Act matters, but as you can see from the slides of the input we're, we're going to be gathering at different stages, we're going well beyond those requirements. Um, we're going to continue to come back to you here and there throughout the process to keep you informed and engaged. And we'll, we gathered a lot of good information under Imagine Niagara, which isn't that old, it's still relevant, and we'll be using that to help theme topics for discussion, et cetera. We're going to complete this uh, official plan in sections, get them endorsed at Regional Council, and then put the package together and get it uh, approved and sent off to the province as one package. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dave. I've got Councillor Thompson and uh, Morocco. Um, what, what's your objective tonight, bringing this to our, just to inform us yes. what you're doing? Yes, that's You know, correct. we had no information about it previously. We couldn't, uh, you know, we tried to follow your comments, but, uh, to try to do that in a few minutes is impossible. Uh, are we getting a copy of this uh, so that we can 
uh, really make some uh, important questions and dialogue with respect to the matter? Uh, yes, we'll be giving you a copy or welcome to a copy and any time you want to provide input, we're always welcome to hear that. Okay, well the important thing was I think that uh, there's going to be a lot of opportunity for public input That's right. and dialogue, not only with councils but with the public, That's right. the building, <coughs> trades, and uh, That's right. everything else. Yeah. So wh what, what do you do with a situation where the municipality has its official plan and it's in conflict with what you're suggesting. What, uh, what is the method of uh, working through that process? Once we're done this process and the province approves it, then the local municipalities have to bring their official plans into conformity with what will be approved through this process. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Um, anyway, uh, I, you heard about this before, where the region was looking at uh, uh, preservation of industrial properties. Uh, you know, in Niagara Falls, we have a lot of industrial property, but uh, our assessment uh, for industry is, I think, 2.8%. Uh, so we're not in the industrial business, regardless of how much effort uh, our economic development people put in to try to bring jobs and create industry. Uh, it, it doesn't happen. And even in St. Catharines, which uh, look at GM now. Uh, so preservation of uh, industrial lands, uh, I, think, uh, I think that's why we're elected here, isn't it, to make decisions? So if there's gonna be a conflict with the region, uh, I think we're gonna have uh, some pretty healthy debates with respect to that. Thank you, if you'd um, like a response to that, there have been um, some slight changes to policies regarding employment land and what is traditional industrial land. We've been working quite closely with um, the area planners, including the planning department at Niagara Falls, to identify employment land. Um, in the new growth plan, which is the provincial plan, there have been basically um, different levels of industrial land that you have to identify for long-term preservation. So we've been working with staff at Niagara Falls to identify that, and we're working with them very close um, on in doing that and identifying what lands have to be preserved for the future. The other part of that is there's a big move to employment in non-traditional areas such as downtown areas such as um, the areas that Dave talked about previously in the urban structure in the new sort of growth nodes across the region. And what we're trying to do is come to an understanding of how much employment we have to allocate to those areas versus how much employment we have to allocate to traditional areas. And the other side of that is there are some um, in industrial areas that may not be suitable for for more modern businesses that require different types and sizes of buildings, different configuration buildings and different lot sizes. So we're also looking at how we can accommodate that in uh, the region up until 2041 and beyond. So we are doing a considerable amount, uh, considerable amount of work on that. Yeah, I'm not really that interested in 2041, but uh, I am- Sorry, we are. <laughs> I, am, I am concerned about uh, what, uh, what is the appeal process if there's uh, uh, differences of opinion with respect to what you're doing and what we would like to do here? Well, um, I think working with the planning staff at Niagara, hopefully there won't be an appeal process. And the idea of working closely with staff is to make sure that there's alignment. Yeah. Anyway, it's going to be a long process. Uh, you're talking about 2021? Yeah. yeah. Okay, all right, uh, I had to make my comments because uh, uh, we have a responsibility to our people here and uh, we have an official plan uh, and if it doesn't uh, fit in with what you people are trying to do with the region, then uh, we'll have to have another resolution to pull out of the region, I guess. Second. Second. Yeah. Okay, hey, Councillor Morocco and then Peter Angelo. Um, yes, uh, Your Worship, through you to uh, Dr. Dave, I, I see the transportation is also outlined and I'm glad to see that since, since I sit on the Transportation Steering Committee and linking Niagara as well. 
Um, I'm also a representative for the uh, on the uh, Niagara Trans or the uh, Niagara District Airport, which I don't see any mention. So when you do the transportation, I see go transportation, the other transportation, but I think that we're always trying to make sure that the Niagara District is included in that transportation. Will that be included? Okay. Yes, currently we're doing um, an amendment to the transportation section of the official plan in order to make that consistent with the uh, transportation master plan that's recently completed at the region and the airport is in that. So the, the current amendment that we're doing is to reflect the transportation master plan and make our current regional official plan comply with the transportation master plan. Um, it, and as we go forward, we plan on bringing that that a similar um, uh, section into the new regional official plan. If we need to make any changes by then, they will be made. And if there's more advances to what's been happening at the airport, then those will be included in the next version of the regional official plan. That's just what I wanted to hear. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Peter Angel. <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I guess through you to the two gentlemen, uh, first of all, welcome back to Dave, uh, former member of Niagara Falls uh, Planning Department. A uh, question I had was in regards to, you talked about um, uh, in the official plan, how you're defining what the urban structure is, and you talked about some of the intensification areas. You mentioned some corridors, but it doesn't actually give me the exact location of those corridors. So what I was wondering is, um, are you, all of the areas that you've identified for intensification, do they fall mm -hmm. within an urban boundary of their corresponding municipality? Yeah. They do. Okay. Thanks, Your Worship. Okay. Thank you. If there's no further questions, we'll look for a motion to receive the presentation. Moved by Councillor Cario, second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? Thanks very much, gentlemen. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, we'll call on Bob Gale, our, one of our other regional councillors, to give us an update on Police Service Board. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, can you hear me by standing here? Yeah, if you there? use that microphone, if Selena slides down a little bit. Yep, yep. Okay, good. Thank you. A few humorous things right off the bat. I have a few concerns. As you know, there's been a bit of controversy at times at the Niagara region. And uh, I come into a council here and I see that uh, you have a boy named Josh. He choked out a girl and he got a gold medal and you all clapped for it. <laughs> As chair of the police board, I got a problem with this, but I'll move on. And then I also have a problem with the, uh, is it on? I also have a problem with uh, Councillor Strange's uh, comment, and this is from Selena and I with regards to health care, the comment about a spud web team, because co our cost of health care will go through the roof with that, and you'll never see a hospital if that team is ever formed. So, but I, I move on. And uh, one last thing is uh, you have two in my reds here too. Oh, good. And More. Bart oh, is please. as well. I think we're taking over. Yeah, remember back in the, well, you don't remember that, but back in the 60s, it was always, it was always NFCVI and Stanford. You had your glory days. <laughs> yeah. But regardless, I move on. Uh, right off the bat, I'm going to talk about the PXO, or in other words, the public crosswalk out in Chippewa that you asked me to speak for you as well. That was supposed to be unveiled yesterday at 3.30. And because of the lightning and the thunderstorm, we decided not to have it because we didn't want to lose people out there. But that's at the Weinbrenner Road on so going across Sodom Road. And it started yesterday at 3.30. We had some police officers out there. No one showed up from the public. I get it. It was raining and it was the lightning. But uh, the police are going to be out there to show how to use this more to the people. It's fairly common sense, but uh, young kids might not understand it as well, because it's state of the art. It's nice that Chippewa finally got something of state of the art. This is the first one in Niagara Falls. Yeah, I, I knew Joyce would uh, talk high about that, but uh, this is the first one in Niagara Falls, probably the fifth one in the region, but it has lights on both sides. and. You know, not worth making a special trip for, but uh, it's nice to see they got that there. The next question I uh, took that I was going to be asked was about paving out there. There are certain segments that are going to be resurfaced this summer, but not the whole thing because of the development out there. That would be wrong because it'll just be torn up again. But I've got assurances from Carolyn Royal at the at the region that uh, uh, it will be resurfaced oh, yeah, and Ron Trip uh, over the next couple of years will be fixed up. But the development still is going to be tearing apart that road. So that's enough on that crosswalk. Now the crosswalk is open to the public. We are not going to have a ceremony for it now because you don't shut it down just for a ceremony. You want to make sure people are using it. So we'll move on with that. The next one is an indigenous seminar. Uh, the police board had a meeting three months ago where, and I'm going to try and be politically correct like I spoke to at the region. I guess I was pretty good on this, but yeah, I didn't get any flack. Uh, Rick McLean, a representative of the indigenous tribes around, did a seminar at the police board 
for the senior staff and the senior command team as well as uh, uh, the police board on indigenous uh, training and education and what, what they've gone through. I'll be totally frank here, and I was at that time when I talked to the region too, I thought this is going to be another boring seminar. I've been to three indigenous seminars while I've been there and I thought, why am I here? But I chair the board, I had to be there. It was the best seminar I've ever been at as an elected official. It took about two hours, but it informed us so much about the indigenous situation around. And this is me saying that, and this is the way I explain to the council. People know what I'm like. I'm a bit rough on, on this stuff, but the education that he gave us from things that, first question he asked was, oh, do you know what uh, the indigenous have uh, uh, invented over the years? None of us could come up with it. We were coming up with canoes and things like this, but needles, uh, uh, excuse me, needles, anesthetics, he just went on with the whole list. And we fine tune some of these things, and I say we with them uh, in consult consultation with them, but the other things that they brought to us was uh, the white uh, and this is the word he used, white of their indigenous tribes all the way through to the 1990s where kids were taken from their homes and thrown in schools up till early 1990s in eastern Ontario. Horrific things that none of us knew about. When I left there, I was offended that through school, I took Greek history, Russian history, English history, you, you did, we all did, nothing on indi Indigenous. I knew nothing about a treaty that was signed at Fort Niagara that they can come on any of our properties and hunt for deer or anything like this, but they have the courtesy of not doing that. They could show up on your front lawn tomorrow and be hunting for something and you can't do anything about it, but a courtesy they don't do that and that they, they get it on that front. So I hope an invite went out this afternoon to all council members and in the Niagara region, all elected officials in the Niagara region to a indigenous seminar on July 11th at the Niagara region. I hope you'll all show up for it. I think that you'll learn from this. And I, I said to them, please invite their spouses. <coughs> I'll pay, I'm personally paying for the food for this. I told the indigenous people to come out and bring out some of their food for it. So you can't have an excuse not to come out because you're hungry, because you're doing something with your wife or, or husband and things like this, whatever it takes on this, because I think you'll learn a lot from it. My end goal on this, I'm offended that the schools haven't taught a class on this over the years. Uh, just give it half a day for a grade eight or grade nine class every year to have the indigenous speak to them on why things are. What the last comment I'll make is, he started off his lecture by saying, when I'm done this, you'll know why you shouldn't be looking at that indigenous walking down the side of the street at times like we all have, and say, why don't you pull up your pants and get a job? That's what he said. At the end of it all, I, I realized why I shouldn't be saying that, and I hope you will too. Therefore, I'd like to go to the school boards with Rick and any other elected officials in September or October and say, please, spare half a day so that you can have this seminar for at least our kids in the Niagara region. And that, and maybe they'll go throughout Ontario on that because why English history and why not them? Last, I've been, I was in out east, as you know, on the FCM, and I got back on last Wednesday and I've been about four articles in the paper about me about comments I made at the, at the region, they had a talk about budget. They said that they're going to try and hold a 2% and then it was voted down to 1.5% increase for next year, uh, the, the forecast. And I said to them right off the bat, 1.95% is our wages on the police that was arbitrated for us. That's low compared to other forces, but you're killing me right now. We might as well throw the towel in. Why not go in at 0.5 or 0 or something like this? And plus with the increases that we've had on different things, we're 2.9 right off the bat. We'll be lucky if we get off less than 4% next year. So I made the comment and I said, new people are probably gonna blow that back at me because uh, of the police chief's retirement settlement, which was a great business decision because we expect to get all that money back within three years with the plans the new chief has put out there. Then you read another headline about me. And you also read in the story about the police survey. You're all bored with it. You wanna put a pencil in your eye over this stuff because there's so much flack going on, negative press by one reporter about us. And you always read in the story that Bob Gale didn't return a comment on this. Bob Gale didn't return the comment. So the point is, and I wanted to say it to you people so you understand, I'm always available for you people to ask me a question at any time. I'm always available for the citizens to ask me. But if it's gonna be biased or negative press all the time, this reporter will never get a, a comment from me. And that's the way it stands. And I can justify that and our board stands behind me on this. So I just wanted to report that to you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Gale. Okay, moving along uh, to item 610.
is our Integrity Commissioner report. Uh, I'd like to call up Janet Leeper, our Integrity Commissioner, who will introduce the report on the complaint. Thank you, Your Worship. Members of Council, good evening. This is my first report to you as your Interim Integrity Commissioner. It concerns a complaint. I'm not going to go through the report in full detail, but I'll hit the highlights, and if there are any questions, we'd be happy to entertain those. So the complaint concerned an incident that took place back in November of 2017. The complaint was brought forward, however, not in the proper format until May 4th. And it was around that time that I was retained. So where we are tonight is there has been a finding of a breach of the code of conduct. It's summarized in the report before you. And it arose out of initial online communication between Councillor Campbell and a member of the community in which Councillor Campbell agreed to be helpful in relation to a certain issue. And things went relatively well until a point of conflict, which is described in the report. And I'll just summarize it this way. There was an exchange of text and phone information. The Councillor expressed himself in an angry manner. He used inappropriate language that had some troubling content. This caused sadness and stress to the complainant and there was some further communication which upset the complainant and ultimately he requested that the counselor not have communication with him anymore. Your code of conduct, which you adopted approximately a year ago, has provisions relating to anti-harassment and you have a definition of what that is and it includes a communication that is reasonably perceived by the recipient as an intention to bully, embarrass, intimidate or ridicule the recipient. In addition, your code of conduct has key statements of principle, and you've set a high bar for yourselves. Your conduct is expected explicitly to be of the highest standard. You need to show fairness, respect for difference, and a duty to work with other members together for the common good. And finally, section three of your code of conduct recognizes that you're to conduct yourselves with propriety, decency, and respect at all times. This is a high standard and it reflects the fact that members of council do their work not just in the chamber but out in the community when they're speaking to members of the public. So I concluded after listening to some of the material, reading the text, um, that it was reasonable for the complainant to perceive the communications as ridiculing or demeaning him and that th this did amount to bullying behavior. I met with Councillor Campbell and I want to say that he was completely cooperative and is part of the reason why this matter is coming before you fairly quickly. He accepted the findings. He was cooperative with the investigation and he provided a timely response to this complaint. But more importantly, he's taken steps to examine why he became so upset and why he became so angry and is working with a counselor to address these matters. He told me he was appalled at having become so angry. He demonstrated remorse, and I put that before you as part of the reasons behind my recommendation to you tonight. The Councillor plans to make a full apology to the complainant at this time at Council, and given that recognition, I'm recommending to you that there be no further sanction other than the finding of the breach. So two additional points that are not in my report. First of all, when I classified this complaint as falling under the jurisdiction of an integrity commissioner, I realized that both parties would benefit from a speedy resolution because it had lingered for some time. I retained a colleague, Ms. Nadia Leva, who is here tonight and is seated over to my right to assist as an <coughs> investigator. She has experience with codes of conduct matters and I delegated part of this investigation to her so that she could meet with the complainant. Further, I wish to advise counsel that the complainant is satisfied with the outcome that I'm presenting to you this evening. And finally, Although you can impose other forms of sanction, anything from a reprimand to um, a suspension of pay for up to 90 days, I recommend that you adopt no further sanction having heard the apology for these reasons. First of all, this will encourage settlements in future if there are breaches of the code. And I would venture to guess that there's nobody in this room who hasn't lost their temper or said something that they wish they hadn't at some point in their life. So apologies are to be encouraged. Secondly, there's a proportionality to what I recommend. Other municipalities have addressed conduct of this nature with apologies and no further sanction. Third, it reflects the interests of the parties and the interest of the complainant. It would allow for certainty and consistency if you find it to be within a reasonable range of outcomes. 
such that people would cooperate with further complaints. And finally, there was an explanation given here, and it's in the report, and it's related to the outcome of certain tragic events in the life of Councillor Campbell, which underlie, he believes, some of his behaviour, which he is working on. So finally, actually, finally again, it, councillors ought not to underestimate the power of a finding of a breach before one's peers and in public. That in itself can function as a reminder that one must live up to the code of conduct. So for these reasons, this is my recommendation. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, do we have questions of council? Councilor Cario? Thank you, Your Worship. I have just a couple of questions. Um, <coughs> which, is it Lepke? It's Leeper. Leeper? Uh, it's Leeper. There seems to be some confusion. I got an email prior to the council meeting tonight that said <clears throat> something like that the decision was already made on the punishment or the penalties that were to be assessed in this case. But then I just heard you say it's strictly up to council to decide. So you can make a recommendation. But am I correct in assuming that you don't make the decision on the penalty? We do. Through you, Your Worship, yes, that's correct. Okay. Thank you. That's one question. And then if there's no other questions, I did read in here that you were here to help us, not just through this, but for other things. I read that, I don't know, the <coughs> beginning of the report or whatever. So you're here at our disposal to help us in tough decisions. I, I didn't sign up for this to judge my peers. I don't think it's fair at all for council to be put in this position. We put this position not that long ago, and it wasn't pretty, it wasn't pleasant. And I'm sure that the other councillors aren't enjoying this as well. But we're faced with a situation that, how do, how do we achieve fairness? You know, unless we had the experience that you do, or the expertise, to me a code of, if you breach the code of conduct, you breach the code of conduct. I don't, I'm not equipped to decide which breach was worse, which breach is worse, the one that happened before, this one. We're, we're in a bit of a jam, and I don't know whether or not you could shed some light. Because we came down pretty hard on the counselor in the last go-around, and in this particular case, you're suggesting that an apology would be acceptable. Some people may say they were both breaches of the code, and it would be nice if you could help us with the situation, because I think most of us are struggling with what to do. Thank you for the question, Your Worship. Uh, this is a question that councils have really struggled with since the advent of integrity commissioners and codes of conduct, which haven't been around all that long, Toronto being the first to do so. And it really is requiring you to wear another hat to the one you normally wear. So your politicians, your legislators, you have stewardship, and in a way, you're now administrative decision makers, which is kind of quasi-judicial. So part of that is learning the rule, learning the code of conduct. I can't speak to things that have happened before I arrived here. But what I would suggest is that at the next term of council, that there be an introductory education session. Because ultimately, what you would like to move towards is avoiding complaints using advice. And you mentioned the role of an integrity commissioner. It includes advice, education, but also standing up here when there is a breach and giving you reasons for why you might consider the sanction. So if I was to stand up here and just say, I think you should you know, take away its pay for 30 days, but give you no reasons, no context, no background, you'd be right in saying, you've given us no help at all. You have to give us some reasoning. So that's why I addressed the four or five reasons for the suggestion. That is why I mentioned other municipalities, including the city of Toronto, have recommended no sanction when there is an apology where there has been insulting behavior towards staff, we've seen that, insulting behavior towards members of the public or fellow councillors. So there is precedent for this recommendation. I hope that assists. Okay. Uh, Councillor Morocco. Um, I really have no um, questions for you, but I just want to say um, thank you. It is very difficult, as Councillor uh, Cario pointed out to um, take on the judge and jury of another fellow counselor. The bottom line is we shouldn't even be doing it all because the counselor should just be doing what they're supposed to be doing is their work and actually focusing on the duty of the day that we've been elected for. And I don't think then we'd be in this situation, but 
every once in a while we have to, it looks like we're faced with this. And I don't want to judge my peers. Uh, I, I welcome your recommendation. I think every case is different. We've seen that. Uh, there's been a lot of different uh, cases that have been brought before, the region and ourselves, and uh, integrity commissioners have come forward. I hope that um, the next council actually does put something in place to deal with this. And um, I actually would like to uh, say that I would make a motion to accept the, uh, the report for, uh, coming back that uh, Councillor Campbell uh, gave up an apology. And let's move on. And uh, I'm, I'm not here to continue to keep on bickering away and picking at each other. Um, that's, that's what my comments are. So thank you very much for bringing forward that. I'm sure that this, the case that uh, Councillor Campbell seemed to be very compassionate, passionate about, compassionate about, and what he was trying to help an individual that was directed to him by another fellow councillor. And I, I have no idea whatever happened there, but I think we've also learned another uh, valuable lesson, that we are not professionals uh, in dealing with people that need help or whatever. I think that we need to direct those individuals to the people that are professional in wherever they can uh, provide a service. Um, so I think that that was another thing too, that you, you try to help, but we also always want to think that we're just wearing one hat. Or we wear many hats, but we always have to remember that the one hat we've learned through over the last few years is that we're always wearing that one hat, and that's the counselor's hat. And we have to always act in a professional manner and think of others. That's my comment. Thank you for that. <clears throat> I've got uh, Councillor Thompson and uh, Thompson, our Councillor Curator. Um, so we've got a motion on the floor right now. So I don't know if we've got, do we have a seconder first? I should address the motion that we accept the uh, uh, Integrity Commissioner's uh, findings. I may second it after I finished uh, asking a question. Um, thank you for being here. And uh, this, uh, I, I don't know all the details of what transpired with respect to this, but um, I'm very confused and I think this council needs uh, information uh, on how we are at this particular place in time. Um, from what I understand, uh, the individual approached uh, Councillor Campbell and there was some dialogue. Uh, in my opinion, it has absolutely nothing to do with city council, city business, and that's what we're elected here to do. So I'm just wondering, uh, tell us, uh, is our code of conduct uh, too wide open that any come, if I had a problem with uh, my lawyer and I got mad and said something to him, does he have the right to uh, file a, a, a a complaint against me. Um, wh where do we stand with respect to where this uh, is going? Uh, I thought when I initially heard this, uh, well, uh, you know, that's fine, but uh, has nothing to do with city council. What you're elected to do is to do city business. And this was totally separate in my opinion. And uh, I, I'm just mystified that it has gone this far. So thank you for the question through you, Your Worship. I generally try not to answer hypotheticals, so the lawyer hypothetical, that would rise and fall on its own facts. In this case, the facts were that there was a bit of an overlap between the role at the time that the <clears throat> connection was made, and it was made by a fellow counselor. Uh, counselor Campbell was bringing forward as part of his champion of mental wellness here at the region. And I understand he is seen as a champion for mental health and mental wellness. And that there was some uh, discussion around issues around that. Further, your code of conduct does recognize that you are responsible for your words and your actions outside the chamber. And here we have not a former professional relationship, as you described, counselor, uh, with a lawyer, but we have a member of the public being introduced to the counselor by another counselor. 
And finally, when we had this conversation, and initially Councillor Campbell did take that position, he wondered, perhaps this is something in my private life, but as we discussed how uh, he had come to know the complainant, he did accept the finding, and I stand by my recommendation to you that it would be covered by this in these particular circumstances. Your other question was, is our code of conduct too broad? Are we holding ourselves up to too high a standard such that it would be intrusive into our private lives? And I would suggest to you that it would not, that it recognizes that there be some aspect of your work as a counselor. It's not intended to encompass you on vacation somewhere out of the country or somewhere that's totally removed from what you do as a counselor, but it, that it does recognize that you're always to some extent when you're dealing with the residents here who come to you, dealing with them qua counselor. And if you decided you wanted to make your code of conduct more narrow, it's up to you to change it. It's your code of conduct. You passed it, you set a high bar, but I would suggest to you before you do, that you would consider what that would say to the public. Okay, uh, do you know other councils, uh, their code of conduct that uh, would be different than ours under these circumstances? All of them are slightly different, but many are similar. And I can tell you that at the City of Toronto, the requirement to deal respectfully with members of the public has reached to um, radio programs where, where comments have been made on the radio by councillors, where they've been identified to someone as a councillor, where there is any factual connection. Um, and I understand that this code of conduct is to some extent similar to the City of Vaughan, so that it's not an anomaly. Well, I'm still very confused because if they're on the radio, they're talking about political, municipal things. And uh, I don't think this one was related to that. Um, I think we should uh, have another look at our code of conduct and see, you know, uh, because we all have to be very careful what we say to everybody and to everything. And uh, anybody can lose their temper under different circumstances, obviously, so um, it's, uh, it's been very difficult for me. I think I would, sorry, with your permission, Your yeah. Worship, oh, and one other thing, um, now that you have someone dedicated pending a full-time integrity commissioner, I will tell you that my orientation is towards settling matters, so that a quick loss of the temper, and if somebody had a complaint about it, my first attempt will always be to resolve it through an informal process rather than having it come to council as a formal complaint. Um, so advice, informal mediation, the intention would be that you don't see a lot of these. And uh, that is the mark of a group that has a more sophisticated understanding of how to work with integrity matters. It's not that you have to be perfect, and it's not that it's going to be gotcha. It is that when you do make a mistake, we try to deal with it quickly and satisfactorily, because I know members of the public don't relish this either, and people are sometimes intimidated to even bring them forward. So I will tell you that that's my orientation. This is the first time we've had a chance to talk. So I do thank you for the question. It allowed me to say that. Did you decide, are you seconding the motion? Yeah, I'm, I'm not interested in uh, conflict with the people around this table. In fact, uh, hopefully we get to the point where we don't need uh, an integrity commissioner because we all work together and cooperate in a team effort rather than uh, this, how long integrity commissioner? The last couple of years, all we've had since then is uh, conflict. And uh, I think it's uh, a very unpleasant environment. Uh, and I think we could do without it. So I'll second it. Thank you for that. Um, and we, yeah, well, we're going to, we still have more dialogue. We have some more, uh, and I think uh, Councillor Campbell is going to have something to say too, I believe. Um, Ms. Leeper, I, I just want to interject and say that I really appreciate what you said because none of us want to get into uh, a, a war amongst our peers and playing judge and jury but your idea that you look to mediate and maybe diffuse the situation and, and the idea of remorse, remorse and apology goes a long way. And I, I've always felt that way too, you know, because we want to forgive, we want to forget, 
and it, it, there has to be some remorse and apology and we can get that started. That starts, I think, the healing and the reset button. So that's great to hear. I, uh, I know I've got Councillor Crater and then I've got Councillor Campbell. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you know, I wish you'd been the person we had hired in the first place. The last person who came here was our integrity commissioner. We couldn't even ask him a question. I remember sitting there trying to, no, you can't ask any questions. It is a, it's quite, and it's been sit around the table. I wish that we had had an educational system. But here's the dilemma that I face, and then only speaking for myself. I read your report, and I happen to agree with it. I do, I happen to agree. Um, and I've said this to some of my friends. Um, Councillor Campbell went through a difficult time, and maybe in his mind, and I, I, don't, I don't want to, to offend you in any way, Wayne, but maybe in his mind, in his mind, going through that difficult t time, he thought maybe that was the right approach that he should take to try to motivate this person. Maybe that's what he thought. So I do not believe that he was doing anything that was he felt was wrong. But the problem we have is we had a, a counselor who also breached. And there was a report that came here in this room. I remember we were sitting here. And we threw the book at her. We took away her pay for three months. We kicked her off the a board that she sat on as a city councilor. We kicked her off the library board. Then we wanted her to resign. And I remember standing up and saying, I'll support this, but you understand, we're setting a precedence. We're saying if anybody around this table, which includes me, breaches a code of conduct, here's the penalty you're gonna pay. You're gonna lose your pay for three months, you can get removed from any board, you're gonna be asked to resign. And we all, all of us, except for the counselor who was affected, voted in favor. We said, yes, that's what we want to do, and that's the standard that we are setting up this high. And there is no other standard after that. There's nothing that says uh, we'll take a little less or anything. That was the standard. And so that's the predicament that we find ourselves in, and there's only a couple ways we can resolve that. And I, liked, I really do like what you were saying. You know, apologies, let's put things behind us, as counselor said. Then how do we correct what I consider an injustice to a counselor who did breach, just like this one, by making her pay severe penalties for all of that. And that's what I'm trying to wrestle my mind. How do I correct that? Because I am going to support this, your recommendation, which is a very, very well put together. You don't have to answer the question. I'm sitting here trying to figure out what's the way that we correct something that we did had we had you sitting there instead of this guy named Duxbury, who I don't even think has a clue, and I'm going to say, I guess he can come and sue me too next, saying I shouldn't be. Councilor, maybe we shouldn't reference but, names of. of uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going. He was here, so it's a public meeting. You know, I'm yeah, I'm a little hot in the call. Uh, you know, but we can refrain from mentioning the. Thank name. you, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right up. yeah. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so. Thank you again, and I think whatever the vote comes, we need to revisit what we did to a counselor who breached the code of conduct by throwing everything at that counselor, remove her pay, kick her off hydro board, kick her off the library board, and demand that she apology. I'm not Sorry. certainly gonna, gonna suggest that that's the route we go with Campbell, because my counselor Campbell, because I happen to agree with what you recommend. I, I just. And Councillor, and I'll just close with saying this, Councillor Thompson's right, we're in a whole different, you're afraid to say anything anymore. You're afraid to text anybody. You're afraid to put anything in email. You're afraid to joke around and have fun. You're, you're afraid. Because anybody can say anything about you. And in this world of politics that we live in, and the news media, and Bob Gale's still here, but he's right, the news media loves it. They'll just put your name on the front page. Whether it's true or not, it doesn't matter. It just sells papers, it's great. You know, and then you're, you're considered guilty no matter what. And I've lived in that world, so I know how it feels. So uh, to, I'm gonna support the motion, uh, and I just want you to know that. But that's the difficulty I have with trying to be fair to another counselor who went through a breach and saw the penalty that she, she had to endure for, for this. So maybe there's a way we can rectify that. So th th I, I apologize, because I didn't really ask you. But thank you very much, and the, the only question I do have for the, for the public, 
you are now their integrity commissioner. So if someone has a concern about us in any way, shape, or form, then they can contact you and express their views. Is that now your role here? Yes, that's my role until you replace me, and which you will do. But for now, I'm your interim integrity commissioner, and I will answer one of the questions embedded in your comments, Councillor, um, through you, Your Worship. And that is, um, please don't be afraid. I know your jobs are really hard. I worked very closely with the uh, City of Toronto councillors, and I saw what they had to deal with. You have to deal with the public in all forms, and the public doesn't always appreciate how hard you work. And I know that people are prone to jumping on mistakes. So all I can say to you is um, you shouldn't be afraid to communicate with your public. Your code of conduct is there as a guide, not as a trap. And I'm here to provide confidential advice. And if you consult me, that advice does not go public unless you choose to make it public. And I'm here for the public people as well if they have an issue. And again, if it's an informal matter, I will always try to resolve it. Oh, and your other question, um, through you, Your Worship, about why don't we just do the same penalty for everybody? That would be fettering your discretion. In other words, taking the maximum for every single one. And that likely would be vulnerable on judicial review. And it would be contrary to what's being recommended. But um, given that uh, the indication's been made that, that that's, I'm not going to say more about that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, well, before we get to Councillor Campbell, I know we've got uh, a couple of councillors that wanted to speak. So I've got uh, Councillor Iannone, Cario, and Morocco again. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. It's no surprise to anybody watching this or speaking that they're talking about me. So let's put that on the floor right now. Um, I was a little taken back on the email Council received tonight. When I had my investigation with Mr. Duxbury, I wasn't allowed to speak to any of you. I wasn't allowed to address you. I wasn't allowed to speak to the report, and I was told I was not allowed to talk to any of you before the punishment was installed and in, implemented on me. Y'all got an email tonight asking you to stick with an apology, which I think is a conflict of interest because it's pecuniary, but it's an entirely different rule that was imposed on me when I, when I was investigated. In the email you received, it says Councillor Campbell, and the email is from him, and the Integrity Commissioner mutually agreed on the consequences outlined in the report. And I have to tell you, Councillor Campbell, I emailed Ms. Sleeper and told her I thought her report was fantastic and her recommendation was right on the mark. <coughs> this is what I think should happen. But you got to speak to your Integrity Commissioner. You got to speak to her about the report. You got to speak to her about the results. You got to talk to her about your, the recommend, recommended punishment. I didn't get to do that. I didn't get one response from Mr. Duxbury. I have tried to explain that to this council. Ms. Sleeper says you can have a judicial re review. It would have cost me $30,000 for a judicial review to show you Mr. Duxbury didn't follow rules of the integrity commissioner. I did not get one response. And just so council's aware, he told me eight times that there was no complaint against me. I sent him eight emails saying, please provide me with the complaint and the details and I will answer your questions. And each time he told me, I don't have to have a complaint to look into you. I don't have one. That was a lie. I got, the, I got the official complaint the Friday before council got the report and emailed them back and said, so eight times you told me you didn't have a complaint, eight times I asked you again. I'm saying to council, I'm asking you to let me in an in-camera session tell you my experience because Councillor Campbell got to email you his and your recommendation is going to be based on this paired with, with Mrs. Leeper's recommendation. And I think you, the rules here in that time frame were a got you. And that's all it was. You spent the evening humiliating me, ridiculing me, attacking me, telling me I was not worthy for this seat, and I harassed nobody. If you are going to implement rules, and you're, the maximum is not supposed to be your base mark, I will tell you, you started with me with the maximum. And to this date, 
Mr. Duxbury's report, which I read five times again before I came to this council chamber, does not tell you what I said. And just so council's aware, I emailed Mr. Duxbury the day he released his report and said, can you please clarify for me where and what you think I breached? And he said, no, my report speaks for itself. And my response to him was, well, if it did, I wouldn't have asked you. So I think you're very lucky that you got an integrity commissioner that listened, didn't dismiss you, and wasn't out to get you. And as a counselor, I'm gonna support their recommendation because I thought it was fair. And I didn't think get you was appropriate tonight. Okay. Councillor uh, Cario, uh, Morocco, and then Campbell. Yeah, uh, Your Worship, I'd like to wait till this vote before I speak. I wanna make a comment after the vote. Okay. Um, uh, so then it'll be Morocco, Council Morocco. First of all, I'm sorry. Um, Councilor Iannone, now you're trying to play the victim. And don't oh. ever say that wow. we said you weren't worthy of that seat. That was never, ever said. We only asked you for an apology. <laughs> Come on, let's face Councilor, it. We were taking the recommendation, Your comments, Worship, we were taking please. the recommendation. I'm voting consistently. I'm voting consistently on what the Integrity Commissioner report came, both reports. And that's all that we were doing. They, this council decided to take it to the 90 days. We were asking for an apology. No apology was given at all. And the report basically said that there was no uh, cooperation in getting any of the information back. That was clear. That was brought back to our attention. That the documents were doctored, uh, doctored, that we're going back and forth. So, you know, we were actually trying to say, just apologize. And we were not trying now, I don't want to be looking like we are the bullies here, because that's not the case. We're talking about a breach of confidentiality in council chambers, which you're elected to do is making sure that you do not breach. Not something that a gentleman outside of this chamber was trying to help an individual, thinking that it was his own personal time. Totally different crimes. Yes, Ms. Leeper. Permission to address council. Yes, please. Um, I want you all to remember. Totally different. Oh, don't say you're going to be. Councillors. I didn't say that. No. <laughs> Councillors, wow. please. We're going to direct know. attention to the so Integrity through, Commissioner, Ms. Leeper. Through you, Your Worship, I just wish to remind members of council that no doubt the complainant is watching. And if I could ask your worship to just keep us on the point rather than going back to another report, I'm in no position to speak to the other report. Clearly there are still strong feelings about it and it may be worthy of in another place and a time having a conversation. But out of respect for somebody who has put themselves in your hands to make a complaint and there is a motion on the floor, I would respectfully <coughs> request that council stay with the report before. Okay, I appreciate that. And I know the complainant was here earlier and I saw he had left, and I don't know, I'm assuming he's left the building, uh, but we are uh, live streaming, and we are recording through our local cable channel, so this will be accessible on our city website as well. So I would offer the floor then to Councillor Campbell, and uh, if you'd like to uh, address, uh, address Council and address the complainant. Thank you, Your Worship, <clears throat> if I may. On October 14th, 2017, a fellow counselor requested my assistance for a citizen. Due to my personal experiences, I felt comfortable to do so. As a result of the manner in which I commuted with this in, communicated with this individual, individual, I regrettably caused this citizen distress, for which I am truly sorry. As a result of my reaction during our communications, I sought professional assistance. The therapist has helped me and is presently helping me to understand that I was and am suffering from PTSD as a result of my daughter's death and had been triggered by the conversation with the uh, citizen. I wish the citizen of this integrity investigation good health and hope that he accepts my apology. And in the spirit of pos positive uh, action, I I'm going to uh, offer a $2,000 uh, donation to my daughter's fund, Katie Marie Campbell Fund, who in turn, that fund ha helps fund past on mental health. And that is uh, something I will follow up on. 
Thank you for that, Councillor. Do we have... Uh, do you have a motion? Pardon me? Okay, well, we've got the motion. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion. Yes, Councillor Peter Angel. Worship, I didn't get a chance to speak. Um, I just, uh, I, I wanted to say thank you to Councillor Campbell um, for offering the gift that's gonna go to Pasto and Mental Health. Uh, I think it's very appropriate. Um, you can tell by the circumstances, Your Worship, that this isn't a situation that any of us wanna be in. Uh, I don't know another profession that has to, I guess, um, judge their colleagues and then is made to work together with them directly after the judgment. It's a very uh, uncomfortable situation. I think if you allowed people to opt out, you'd have a hard time having quorum. So uh, we're all prepared to support the motion. And again, I thank Councillor Campbell for his honesty. Okay, then we will call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Leeper. Thank Appreciate you. your help. Uh, Councillor Carriel. <clears throat> Thank you, Worship. In light of what I've just seen happen, and I think we did treat Councillor Campbell very fairly, but I really believe we treated Councillor Iannone unfairly. And I'd like to make a motion that we give her her three months payback that we took away from her. And I think that would make it fair. She still suffered greatly from what we did, and I feel that we need to give her back her three months pay in order to be fair. So I'll make that motion at this time. Okay, second. Uh, second by Councillor Crater. Uh, do we have discussion around the council? Yes, uh, Councillor Morocco, Councillor Crater. So what's the repercussions then, Your Worship, I have to ask then, when uh, you breach confidentiality? I mean, the Integrity Commission's report and the months and the, and the thousands of dollars that were spent. So does that set a precedence for all of us now? Because I know there was, there was huge debate in that room and there was no doubt that they wanted to do more than that, which I think the 90 day suspension was good enough based on the facts that it was uh, you know, a breach of confidentiality. So my question is, what, and we didn't even get a thank you, staff didn't get a thank you, we didn't even get an apology at all. Sorry, not thank you, but an apology. Sorry, I'm just, I'm just like, you do something wrong and you're not gonna even get a slap on the hand? I really can't believe that. So you're just now gonna say that if anybody does anything wrong, it's okay. It's okay. I have a hard time accepting that because we have accountability and that's why we have integri integrity commissioners appointed. And I just can't seem to let that go. If you do something wrong, you have to be held accountable. An apology would have been great, but we didn't get it. No. I'm not gonna support it. Councilor Iannone, would you like to take this opportunity to apologize? Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry that everything escalated the way that it did. I'm sorry we are ripping shreds out of each other here. I was even sorrier that night when I left here knowing that people I counted on as my friends wouldn't even listen to my side. I, am, I don't know what apology Councillor Morocco wants because nobody asked me for one. And by the way, the email that you received tonight was incorrect. Mr. Duxbury didn't tell you to dock my pay and kick me off committees and take, take me off hold co. And by the way, Councilor Morocco, you can go watch the tape. I don't speak uninformed, and I guarantee you somebody stood up in this council chamber and said I was not worthy of this seat, and I needed to step down. I didn't say that you did, but you stood up here and you said I was playing the victim, <coughs> those words weren't said, and I guarantee you they were. So you can raise your eyebrows all you want, but I, I have asked repetitively to be allowed to tell you how that integrity commissioner played itself out. I am very sorry anybody here thinks I breached in camera. And I'm even sorrier that Mr. Duxbury brought back the report he did. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. Okay, is there any other, dis yes, Councillor uh, Peter Angel. Your Worship, I like consistency. Um, we've had different integrity commissioners. Uh, I mean, I'd like to see Mrs. Leapers look at this and give us her honest opinion. I really liked her style. I liked the way that she addressed us. 
I liked what she had to say to us. I can appreciate the fact that she might not have gone through it yet, but I honestly would like her opinion. So whether that happens tonight or whether it happens another night, I don't know. But I think that would be the fair way to go about it. She seems very uh, reasonable in her approach. And uh, I mean, I think it would be a good thing to have her look at it and give us some advice. Because like I said before, none of us really want to be in this situation. So that would be the way that I would vote. Okay, well, uh, either you can make a motion to uh, defer this, because otherwise we have a motion on the table and seconded. Uh, so if, you know, it's up to you how you want to handle it. Yes, Councillor Carrio? I'd be fine with deferring it to have Mr. Well, if he's making a Motion for a deferral, I have to wait to make my comment if there's a seconder, I guess. Oh, no. Yeah, okay, um, Mr. Beeman? Okay. Um, what are we asking to defer? Uh, decision, the motion. The, a decision on the motion. On the council. Yes. Um, could I, if, if we're going to do any of this, I'll have, could I speak with Mr. Yes. Beeman? Yes. Can I speak then? Might cause a bit of a procedural legal issue that she's raised with me about the, this particular circumstance. Yeah, well then why don't you do that, go talk yeah. to her, and then we'll let Councilor Cario speak. Uh, certainly, and uh, Council, if, uh, if she can hang around, well, I wonder if you might, would Council be open to putting this off for a, for us to have a extended hearing on this matter? It might take us 15, 20 minutes to, to, to discuss this. Um, that's what I'm on concern with. Um, if, 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 if one of the first, I, I'm open to what, what council wants to just say that this race is a, a legal issue for us lawyers. Councilor Kerr, so you, you've heard well, it. Worship, I, yeah. We're, we're going to be speaking about more money to have it reviewed by another integrity commissioner than we're talking about. We're not talking about a lot of money. We're talking about three months' pay, which there's not, I mean, there's not a lot of money. My feeling is it'll cost more money to have the integrity commissioner review everything that was done in the past than we're going to do tonight to give Councilor Hanoli the three months' pay. I really believe that she has gone through enough and that she will be have been punished enough, having seen what I've seen tonight. So I'd like to leave the motion stand. If it passes, fine. Everybody can vote their conscience. Okay. Well, then why don't we do this? So, Councilor, uh, so if you want to, is, it, do we have, is there a seconder for motion for deferral? There was two seconders. Okay. Oh, my motion. Deferral. Oh. Okay. So, so there's a motion for deferral which is non-debatable, uh, that this be deferred until uh, the integrity commissioner could refer to it. Pardon me? Councillor Pietrangelo. Councillor Morocco. Okay, so we'll call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, opposed? I have a conflict. Okay, well then it passes. Uh, refer, it's deferred <coughs> until the uh, integrity commissioner can meet with Mr. Beeman and then they'll bring that back, and then we're gonna consider that under the fact that Councillor Iannone did apologize, and then we'll have that discussion. Um, I just want to be sure, it, is the extent to which Council would like Ms. Leeper to review the decision, or do they simply just want her opinion on penalty? Well, she'll sure. give an opinion, give an opinion. If she knows the case, she may well, know Well, she won't know the case, that, that's just she it, she won't know the case. I'm sure no, that she knows all the case. case. Yeah, Councillor Morocco? I don't want her <coughs> to speak to it. But Councillor Iannone asked if she would be able to have an opportunity to speak to us and in camera and tell her side that we never got to hear. So that's why I'm willing to say that we need to do her. I don't think that we need to bring in more legal. I think it's just an opportunity for her. She's apologized and she's actually asked, I'm sorry, I, Councillor Iannone, did you not ask to have an in camera in the back to speak to us at a different time? So I would like to give her that opportunity. I don't think that I'm looking to have legal spend any more. I'm looking to our counselor to give us co uh, communication in the back and explain her side of what we did not hear. That's all. I don't think we're looking for more money to spend on legal. Okay. Well, the vote's been taken. Yeah. The vote approved. So we're going to bring this back. That's and part of the deferral. Yes. So we can't talk about it either. So we have to just let it go for now at this point. <coughs> okay. So we're going to move on to the planning portion of our council meeting. Um, first item is Mo request for deferral. I've got Ms. Gilberti. Did you want to address Council Ms. Gilberti? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Members of council, staff, ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, very briefly, my comments are to ask for a deferral of the public meeting tonight until July the 10th in order that the applicant and the team of consultants can uh, be afforded the opportunity to look at the recommendations listed in the staff report and hopefully uh, include all of those modifications to the plan, uh, negotiate or go back to staff, have them review the, the revised plan and come back to you on July the 10th. Um, with uh, a revised staff report. Uh, uh, if I could just finish, please. All I was going to also ask, if you could please direct staff to prepare the necessary bylaws, if appropriate, for consideration by council on that same night, on July the 10th. Okay. And approval of what she's asking. Moved deferral and approval of preparing the bylaws yes. uh, for the July 10th meeting, seconded by Councilor Morocco. If there's no discussion to this, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank okay, you. Okay, thanks very much. Have a good evening. All right, you too. <coughs> this is for the uh, vacant land kind of Thank you. Hey, Vic. Now ask the uh, clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. The public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed amendment to the city's official plan and zoning bylaw and a plan of vacant land condominium to permit a 37 unit townhouse development and to recognize an existing semi detached at 5606, 5916, and rear portion of 5928 and 5930 Dunn Street. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 18th, 2018, and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of the passing of the official plan and zoning bylaw amendment uh, and a plan of vacant lot condominium and approval or, it, or to participate in any site plan <coughs> process, if applicable, or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you, Mr. Matson. I'd now ask Mr. Herlovich to explain the purpose and reason for the proposed amendments. Thank you, Mr. Acting Mayor. The uh, property is located on the south side of Dunn Street. There are a number of houses facing onto Dunn Street. It will be a redevelopment of the property. Uh, so the property's on Dunn Street. It's a little bit west of Atlantis Avenue. The um, immediately uh, north of the property is a former That's Niagara six. College property. Next to that is an apartment building and uh, Cavendish Manor retirement home. There are retirement uh, residences, uh, or I mean other residential uses to the, um, to the east of the site, hotel parking on the south, and there is a townhouse development immediately on the west side of this property. Uh, the property is uh, identified by the clerk involve a number of properties on Dunn Street, so there will be a consolidation of those uh, three properties into um, one redevelopment site uh, labeled number A, which is uh, 0.82 of a hectare, and uh, that would be proposed for 37 townhouses. And then they would retain a parcel B, which would be for to retain an existing semi-detached dwelling uh, fronting onto um, Dunn Street. The uh, proposed layout for the, the townhouse then would be a single a access into uh, the development um, and with a hammerhead at the end of that serving 37 uh, proposed townhouses. The semi-detached dwelling is located at the northwest corner of the property. There's a driveway here with a double parking space uh, for that townhouse. Uh, so that would be, be retained on the street. Uh, again, the uh, proposal is for a common driveway for those 37 units. They would be individually uh, owned as vacant land condos. Oops, I want to back up. Uh, as well, I want to point out there is, uh, uh, in addition to parking and garages for each of these units, there is a parking lot for guests, um, providing about 10 uh, parking spaces 
uh, to accommodate visitors. The uh, Dunn Street and the official plans designated residential. It's an intensification corridor and it encourages a density of 50 units per hectare. Uh, this proposal will have uh, a density of 45 units per hectare, so slightly under uh, the requirements, so we will need a, an official plan amendment for that. Uh, the 70 detached dwelling does meet the density target. Uh, the official plan amendment can be supported. There are largely two uh, story townhouses, similar in height, massing and setback to the existing buildings. Uh, the building setbacks will comply with the uh, design guidelines of the official plan. They'll have a height of 7.6 meters, a little over 25 feet. Rear yards of uh, 7.5 meters, again around um, 25 feet, and interior side yards of about uh, 4 meters. Um, you can see the elevation for these uh, buildings, so they would be two stories with uh, a garage for each unit. The development provides a gradation of density between the six-story uh, apartment building next to the former Niagara College and the um, existing townhouses to the east, so uh, 96 units per hectare to the northeast of this site and 35 units um, per hectare to the west and this development has a 45 unit per hectare, so right in the middle. Um, the, they're looking for some uh, a zone change, part of the property is zone development holding, part of it is zone um, R4, so they would be looking for the whole of the site to be zoned R4. Uh, the townhouses, because it is an intensification project, uh, they would be looking for a slight modification, so only 22.62 square meters of lot area per dwelling, uh, there would be slightly higher than, in coverage than the standard. Again, it's an intensification project. So they're looking for 43%, but they actually are providing a little bit more landscaping uh, than the bylaw would typically call for. So instead of 45 square meters, they'll provide 56 square meters of landscaping uh, per dwelling. <coughs> um, the uh, proposal can be uh, supported because it accommodates the compact built form which is becoming more common. It's an efficient use of land, uh, which is required by the uh, growth plan. Uh, there's a minor increase of about 5% on coverage, which will uh, really not be perce perceivable, and uh, there's an increase in landscaping. The uh, property on uh, Dunn Street, the semi-detached dwelling, would be rezoned from R4 to an R2, which is our two-family zone. Uh, they would uh, be seeking a adjustment in the, uh, the regulations for lot area from 600 square meters to 474 square meters uh, because it's an existing uh, frontage. The uh, frontage would be 16.7 meters instead of 16 and there's an existing building so again they're looking for uh, 3.2 meters setback from Dunn Street instead of 6 meters. Those as well are supported. That frontage has existed since uh, the 1930s. Uh, the front yard setback is similar to others along Dunn Street and it has sufficient lot depth to provide uh, sufficient amenity area. The uh, vacant land condominium would divide this into uh, 37 blocks of land that would be owned separately. The driveway would be joined in co or owned in common. The uh, plan would facilitate the sale of those units. The developer will be required to enter the condominium agreement to address uh, grading, servicing, landscaping, fencing, um, and waste disposal. So therefore, uh, we found that the proposal does meet the provincial policy statements, uh, will assist the city in meeting its 40% intensification target. It does comply with the regional policy plan, uh, it complies with the residential designation of the city's official plan, and the proposed development encourages consolidation of properties into one comprehensive development. It supports uh, the existing infrastructure and it provides housing choices and contributes to the city's short-term housing supply. Therefore, staff is recommending that council approve the official plan and zoning amendment um, for the site uh, special policy area. We zone them from uh, R4 in part and to R2 in part to permit 40, uh, 37 unit townhouses at a density of 45 units a hectare. The majority of the lands to be recognized as uh, for that single or semi-detached dwelling. The plan uh, big condominium would be subject to uh, the conditions in the appendix and that the mayor and clerk, uh, or mayor designate be 
authorized to sign the uh, draft plan uh, approval for a uh, period, period of, uh, within 20 days after the uh, decisions lodged. The draft approval will be given for uh, a <coughs> period um, and the mayor and clerk would be authorized to execute the condominium agreement. Those are the highlights of that application. Thank you, Mr. Erlovich. Do we have any questions of council? Hey, seeing none, members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral that it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting tonight. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the proposed amendments. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to speak to this? Okay, seeing none, council will now hear from the applicant or his or her representative. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council and city staff. Uh, uh, having read through the report, uh, we're very supportive. Uh, however, there's one item under Appendix uh, A, uh, which would be the conditions under the draft plan to be met. Uh, item 19, which notes that, and I'll read it out here, um, the developer install an automatic sprinkler system in all residential units due to lack of a secondary emergency access. So uh, I'd offer to consider that being struck out subject to a conversation with fire prevention. And our opinion is that uh, the project under planning is also regulated under the Ontario Building Code Act. And under my experiences, I cannot find anything under the Ontario Building Code Act that would speak of having to sprinkler townhouses or whether we've missed something under a specific bylaw, because uh, usually the Fire Code Act kicks in after the Building Code Act. So I just want some clarity on why we're having to sprinkler townhouses. And I'd be willing to certainly have a conversation with fire prevention, um, um, but perhaps that component could be removed uh, at this point. And if it were, if there was something <coughs> that were perhaps missed, we would certainly revisit it as a condition. Okay, Mr. Raimondo, I'll start with Mr. Herlovich. If you can help me out here, and then if we need to go to the our chief, uh, you direct me. Yeah, I'll defer to the fire chief. I'm not uh, familiar with the uh, condition. Okay. Your Worship, uh, the fire department requires, uh, so we're the only emergency service that can look at any of the plans. So we have always required two means of <coughs> egress and exit, because uh, we're talking for police, EMS, and fire. When that's failed and we can't get it and it's greater than 90 meters, then we want the buildings to be sprinklered because of fire safety concerns. So we default back to just mm -hmm. us. Um, there is only one access to this, it is greater, um, and we require sprinkling. The same as we have done for sleep development, which I believe is coming next, and a couple other developments in the city. Okay. Uh, council, uh, do we have any uh, feedback from council on this issue? This is the only one that you have issue with, your Mr. Mr. Mondo, yeah. Does council have any uh, input or feedback on your feelings on this? Okay. <laughs> so. Is there any other comments that you wanted to make besides yeah. that? Uh, no, that that's it. Uh, on, in response to uh, the fire chief's uh, comment. Yeah, did you have a comment to that? Um, we there are additional fire hydrants that are brought into the site, and uh, generally, you know, the truck would stop, and the hydrant would be positioned in a manner to comply with the Ontario Building Code, uh, and meet the requirements of fire access. So, I just I'm still not clear on, uh, um, you know, the the. Uh, the authority uh, requirements on uh, whether it's a Ni specific Niagara Falls requirement, or again, this is new construction relegated under the, under the Ontario Building Code, um, and uh, we would follow the Ontario Building Code requirements. Well, let me get an our solicitor. Sure. Uh, Unless I'm missing something, there are yeah. a number of municipalities that have that uh, make this as a requirement. There is a power under the uh, under the uh, fire code. Uh, the, Fire Prevention and Protection Act for making these kind of requirements in specific situations, uh, so that the there is the, the repeated referring to the Ontario Building Code does not circumvent the need to comply with the planning process. 
that you have heard from the people who are responsible for the uh, safety of the people who will eventually live in these buildings, this is what they feel is the standard that the, that the council should adapt. Um, and this, this has been, the contest been done in other municipalities throughout the province, um, in particular near here, St. Catharines and Niagara and Lake both have projects that have this kind of thing in them. Thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor Thompson, did you get your hand up? And Councillor Crater? Well, I, I did. I was just going to uh, move the approval uh, subject to uh, the uh, further discussions, but I listened to uh, the solicitor and uh, I don't think anybody wants to make a decision that uh, is uh, going to put anybody in jeopardy uh, with respect to fire and there's one access to this and so uh, the other one we're dealing with. Uh, uh, so um, I don't know. I. Uh, I think it's going to make a difference to the project uh, as far as cost involved. And uh, uh, if, any, if there's any way that they can come up with alternatives uh, rather than doing that, uh, I would support that. You talk about uh, extra um, hydrants, et cetera. Hydrants uh, uh, throughout the project. Does, does that make any difference? Uh, and your worship to Councilor Thompson, no, it doesn't make any difference. Strictly access. It's, no, yeah, we need access and we need fire protection. And I mean, to date in 2018, we've got 52 deaths. We keep promoting smoke and COs and they're not working. Um, the Canadian building code is changing. Uh, there's a big move afoot across Canada to make sprinklers in every building, whether it's a house or a condo or any other structure. So um, we're standing, that's, we're trying to save lives. That's our job and we know sprinklers work. It actually reduces uh, like your house insurance as well. Okay, Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, the way I, this is the way I look at it, is that if we were to not go ahead with what our staff is recommending and our fire chief and something happened, I know what I'd be doing. I'd be suing the city of Niagara Falls that had a report <coughs> that said there should be sprinkler alarms put in, recommended by your fire department, even our city solicitors recommending it. I don't, I don't think there's any question in, our, in my mind anyway, we don't have choice. Uh, because we, we bear the liability if something goes wrong. We'll bear the liability. So unless, and I know you do great work and everything, but uh, unless something comes back that can change that, to say it's not required, there's no liability on the city's part, and, and I'm sticking with the recommendation that's come forward by our planning department. Okay. Any other questions or comments of council? I think, uh, yeah, just, you want just to one thing is, you know, and we're all for, you know, life safety, paramount, absolutely. Uh, but in our experience is what we're finding, there's, there's been a tendency to sort of blur the Ontario Fire Code with the Ontario Building Code and how the two, uh, or how the two are actually uh, uh, placed in the progress of a design or a building, right? And uh, perhaps, I mean, like every uh, fire jurisdiction, there's municipalities uh, and the fire chiefs meet and they discuss uh, perhaps uh, um, mandates or would like to have conditions, certainly in, in aspects of life safety, and hence a couple of examples in St. Catharines recently and one in Niagara Lake. Uh, but in my professional opinion, uh, I think it's putting the cart before the horse. And as I noted, uh, these projects are mandated under the, under the Ontario Building Code, and the Ontario Fire Code takes precedent after occupancy. So I'm just trying to understand, uh, are we going to now sprinkler entire subdivisions? Is this the beginning of a precedent? And again, not... Uh, not uh, uh, looking at life safety, it's paramount, uh, but I'm just looking at the precedent that may be set. So and, and hence, hence, hence my questioning item 19, maybe it's worth some more conversation. Mr. Beeman, and well, then, uh, then if he wants more conversation, then the solution is to defer the matter. But if he wants to get it appealed today, 
I would recommend to council that it be approved with the condition that your staff has recommended. So what would, what's your what's your preference? Because I think uh, you know, there's a broader discussion for sure, but I understand the safety issue and access is important, and that's the direction that we receive from our chief. So, but you tell us the direction if you, if you want to. Well, deal we're with here. Our, our, our client is serious about this development and moving forward. But I think the way it's been tabled to some, <laughs> to some degree, um, it's unfair in a sense. So you can, you know, Mr. Beeman could certainly say, well, we could place this and either defer it, but I don't think that's the intentions of our client. But on the same note, in all due respect to life safety, that we, he shouldn't be penalized for an, an added expense uh, when it may, you know, at least in our opinion, uh, it may not be sort of maybe on a municipal jurisdictional level, it's something preferred, but on the Ontario Building Code Act, which these buildings are mandated under, it's not a requirement. So I'm just trying to get some clarity on that. I don't think we can be any more clear. Yeah. We want it. Yeah, I understand. Mr. Erlovich, you wanted to weigh in? Well, I didn't know whether this would help uh, so council in their, their decision or not, but the once council approves the, uh, the report or the um, draft approval and the conditions, if it's, if it's determined that we don't need the uh, sprinklers, then we can bring a report back to council recommending that the condition be removed. If during that discussions, uh, council, or if there's no um, way that we can deal with it without the sprinklers, then the decisions made, we don't have to come back to council, but conditions can be uh, amended at any time before registration occurs. So it does require a report back, but that would give a chance for uh, Mr. Vermondo to meet with the fire department and see if we can come up with an alternative solution. Yeah. Yeah. I can close it yet. So the report in the, the report this evening is uh, the finality of the agreement is complying with all the conditions. So you still have a segue, there's still a segue uh, out in, in essence. Mm -hmm. The owner is still obligated to comply with all the conditions and condition 19 happened to be one of them that we would have to uh, certainly review. Yeah, you can review and meet with the fire and department. Our client, our client is favorable about moving forward. Yeah. Uh, but I think as uh, Mr. Hurler pointed <coughs> out, uh, uh, we still are required to comply with the conditions and there may be some variables. Okay, so then why don't we move forward with it and uh, we'll put, let me first start by closing the uh, public meeting. Uh, it is now closed. Motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo that we approve the recommendation. Call the vote, all those in favor? Okay, and that's unanimous. Thank you. So congratulations, and then you can have further dialogue with the fire department. Maybe you might be able to come to some further resolution on that one item 19. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Okay, thank thanks, you, Mr. Mr. Raimondo. I'd like to ask the city clerk to introduce the next item on the agenda. Public meeting is now being convened to consider a proposed plan of vacant land condominium on a 0 0.87 hectare parcel of land located on the east side of Portage Road, south of the CN Railway. Notice was given by first class mail in accordance with the Planning Act on May 22nd, 2018 and by posting a sign on the property in question. Anyone who wants notice of council's decision or preserve their opportunity to appeal to the local planning appeal tribunal shall leave their name on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Thank you. I'd ask our director of planning, Mr. Rilovich, to explain the purpose of the application. Thank you, Worship. This uh, property is for the former uh, Niagara build-all site on, um, net, on Portage Road. Uh, it's the rear portion of that site. Uh, it's behind uh, St. Antoine um, uh, School. And the uh, proposal is um, uh, a large uh, block of land, four townhouses with a, a long access route to Portage. The uh, application before you tonight is for a vacant land condominium application. It would be for 96 townhouse units. Uh, council had deferred the official plan and zoning amendment 
application uh, when <coughs> this was previously before council in 2016 um, so that uh, they could, uh, the applicant and the industrial developer to the north uh, could get together. Uh, that was uh, appealed and at the Ontario Municipal Board they approved the city's official plan amendment to allow for the change from industrial to residential and they approved the amendment to the zoning bylaw. The final uh, passing of that bylaw has been withheld until uh, the conditions of the official plan amendment are satisfied and that includes the uh, application of condominium uh, before you tonight. So the uh, property itself uh, is uh, on, uh, access is on to Portage Road. It's behind the church and the school that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's also the industrial building, the former build all uh, building <coughs> itself. There's a proposed 10 foot high or 10 meter high uh, vegetated berm and wall. It's a noise wall between the sea and mainland, mainline rather, and that wall and berm curves around uh, to the north of the townhouse development, which forms then a separation between uh, the oleo in industry to the north. Uh, which fronts onto Thorlstone Road, and the berm and wall were part of the negotiated settlement, and uh, one of the uh, requirements under the uh, approval <coughs> came from the Ontario Municipal Board. Um, the uh, lands are designated residential, special policy number 71, <coughs> subject to that OMB hearing. Uh, the uh, provides for a variety of housing types, and uh, the maximum density is 40 units per hectare. Uh, higher density densities are directed to the arterial roads. Uh, special policy 71 requires that the mitigation measures be uh, in place to determine air quality, acoustical and vibration studies that need to be incorporated into the plan of condominium. The plan of vacant land condominium does conform with the official plan amendment that was approved by the board most townhouses have an overall density of 18.8 .8 units per hectare. Um, it's uh, under the uh, required uh, maximum um, of the official plan. The um, official plan amendment also recommended that there be mitigation measures for noise, vibration, um, the provision for a vegetated berm and wall uh, up to 10 meters in height along the west and north is one of the requirements. The upgraded building standards, there will be brick uh, facades in certain buildings and air conditioning. <coughs> uh, there will be noise cl um, clauses um, introduced to, into the uh, uh, sales agreements and a further noise analysis will be needed once the final grading um, is done. The proposed development will provide a transition from low density residential and institutional uses uh, to the south and west and the uh, industrial uses to the north. The uh, proposed zoning is an R4, uh, up to the decision of the OMB that permits townhouse dwellings in groups of two or more. Uh, the site-specific lot area is uh, to permit the number of dwelling as proposed, which is 96. The lot frontage, side yard, and rear yard depths and setbacks uh, from the public lane, lot coverage, the privacy yards, maximum floor area um, for, for the community center are all provisions in that zoning bylaw. The final order from the OMB for that zone change will be issued once the city confirms land use compatibility are addressed in the conditions <coughs> of the condominium approval. So one rests on what happens here at uh, council tonight. The vacant land condominium process will divide the property into blocks of land that can then be owned separately. The plan will facilitate the sale of the <coughs> units uh, to be built upon them. The plan has a private uh, common road, common element to the condominium development off Portage Road, has visitor parking and amenity <coughs> areas. The conditions of the plan would implement uh, special policy area 71, requires the construction of the berm, um, air conditioning <coughs> and the other things that I mentioned a minute ago. Um, the, to reduce traffic uh, queuing on Portage Road, uh, the traffic study that was uh, done by the consultant identifies the need for a left turn lane. So uh, as you're coming south on Portage Road, uh, there will be a left turn lane uh, into this development so that uh, traffic continuing south 
uh, would not be held up. The developer would be required to enter into condominium agreement with the city to address the necessary works and uh, warning clauses. The recommend recommended conditions of approval include review of the drainage and storm servicing by the Conservation Authority, sprinkling of the buildings as recommended by fire services, and the installation of necessary facilities and services for Canada Post and Enbridge Gas. Um, staff there found, therefore found that the application for condominium complies with the provincial and regional policies. They complies with or conforms with the city's official plan and zoning bylaw, um, and it will assist in providing housing choices that contributes to the city's short-term housing supply. Um, it addresses the city, regions, and conservation authority um, interests as well as the minutes of settlement negotiated between the applicant and Oleo Energies, which was part of that OMB decision on the official plan and zoning. Uh, there are, are a number of conditions attached as an uh, appendix to the report. Therefore, we are recommending that sleep uh, development plan for the vacant land condominium be draft approved subject to conditions of appendix A that the mayor is designate be allowed to uh, sign uh, after 20 days notice of council's decision. The draft approval will be given for a period of three years and the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the condominium agreement. <coughs> Those are the highlights of the uh, report. Thank you, Mr. Hurlovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Yes, Councilor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Okay. Just, uh, I just had a couple short questions um, to, our, to our plan. Alex, first of all, I did hear you say that it is mandatory for them to put in sprinkler alarm systems in the development. I didn't hear that. I don't know it's mandatory. It, it's been negotiated that they would be providing they them. Yes. So that kind of reaffirms. They agreed that they would do it. The only reason I mention because it kind of reaffirms the lengthy discussion we had in the previous application. The other thing, Your Worship, is uh, I thought it was a positive thing. That's why I'm saying. Yeah. It but was. Uh, the other thing was, and I just I had a number of the residents who live around that area called, and, and they thought and that. The process tonight still gives them an opportunity because they were concerned about the traffic. And I was led to believe that all that had been approved and we, we went to the OMB, everything was approved. So there's no process now, everything is approved for the, the flow of the traffic. That's the way That's it what is. I understand, but Mr. Yeah. Uh, Dren or Mr. Hurlovich, could you just clarify, uh, or Sorry, Mr. Beeman? Legal question. <laughs> yes, uh, the, the uh, uh, Councilor Creator is correct. Matters concerning traffic and that type of that land use have already been okay. resolved. The condominiums just deals with the uh, basically the built form and things like the berms and that sort of thing. Okay, Thank you. that's great. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions of council? Okay, seeing none. Council now hear from anyone. I'm sorry. Let me back up. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting could result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives if the party's not made an oral or written submission at this public meeting. Council will now hear from anyone other than the applicant who wishes to speak to the plan of vacant land condominium. Is there anyone here other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Yes, you can step up, state your name and your address. Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Anthony Nunziata and I'm the uh, owner of uh, 4536 Portage, which is the uh, industrial property uh, to the south of the uh, proposed development. Let me just say uh, tonight <coughs> that uh, I, or we are in support of the, uh, the land use application uh, from the applicant uh, for residential, so that's not our issue uh, this evening, uh, but simply some comments with respect to uh, some of the considerations on site plan and the plan of condominium as it impacts um, the connection to uh, the property to the south, the industrial's property. Uh, so I had several, I had written the uh, director of planning uh, with several points with respect to screening and buffering, which is on the north side of, uh, of my property on 4536. Uh, most of those issues are concerned with security lighting that we have in the back of the uh, parking area and cameras that we have, which would effectively be uh, aimed at uh, the proposed residential area. Uh, so we would just ask that uh, screening and buffering be adequate uh, to provide for any privacy issues that may arise in the future. Um, we'd asked um, 
that uh, those same uh, uh, screening and buffering considerations also uh, uh, deal with with respect to impact during the construction, noise attenuation, and things like that, um, that they may do during the construction period, and that may arise out of the industrial use of the existing property, so that it be adequate enough not to uh, impact the residential. <coughs> the uh, private road that's being proposed, uh, we'd ask that um, there be some detail with respect to uh, sidewalks and curbs uh, as provided <coughs> with respect to uh, that private roadway. Uh, we'd ask that uh, within the, uh, the plan that it would have adequate lighting along that road. Uh, we're not concerned as property that there would be uh, light spill onto the property at 4536. So that wouldn't be a requirement that we would uh, require there be no spill into that area because we think that should be adequately lighted. Um, and we'd also ask, uh, which we noticed in the plan, there wasn't a designated area for uh, snow. Uh, for so pushing snow uh, and clearing that roadway, uh, inevitably we felt that would end up on uh, 4536 property. That would be a designated area uh, to push and store uh, for the snow removal. Uh, and then the issues with respect to traffic, we raised the issue with respect to the queuing uh, because of the CN rail track, which I know is uh, underway with its own review. But uh, when there's queuing of more than eight cars, uh, it would block both the uh, entranceway into the, uh, um, into the plaza and into the private roadway. And we'd ask from traffic perspective, it could be designated with some no standing or idling areas in front of those areas. So as the queue would be separated still to provide access and egress to the, uh, to the area. Uh, and the last point uh, that I raised was just because of the significant <clears throat> demands uh, made for the site plan control with the berming. Uh, because we drain uh, on our property to the, uh, uh, to the north of our property, to the south of their property, the berms uh, effectively could pose a problem with respect to stormwater and the gathering of that water in that particular area <clears throat> that we have adequate uh, stormwater management consideration and drainage uh, consideration so that there's no pooling or, or any uh, adverse effects of that, uh, of that berm construction. Okay, we'll get, <coughs> excuse me, we'll get answers to all those when we get the uh, developer up here. That got everything? That's it. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, do we have anyone else other than the applicant who wishes to address council? Okay, seeing none, council now will hear from the applicant and his or her representative. Good evening, council. My name is Jennifer Vita from Upper Canada Consultants. Um, I'm the agent here on behalf of the owner. Um, I'm sure many of you remember this application from a few years ago. We have spent the last couple of years working with Olio to come to um, an agreement, a settlement, in order for development to proceed with a number of mitigation measures to be implemented. <coughs> um, the Ontario Municipal Board has now uh, approved the land use for residential purposes, and we're now applying for an application, which is simply to create condominium tenure. Um, we have dealt with land use compatibility issues, mitigation measures, buffering, and all those sorts of issues through the official plan and zoning process. Um, and a lot of the issues that uh, Mr. Nunziata had brought up will be dealt with through the site plan process as well in terms of stormwater drainage, uh, buffering and fencing and lighting. Those are all things that we have to provide designs for. They'll be vetted through the city's uh, engineering department, planning department, to make sure that they meet city standards. So in terms of stormwater, we can't uh, <laughs> prevent existing drainage, um, interfere with existing drainage, we will have to accommodate that within our system. So those are all issues that we'll deal with through the detailed site plan approval process, which is currently underway with the city. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do we have questions of council for Ms. Vida? Okay. So we're good. The main issue, though, uh, uh, Mr. Nunziata's questions and, uh, and uh, concerns uh, in his letter and the extra ones that he added in. Those will be addressed, Mr. Levich. So are we good to leave that for the site plan uh, process? We'll deal that with them, but <clears throat> I don't know what uses Mr. Nunziata operates from that building. It's, oper it's zoned light industrial. It's not to emit noise, sound, vibration, odors. So um, hopefully there is no conflict <coughs> with the residential use. Um, he's responsible for his own storm water can't be flowing onto other people's property, um, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, you know, 
just where it may be that the engineers in designing this condo provide a catch basin near the boundary line that might pick up any drainage. Um, the, uh, the zoning and, and official plan is in place. Basically, this condominium approval is to uh, facilitate that noise wall, the construction of that, and fulfill those conditions. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. so the screening, the screenings. Uh, typically a given, right? Because people in residential aren't going to walk want to look at an industrial uh, property. Typically, well, there'll likely be a fence there. Well, right. we require that there be a fence around yes. multi multi-family uh, development. <clears throat> um, you know, I I don't know how I don't know where his light fixtures are on his parking lot at the back of his building, uh, where they're directed. Of course, it's supposed to be directed onto his own property. Um, so. Um, but Ms. Vita, you're comfortable dealing with his concerns during the site plan process? Um, as Alex uh, mentioned, I think a lot of them are pretty straightforward in terms of lighting. You have to keep your lighting on your property, just like we will have to do a lighting plan for our development and demonstrate to staff that all the lighting is going to be directed. There's going to be no spillage onto the other properties. There is fencing proposed along the south boundary line where the interface is between the industrial area. Um, we have looked at all the industrial facilities in the area to make sure that we're providing the adequate uh, mitigation between the two uses so there's no conflict. Um, I'm, I'm confident that we can resolve the issues through the site plan process. Okay. Councillor Morocco? <coughs> so we're looking at, um, through you, Your Worship, um, to the presenter here. So we're looking at 96 units to be put in there. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Um, three years, sorry. Uh, we still have a train that goes through there. Yes. We don't have an overpass. No. So 96 units times two cars per person. I'm a little bit concerned that this is a huge project in development there. We still have people in the north end that complain, actually just on the weekend complained about the train and how it cuts everybody in half and everybody's stuck there for hours. <coughs> I think that we're just at this point, you know, we're adding to, again, traffic lining up there and in and out, egress, egress. And there's also the factories that I'm concerned with. They've been there forever. So now you're gonna sell to, people are gonna come in, they're gonna hear noise, the lights are in the back. So what are we gonna do now? go back and complain to the industry that's there that we've got a problem with their lighting and their noise or their smell of their factory. I don't want to lose any industry. We're really trying to, I know you said you mm -hmm. went and looked at them, yeah. but did you meet with them and did you talk yes. to them and did you work with them and everything's going to be okay. Mm -hmm. That uh, Mr. Anandiano's mm -hmm. property's going to be fine. He's not going to be pushed out because of the complaints or changes to uh, regulations that now shut him down from his noise and he has to shut down his factory and go somewhere else. I just wanted to make sure that we're really just looking at the whole picture. I love the fact that we're growing and looking to develop, mm -hmm. but it has to be smart. <coughs> I mean, we're just looking at another solid steel and the condo over there and what they're having to deal with now for soundproofing. Are the residents aware of that? Are the residents that are buying, and it really has to be that the residents that are buying, the people that are coming in to buy, have to be totally aware of what's around them. Mm -hmm. They're not told that. The next thing you know, we sit at this table and we're getting unbelievable amounts of calls complaining about odors or about uh, sound from uh, heavy equipment being operated. I'm, I'm just really cautious about what we're doing. We say that we want industry, but at the same time, it looks like we're okay to push it out because we're going to build more housing in an area that's right beside the industry. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I just can't support the <coughs> development. Mr. Erlovich, you wanted to comment? Yeah, the, the debate before this council is not about land use. The land use decision has already been made by the province. What they're looking at is how these units would be occupied and owned. They could, in fact, build the 96 units as a rental property and never come back to this council to get that approval. Exactly. They wish instead not to rent them, they wish to sell them, and therefore they're seeking condominium approval. The land use decisions out of the, out of the barn. Through, uh, can I make a comment as well? Yeah. 
Just yep. to give um, a little more comfort to council, uh, through the draft plan conditions, we are required to ensure that there are warning clauses placed in all subdivision agreements, condo documents, and will be in every purchase and sale agreement that um, is entered into a warning clause notifying them of the existing industrial uses and the potential for noise and odor and dust, all those sorts of things. Um, it just provides another level of protection um, and notification to the future residents that there could be a conflict. Absolutely. Okay, okay if there's no further questions of council, then I'm gonna close the meeting. Councillor Thompson. <clears throat> yes, um, you know, we've been all through this over the last couple of years. Uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, a great opportunity for uh, development in that area. There have been the traffic studies. Uh, we had people uh, previously come in, well, there's too much uh, traffic. I drive on that road uh, probably two or three times a day going back and forth, and uh, there's not that much traffic there. So uh, this is going to add to it. The railway tracks uh, are a problem. Hopefully we're still working on get, getting rid of those. Uh, otherwise, if we're going to start putting in overpasses, we're talking about $300 million to try to do it properly once you start doing that. So I think this is a, a great project for that. I, uh, I want to, I want to, uh, what's that? Uh, from the meeting I was at with the uh, staff with respect to the railroad issue. That's what it was. Um, uh, I would make a motion for approval, including uh, the concern for Mr. Uh, Annunziata's uh, comments and his letter to be worked on with the uh, developer and uh, so move. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Ta Councillor Anoni. <laughs> <clears throat> if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay. And uh, opposed? With one opposed. Okay, so it's approved. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Clerk, would you introduce the next item on the agenda? Public meeting is now being convened to consider a city-initiated amendment to the official plan to introduce <coughs> the Grand Niagara Secondary Plan. Notice was given in accordance with the regulations by publishing a notice in the Niagara Falls Review on Friday, May 25th, 2018, and by prepaid first-class mail on the same date, Friday, May 25th, 2018. Anyone who wants notice of the adoption of the official plan amendment number 118 shall leave their name and address on the sign-in sheets outside the council chamber. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Erlovich, could you please explain the reason for the public meeting on the official plan amendment? Thank you, Worship. This is a, uh, a privately initiated secondary plan <coughs> application. The uh, lands involve all of the properties east of the QEW, uh, west to uh, the former Crowland Avenue, and south from the Welland River, to Bigger Road and Lyons Creek Road. The area is approximately 330 hectares, 815 acres in size. The um, Grand Investments began uh, cons uh, consulting with the city staff back in 2015. Uh, they are in the process of redeveloping, they're the owners of Grand Niagara Golf Course and they're in the process of redeveloping that property. Staff directed the, the uh, owners to uh, also undertake um, a study along with some residential properties, EX, Fox, and Minax industrial uses, employment uses in the area, as well as lands to include the hospital. The planning process for the hospital itself is being governed by uh, Niagara Health System and um, is following a separate program, but this plan does provide for that hospital site. Uh, there is uh, a, currently a special policy, number 69, which applies to the property. It allows for the golf course use of the lands. It also has uh, environmental uh, protection lands uh, in place to protect uh, woodlands and creek systems. Um, and there are policies that would allow for 
residential uses as well as resort and hotel accommodation uses. The um, balance of the, the lands in the uh, secondary plan area include industrial designation, tourist commercial land, and environmental protection and environmental conservation lands. Uh, the proposed amendment would provide a detailed policy framework for the redevelopment of the entire area um, at build out, which is estimated to be 10 to 15 years. Uh, there would be approximately 35 to 4,300 people living in the area, about in the uh, houses of about 1,300 to 1,800 dwelling units, and approximately 3,600 jobs. The um, various studies were support, uh, submitted to support this secondary plan, uh, including the draft plan itself, Envi environmental impact study, traffic impact study, stormwater management study, <coughs> service re report, and uh, an environmental assessment requirement for a memorandum. The, uh, there was extensive public consultation. We had three open houses, uh, and there were separate meetings held with various landowners and stakeholders. We had a statutory public meeting held last July in these chambers. Um, a number of people came out and spoke uh, to that. One of the requests was for the extension of urban services uh, to properties on Bigger Road. Uh, that was accommodated uh, through the uh, secondary plan process. I'll show you a slide in a second as to how that would occur. A uh, concern was uh, raised regarding the future development of private property outside of the secondary plan. Those uh, owners were given an option to, uh, to um, step out of that and they chose to stay outside of the secondary plan. So the proposed sanitary sewer network is shown on the screen. So we did have concern from the residents or the property owners on Bigger Road. There's a large parcel here and a smaller <coughs> property. So the sanitary system would basically flow inside, internal to the property to the north and then it would extend along a proposed road system to connect with the uh, existing sewer on, um, on Montrose Road. The north half of the property, north of the railway tracks, again, that would be served by an internal uh, servicing system uh, for the north half. So there would basically be two, two sanitary systems flowing to Montrose, connecting with the um, Grassy Brook pumping station um, just south of the railway tracks. So um, if it's not clear, uh, there would be pro access then for this large property to connect to the back, to that sewer, and again, the residential property connect uh, easterly to the uh, proposed road. This road system is uh, the intended road system, but it's not uh, the, t the road system until we actually go through the subdivision process at a later date. The, um, there were concerns uh, raised in last July about the natural heritage um, in the area. There was uh, a letter from Moran's ecological consultant. Uh, they addressed a number of issues so that any uh, features that are removed that are not significant, that's, I just want to differentiate that from those that are significant, so any features that are not significant are removed, they would be compensated and that would be undertaken through an agreement with the city. Unevaluated wetlands, and there were no issues that were raised by Ministry of Natural Resources, so that addressed the, the concern about unevaluated wetlands. Uh, establishing of connections between features. Again, the ecological <coughs> restoration plan that I mentioned above would provide for those wildlife crossings. And then there was a um, concern about the presence of old growth forest. A review of the woodlands revealed that none of the woodlands have old growth forest characteristics. Uh, so again, this is a, a map showing what the uh, system is. So uh, in the middle of the property are two PSWs. So those lands would be protected. You can see a slight gray outline. There's a buffer around that. At the north of Grassy Brook Road is another PSW with a, um, a, um, a buffer area. And then the lands along the Welland River are environmental protection due to the uh, uh, wetland features along the river and the plant uh, and again there's a buffer between the proposed res residential area and that uh, area and then there are two creeks which cross the property um, and those 
creeks and the floodplain are, are uh, designated as environmental protection. So we are providing through this secondary plan protection for those <coughs> natural heritage features and there are policies in our official plan uh, for those uh, features. The, um, as well, there were some concerns regarding the, uh, the arc that was established uh, to uh, set a minimum distance separation uh, from SciTech. Uh, it's a phosphine uh, production facility. Um, the property had been inspected by a 1.09 kilometer radius from the intersection of Garner Road and Chippewa Creek Road. Um, over the last year, the uh, developer successfully negotiated with uh, SciTech the reduction of that uh, two or that uh, 9.0 kilometer arc to a two kilometer arc. I know that sounds like it's an increase. It's actually a reduction because that two kilometers is actually measured from the phosphine facility itself rather than uh, the corner of Garner Road and Chippewa. So the starting point has moved farther away. It's freed up more land within the uh, uh, project for development. However, SciTech has asked for some conditions within 200 feet of that new two kilometer arc. They do not want any buildings other than detached dwellings, so basically single family dwellings and a height of no more than two and a half stories. I don't know if you saw a letter in your council, I circulated it just before council this evening from Jeff Wilker at Thompson Rogers, a law firm which represents SciTech. Uh, they also want to add that the, uh, those lots be large, larger size lots that can be accommodated um, in the, uh, the policies. Um, the two, they, uh, SciTech has also asked that the two kilometer arc extend over lands to the west outside of the plan area, plan area, which are owned by RAND, and RAND has agreed to that requirement. Um, and that uh, SciTech is also requesting a notice of any subdivision or condominium application as it comes along, and they also want clauses in the sales agreements warning about the proximity of heavy industry, and they also want notice of any further Planning Act applications. The um, Natural heritage, I also, um, it was provided in the detailed environmental impact study. Uh, we will require further EIS as we go through the zoning amendments and the draft plan approval. So we're basically setting out the policy at this point, but with each subdivision, so they de uh, design the uh, townhouses, the single family houses, etc. there will be specific environmental impact studies to show how there would be uh, no, no impact or how the impact would be mitigated. Um, there was an agreement that would be entered into between the city and RAND for the heritage restoration. I mentioned that compensation for non-significant features. Uh, the agreement would also detail the types of works and the timing relative to the removal of any natural features. And there would be performance measures that would be established. Uh, I mentioned the uh, SciTech, which is now Solway. Um, the comments of um, have previously uh, requested have been resolved. Um, although I did receive while we we're sitting here tonight uh, comments from uh, again Jeff Wilker at Thompson Rogers on behalf of SciTech. Uh, they are concerned that there is no text in the official plan uh, to govern uh, the two kilometer arc on the lands west of the plan area. Um, that may show up in a, in a later drawing, so I'll come back to that. Um, in reviewing the, uh, the policies, the residential land designation would pro provide for a density target of 53 people and jobs per hectare. That's the requirement under the growth plan and the region's policy plan. Uh, <coughs> there would be detached, semi-detached, street townhouses, block townhouses, and stack townhouses as uh, dwelling forms. And we estimate uh, between 1,100 and 1,400 dwelling units. Uh, the housing would then provide for a number of uh, housing types and sizes. Um, the apartment buildings would provide for mixed use, um, which is, uh, is, is encouraged and will provide for affordable housing as well. And so uses such as parkland and elementary schools have been identified on the plan. There is a proposed land use of mixed use. That would be uh, residential and 
um, service commercial or commercial lands, and that would provide approximate jobs for approximately 475 to 710 people, um, and um, up to 780 jobs overall in the area. Natural heritage, including PSWs and significant wildlife features, I mentioned, would be protected, and there are buffers. The lands are uh, for the SciTech arch would uh, would be included. There is a small area uh, which um, would not be usable for residential. Uh, the developer has identified that as parkland, but that would be over and above the 5% parkland dedication. It's not in the location that we would normally um, develop a park to service the area. Uh, the employment uses would include manufacturing, research facilities, laboratories, and offices. And then we have the hospital employment campus, which would accommodate the uh, South Niagara Hospital, and then it would also, in that vicinity around there, uh, support employment uses that are commercial and institutional in nature that would support the hospital. Uh, the secondary plan then provides an overall policy framework for the, uh, for the population, uh, provides location for uh, major engineering facilities, the sanitary systems, I showed that to you a minute ago, the Grassy Brook uh, pumping station, uh, and the highly lift pumping station. Um, the uh, location of residential densities is shown on Schedule A4, and then there's a road network that is shown on Schedule A4 as well. So this is Schedule 4, which shows you that land use designation. So basically, um, we have uh, in this light blue, that's our <coughs> medical campus. So basically, the hospital site is at the located at Bigger Road <coughs> in Montrose. That would recognize the uh, acres of 50 acres for the hospital. There are lands uh, across the street, which are currently tourist, commercial, and industrial. That would now become part of this medical precinct, as well as other lands that are owned by the Grassels, which would be part of that medical precinct. The red color are basically the mixed use uh, commercial residential development. The yellow color are the residential lands. <laughs> Uh, the darker blue are employment lands, and that's part of our employment corridor <coughs> identified in our official plan. They're protected lands by regional policy, so uh, we can't actually change them from uh, employment to something else. Uh, the medical hospital would be employment lands. So it shows basically the road system proposed, so reinstating Grassy Brook Road, which uh, we closed a few years ago as a private driveway into the golf course. There would be a new collector road system, uh, a, a single crossing coming across the, the railway tracks. That would replace the um, crossing that existed previously for Crowland Avenue, which uh, crossed the tracks at a very peculiar angle. Um, the dark green represents those natural heritage areas that would be protected. So those are the uh, official plan designations that would be put into place for this uh, secondary plan area. Um, the, um, so again, as I said, it sets out the policy framework. It provides 40% intensification in the built-up areas, 53 people and jobs per hectare. <coughs> it retains the employment lands, uh, and it would remove that special policy uh, area number 34, which re refers to the golf course and resort uses. The secondary plan would be implemented through zoning bylaws, in the future, as well as plans of subdivision condominium. Uh, we're proposing that in the interim between now and the uh, plans of subdivision or condominium, that the golf course lands would be zoned development holding. Uh, there would currently be open space, so the development holding would reserve those lands for future residential uses. Uh, the improvements to the road network would uh, follow existing infrastructure and would require an environmental assessment process. Um, so we concluded that this application does comply with the provincial policy statement, <coughs> uh, would meet the 40% intensification target and the Greenfields target identified by the provincial growth plan. It complies with the regional policy plan um, and uh, provides for higher residential densities in the urban areas. So the recommendation is that council adopt the Grand Niagara Secondary Plan uh, as it's consistent with the Provincial Policy Statement, Provincial Growth Plan, and the Regional Official Plan. There's a two-kilometer arc 
um, which would be extended outside of the plan area and the zoning of the golf course would be changed to development holding and the, it says the amendment be forwarded to uh, Niagara Region. We did receive a message from the region today that this uh, secondary plan <coughs> would be exempt from regional approval. So council's decision would be uh, the final decision. Um, this, uh, so we'll go, go back to this. Um, so uh, I didn't point out while we're on the map, uh, the two kilometer arc. So this is where the two kilometer arc would be, this is where the one kilometer arc used to be. So you can see that a great deal of land was freed up for <coughs> development. These are the lands that would be um, for single detached dwellings um, on large lots. Uh, this is the area where no development would be permitted in this white triangle, and they've identified a neighborhood park. Of course, it's not central to any of the residential, so we're saying that would be beyond uh, our needs. You can see the arc extends across these lands and would go just a little past Morris Road. And again, the developer has agreed to that arc, which would <coughs> limit any kind of development between the arc and SciTech facility uh, itself. Um, so as I said, I didn't point that out when the map was up there, but we are recommending support of the uh, secondary plan. Um, there is a uh, secondary plan included in your agenda under bylaws. Um, so if council feels that they're ready to adopt the official plan amendment for the secondary plan, that could be done tonight. There are a couple of minor word modifications <coughs> that we would need to work out with SciTech. So we would be looking to do that over the next uh, 15 days so that we could incorporate that and, um, and, uh, and avoid any objection from SciTech. Thank you, Mr. Ulovich. Do we have any questions of council for Mr. Hurlovich? Councillor Thompson, Councillor Morocco. Yes, um, the uh, SciTech circle, um, it just affects that one little piece at the one section? That's correct. Yeah. Um, what uh, legitimate uh, cause do they have? for drawing a circle and having this impact on every development that comes to the city. Uh, they refer to provincial policy statements that says industry should be separated from sensitive uses and residential uses are considered sensitive. Uh, well, if they, they're concerned about it, why did, buy the property and protect yourself. You know that they get grants from the government, millions of dollars, uh, and they have uh, toxic chemicals that they make out there. Uh, why <coughs> don't they put some of those millions of dollars to uh, protect uh, the people rather than drawing a two, two kilometer circle? Yes. Why, who else has to put up with this? Where else is this done? And what authority do they have? I think we should really do a, a thorough investigation into the legality of this and to d determine what we can do uh, to make it smaller, make them buy the land that they're responsible for and uh, not interfere with uh, a lot of the developments that uh, there's a couple on McLeod Road that are uh, 50 acres and a third of them is, is cut out by this circle. Uh, can we uh, have the uh, staff research this and report back to us what, uh, what options we have with respect to this circle and how we can improve the situation for the land people are paying taxes on and ownership and uh, they can't do anything with their property. So I, I'd like to have a report back on uh, what we can do about it. I think SciTech has made it fairly clear, uh, speaking to Councillor Thompson to the mayor, uh, that they would litigate this. Um, the 
Um, we can they, litigate too. Yeah, that's right. Um, and if council does decide in one of these cases to decline to accede to Cytex request, then we would have a forum in which these matters could be settled. Um, they believe, uh, and they uh, pretty pretty strong council. Uh, they believe that they have the right to do this through the planning process, and they have been arguing that they have the right to do this for what, 25 years now. Um, the um, way, if we did, if the city really did want to get a definitive answer, we could the, the council could decide not to accede to their request for the condition and the site tech take well, it to the. Before to, we do to that, the I'd like yeah. to have. Uh, some research. Oh, and where else it's done? Oh, it's uh, it's done elsewhere. Uh, one of the most famous was the the uh, the um, oh, the Christie Nuclear plant. The Christie the Christie plant that was down by the in Etobicoke, down by the water. Mm -hmm. Every condo and it had it had one of those circles of influence on it. And every condo that was built along there had to negotiate with Christie until Christie finally closed the plant. But every single one, when Etobicoke, all those hotels that were ripped down and the condos went up, every one of those was a negotiation with Christie. Well, I, I'd, I'd like to know uh, some more information. If it's an impossibility, tell us that and we can stop talking about it. But uh, every time we have a development here, we have to deal. And they keep changing their two kilometer uh, circle uh, that affects a lot of people who are paying taxes on their property and uh, are upset about this. So. I can tell you I've had discussions with the plant and uh, Mr. Baldessera as well about exactly this. And there are a number of places, including nuclear plants, where they don't have a two kilometer uh, radius of protection. And I gave the same message. If you feel that that's a dangerous area, then buy it. Don't sanitize uh, or neutralize other areas of investment because you're concerned that you might be causing a problem. If you're going to cause a problem, then you should be able to buy it, you know, fair market value. So I'm, I'm with you. So I think right now, I know Mr. Baldessera has been able to negotiate with uh, this group. Uh, well, the, it doesn't really affect Not now so much because he's negotiated the two rings, but he still has a little corner there that I'm sure he'd love to be able to put in play in some way, but that might be a discussion for another day, I think. I'm not suggesting legal uh, confrontation at yeah. this time. Um, I'm just suggesting that we have information where it's done what legality they have, and a report back. So if we decide to do something at some point, at least we know there's a chance of doing something, or if we can work with them to uh, squeeze it down or use some of the grant money they get to protect uh, people uh, outside their area. <coughs> anyway. Um, <coughs> Good question. Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have a report back. So move. Okay. Uh, Councillor Morocco? I'm pretty much on the same path as uh, Councillor Thompson, so your worship, uh, just through you to Alex. Um, the new letter that you did receive from um, SciTech, is there anything that they're against or opposing or they're approving? I'm sorry, I just wanted to get clarification on, on the letter you just received yeah. this afternoon. Um, looking for <coughs> um, Yes, so to your worship to the alderman. So the, the first one would be to add to policy 2.3.1.1 at the end of the first sentence, we would add this, the four words on larger sized lots. So that would address their first concern. And then their second concern is uh, the blue arc that uh, extends on up of the, out of the secondary plan. So this part of the arc it's, uh, these are actually uh, rural agricultural <coughs> lands. Uh, they're outside of our urban boundary. And so they, uh, they would like to see some wording associated with that arc outside. So we have the arc within the secondary plan. There are policies that basically say no residential development, large lots, no buildings higher than this. And they would like some policies um, or a policy that basically says this arc is in place and that any development planning act applications etc would um, be circulated to them so that would be a new policy that we would have to insert into the document as so, i say that came while i was sitting here at council okay so i i like the fact that uh, they're identifying there's an area that they don't feel that they want to have residents 
as, as Councillor Thompson pointed out, they're dealing with poisonous chemicals. And so I guess one of two things, we don't allow people to build there, or the option, as you suggest, is get them to buy it. Uh, and that's probably the better of the two, is just to get them to buy the land, and then all of the onus is taken off of ourselves. Because as I sit here thinking, my God, why do I now want to give approval to build in an area that these people are telling me they have poisonous chemicals? So I, I think that we want to make sure that we're very clear on this whole arc. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm looking to give approval or we're going to, how are we going to deal with this? Are we giving approval? Councillor Thompson, I'm not sure where you were going. Are you going to add that into this uh, tonight? Yeah, I just want to, just more information to where we stand legally and what, if we have a chance to offer the settings. Uh, okay, I, I'll support that. Uh, another thing that I'm not really, did you say, so if you, uh, to your worship to Alec again, that green spot here that says uh, NP, did you say that was going to be designated park? Yes. Okay, I do not support that at all because it's within the arc. I would never want to have children um, moved in, in within that arcing area there. I think there's beautiful green space that maybe can incorporate some park into, this, uh, into the green space if that's an option. Um, I, I just would not ever support um, the playground in an arc area, and I, I hope my colleagues would support that as well. So if we could just maybe address that. Okay, any other questions or comments of council? Okay. Members of the public are advised that failure to make an oral or written submission at this public meeting will result in the local planning appeal tribunal dismissing any referral it receives if the party has not made an oral or written submission at the public meeting. Council will now hear from anyone who wishes to speak to the proposed official plan amendment. So anyone that would like to speak to it, please come forward. Just state <coughs> your name and your address, please. Yes, I'm John Bacher. I live at 134 Church Street in St. Catharines. At the um, outset, so I'm uh, uh, not accused of someone that comes from a oppositional uh, mentality. I would like to um, thank uh, the uh, developer and the uh, planning consultants and the ecological consultants for one significant improvement um, between the last public meeting and this one. There was a, a block that is now part of the uh, green area south of uh, Grassy Brook Road that earlier was suggested for development and although it was not a significant forest, it would have forced the uh, forest to be cut to get access to that area from Grassy Brook Road. So that was an uh, improvement that I'm uh, uh, grateful for. It was not addressed in planning director's report, so I wanted to draw it to your attention. There are, in my view, uh, however, uh, uh, one area of concern which I hope will be um, improved. The um, background reports that you have, it identifies uh, five areas that are called significant forests. This designation was, I believe, established by the Niagara region in 2006 when they mapped all these, what are called environmental conservation areas. And in order to have development on them, you have to show through an environmental impact study that there is no loss of uh, ecological function. Now, there is an endangered species in this area that requires large blocks of forest habitat and it appears that these five blocks of forests are about 15 acres in size. That's quite small in the 815 acre development. The uh, 
wood thrush is just the most endangered of a number of forest interior birds that require large blocks of forest habitat. And I know when we had discussions with the uh, Savanta, well, they said all these forests are fragmented, doesn't matter, but the wood thrush is there. That's a bird that, you know, depends on intact forests and by cutting it up, you're going to increase the risk that it will just leave this part of Niagara Falls. Now, apart from the fragmentation of the general area, the other argument that has been used is the presence of ash in these forests. Now, I've been in these forests and ash is there, but there are a lot of other species there. There are black cherry, there are sugar maple, there are a number of species of oak. And in the uh, uh, background material that you have, it talks about the understory, the shrubs being uh, uh, bushes, um, including the uh, invasive buckthorn, but also native bushes like raspberry and um, a gray dogwood. But what it doesn't point out that there's also bushes of young trees, maples and oaks. And these trees will persist if the ash die off happens. Now, Regarding to the issue of ash die-off and why it should not be used to ignore the uh, importance of these five forests uh, today, or I sent a letter to Niagara Falls City Council from the Ministry of Natural Resources that deals with ash die-off problem in thundering waters. The letter was dated December 11th, 2017. It was not part of the council package when you had your public meeting on Thundering Waters. It was not referenced in the staff Mr. report. Mr. Bacher, we're not dealing with Thundering Waters tonight. Please just keep I know, this but point. I'm going to address the issue that they point to the technical science. In the letter, they point out that the potential future decline in ash canopy may change the dominant canopy species, but not necessarily the functional value of the woodland. This is the same situation at Thundering Waters as here. Same ecological consulting firm, Savanta, has used the problem of ash die-off as justification to deny that the area has significance as an ecological <clears throat> conservation area. They're essentially saying the regional plan is wrong. You can deforest the area because it's no longer significant. The other issue I'd like to bring to attention, I've read the uh, by law, the uh, definition of uh, environmental protection areas, I think, is too permissive according to the, uh, both the Niagara Regional Official Plan and the city's official plan. It talks about development in these areas if it's guided by an environmental impact study. This is my view identical to the lesser protected environmental conservation area and that part of the bylaw should be changed. The idea of EP area, EPA areas is that there should be no development period. Most of these areas tend to be provincially significant wetlands where no site alteration is permitted. That's my presentation. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else that wishes to address council on this matter? 
Reminder too, it's a 10 minute limit. If you could just state your name and your address, please. Hi, my name's Don Sorley. My address is 8126 Fatima Court. <coughs> it's Spirit of Full, <coughs> excuse me, I wasn't planning on speaking. Spirit of Full Transparency, I'm also the country controller for SciTech Canada. So um, we are in support of this presentation as it's gone today uh, to highlight the, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, park in the part of the boundary that is now within the two kilometer arc. We had hoped that that would become part of the stormwater management system or something, not actually a park for uh, less for, for better um, clarification. Um, we have worked with Frank uh, quite amiably. Uh, we feel we are quite amiable to deal with and will continue to be. Uh, we have bought land around us as it comes to us and we are no it's for sale. We will always address that fact again in the future. We have set the precedent, we have bought land around us. Um, we feel we're a good corporate citizen. We, uh, we did make our major expansion, $200 million, that opened up in 2014. About 40 very high paying, old style industrial jobs where uh, the average pay is in excess of $80,000 a year. So these are darn good jobs we have at this site. Moving forward, we want to still work amiably with the city. I can tell you in our strategic plans, there's more major capital coming to our site. One of those key selling points we have is our buffer zone. And we feel we work hard with the city to maintain the buffer zone. We keep in touch with the fire department as to the hazards we have at that site. We are aware of the hazards. We are also quite um, proud of our safety record and our environmental record given the hazards we deal with out there. Uh, but again, we are in uh, general favor with the direction that this is taken, and uh, that's it for me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do we have anyone else who would like to address council? Yeah, come step forward, Gene, if you would like. <coughs> Jean Grandoni, Rural Road Number One, Garner Road, Niagara Falls. Um, with regard to what John was saying, you do have other maps that could be put up there to help both the council and John that show the areas to be removed. Are I they not? The, they're not part of the PowerPoint. I don't have them in my pocket. Well, they're in the agenda package for the information of council. If you haven't looked at them, you should take a look at them. <coughs> um, I feel there should be more, small point maybe, but for the wildlife it's not. There should be more uh, crossings at bigger road to allow wildlife to move off that secondary plant site further south. I still maintain there should be watershed planning and hydrogeological. And I see I'm not off base because the region is now looking to put watershed planning into their new official plan. Long overdue. And I have a question for the solicitor through you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. um, I see at the last minute here the region is exempting themselves from approving the secondary plan and under what legislation are they allowed to do that? Planning Act of Ontario. And that's it. It's interesting that this is, is I believe Mr. Hurlbert said he just got that message. Plus he just got a message from SciTech. This is pretty, speedy sloppy business if you ask me <clears throat> things should be done giving the public and the council the time to assess what's going on and I don't see that happening around here that's my comments okay. thank you is there anyone else that wishes to address council Okay, <clears throat> seeing none, are there any final questions from council regarding the application? 
Uh, yeah, Councilor Bierangelo. Yeah, thanks, Your Worship. I just have to declare it now. <coughs> okay, uh, conflict uh, noted, Mr. Clerk. Council and the public are reminded that the purpose of tonight's public meeting is to consider the adoption of an official plan amendment. The public meeting with respect to the official plan amendment 118 is now concluded. Does a member of council wish to make a motion regarding the official plan amendment? Just one at a time, please. Yeah, usually this council's got lots to say. <coughs> so we're looking for some direction there. If you look on the uh, report, there are three recommendations. The first one is the two kilometer SciTech arc being extended west outside the plan area across lands owned by Rand Investments. Secondly, the zoning of the golf course being changed to a DH, development holding zone. And the third one, which is no longer necessary, the amendment being forwarded to Niagara Region for approval. So the third one's not necessary, is that right, Mr. Herlovich? That's correct. As of today's letter. So there are two recommendations regarding the ARC and regarding the development holding uh, zone. Uh, the ARC, well, the two kilometer SciTech ARC is being ex extended west, so it changes. So it, it, as you can see, there's two dotted lines so it goes further to the left, further west to the blue area. Originally it was that gray white dotted one and now it goes further left to the blue. So it includes that area that Mr. Herlovich said will be larger lots. Yes, Mr. Mar uh, Councilor Morocco. Uh, Uh, Mr. Illich, could you answer that question, please? Yes, that would stay. That's environmental protection, and notwithstanding the fact that Dr. Bacher said the policies weren't that strong, that this environmental protection is a no development zone. <clears throat> uh, they do have to do environmental impact studies for any of the yellow lands adjacent to the green, <coughs> but the green would be staying. And he did say that uh, the gentleman that did come from SciTech, I'm sorry. Um, Mr. Sorley. Sorry, Mr. Sorley. Um, that that wasn't necessarily outlined to be a park, as per se, for right. children to play. It was looked at as more of a storm water. Storm water. Yeah. So that definitely has to has to be moved out of there. Uh, uh, I would never support that. So, um, but I think there's still a question that uh, Councillor Thompson has asked about still about this other arc that. You know, it's not addressed. I don't know. I think we're sitting here with, on our hands because, like, we're just not sure about this arc. I'm not feeling comfortable about it. I think um, what Councillor Thompson's asking to do to, to not impede what we're doing tonight is that we come back and have a look at what's legal regarding the arcs, what's being done elsewhere, uh, you know, and also that SciTech is, in fact, purchasing the land. Well, it's nice. Yeah, because, first of all, let's make sure. We want to make sure we're working with them because they're working hard to work with us. Right. They're creating jobs, good-paying jobs, right. and we sure as hell don't want to lose that industry because we are not going to work with them and make sure that we build and not build within the arc. So I'm just having a problem with the whole building Okay, Council, we're... Uh, Sorry, Your Worship. Yes. So, you know, you were reading the, the conditions of the report. So, for, since the time the report was written, there were the two other amendments that SciTech was looking for. So, the amendment to the policy that would add on larger lots and a policy that would address the uh, arc uh, outside of the secondary plan area but on Rand land. So, we you would direct staff to bring those or to amend the um, policy for those two uh, considerations. Okay, so those would be recommendations <coughs> three and four? Yes. Okay. <coughs> Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I'll move the uh, recommendation. I, I still would like to have more information on the art, but uh, I, I don't, I think this plan uh, has been through all of the uh, scrutiny and uh, uh, motion for approval. Okay, Councilor Rocco. Um, I'll only support that if they make sure that that park is not in that area, that it's moved to the other end. Well, we'll make that part of the provision, right? 
that that uh, extreme west uh, Where they park the, area. It's indicated that it's a park that it could be. I just I just don't want a children's park in that arc area. Yeah. Okay. Move it. Move it to the whatever it is. West. You understand that, Councilor Thompson? Right. So right. right there. That yeah, might. No, no, I know what yeah. you're talking about. That's too, that doesn't work. You know, I don't have a problem if you want to make that part of the. Okay. Thank you. If you if you would accept that as an amendment. Yeah. Okay. So friendly amendment, Councilor. Uh, so the the motion, all four recommendations. There really should be one in four of us voting on this. Yeah. Well, Councilor Peter Angel's got a conflict. I don't know what happened to Councilor Curio. His computer's still there. Yeah, but we've got quorum. So uh, so the four recommendations, <coughs> but with the fifth proviso, Councilor Morocco, that that uh, far west area inside the two kilometer arc not be a park. All right, that the park can get there. There's a park and it has to come way up. Yeah, it has to come inside the arc, or outside the arc, rather. Yes. Okay. By M3 or somewhere in there, just to kind of give you an idea. Okay, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> and I'll vote in favor and it passes. Okay, thank you. With one conflict noted, Councilor Peter Angelo. Move the balance of the agenda. <laughs> oh, I'd like to. This is when I wish we had a, uh, a consent list. Yeah. Yeah. Point of order, you yes. worship? Yes, Councilor uh, uh, Creator. Sorry. With your permission and counsel, I'd like to move one item up, 8.8. 8.8, that's the one that deals with Culp Street, Water Main, and Sanitary Sewers. Okay. It's a positive report. There's just one, one section in there that talks about the sidewalks. And the reason I'm asking if we could move it up is because some of the residents have been here since probably 6.30. Uh, 6.35, <laughs> waiting, so. I'm we, sorry Councilor Crater told you to come at that time. It's okay, it's all right. <laughs> He's gonna buy you dinner later. This I'll second the motion. Okay, so we're gonna motion by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Thompson to amend the agenda to bring item 8.8 .8 forward. Yes, all please. those in favor? Okay, thank they, you. So they, we're going to deal with like that. like to speak on it, that's why. All right, well, go thank right you. ahead. So this one is a legal matter. Um, Mr. Beeman, did you have uh, any comment on this? Or, uh, oh, it's municipal works. Is that eight point, which one? Eight point, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Mr. Holman, I'm sorry, I had the wrong one. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor. Um, so we moved ahead with the Culp Street project. We tendered it. Uh, the numbers have come in uh, below budget. So we've awarded the contract to Elfidone Construction. There was one item that came up through our public uh, engagement process, and that has to do with proposed sidewalk on the south side of Culp Street. And uh, we're looking for our council's direction. Uh, we've done some field investigations. Um, and. Uh, although there are a number of residents that don't feel that the sidewalk is necessary, we have correspondence from the school that would like to see it incorporated into the work. But when we designed the uh, project, we designed it uh, so that it could be added at some point in the future if we decided not to install it at this point. Um, however, it has been tendered uh, with the sidewalk included. So we're looking for council's direction as to whether or not we want to build it as part of this project. Okay, we're uh, dealing with item 8.8. Uh, .8. We moved it forward, the Culp Street Water Main Sanitary. And uh, there, I'm sorry, Mr. Holman, could you just sum up, now they just came back, I'm sorry, just can you just really quickly. Oh yes, um, so we're looking for council's direction as to whether or not the section of sidewalk on the south side of Culp Street is to be included as part of this construction project. Uh, or whether or not uh, we add it at some point in the future, or not at all. Uh, Culp Street, as you know, is the north boundary of uh, uh, AG Bridge Park. I and don't there's see the uh, Princess Park coming school. back. I'll still move uh, be included. Included? Okay. Okay, do, do we? Okay, uh, Councillor Crater, I'm sorry, do we have people that want to speak to this? Yes, that's why, I'm, that's why I moved it forward. Okay. Like to speak on, give their point of view. They're the residents. Yep. Okay. Uh, so, folks, did you want to uh, come forward and? Uh, Should we have a motion? 
Uh, well, we've got a motion right now by Councilor Thompson to approve it. No, the, yeah. the whole thing with the sidewalk. Yeah. Okay, so if you want to state your name and your address, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilors. My name is Joe Bartoni. I live at 6705 Culp Street. Um, I was reading over the information I got. The school's been there over 30 years, I'm assuming. Yeah, I don't know. It's a long okay. time. Okay. And there's never been a sidewalk on that side. I'm trying to save the city some money. On that side, it would be a, a sidewalk going from one corner to the school. Around the corner on Corwin, there would be no sidewalk. So the kids would have to stay on well, east side of Corwin, cross the street to get to that new sidewalk. They would have to go through two sections of the uh, parking lot. So you would need two crossing guards there. They would cross over a driveway, gentleman standing right here, that would take up three of his parking spaces. Before we put a sidewalk on that side, we need to get the repairs done on the sidewalk on the north side. That's all I got to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Your Honor, Councilman, Council people. <laughs> um, Yes, I agree. Like I'm saying what he said, uh, the safety factor here. <clears throat> that park at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 3 to 3.30 in the afternoon, there's about 130 cars going there. The kids don't walk to school anymore. The parents drive them. On that street, where the sidewalk, existing sidewalk now, there's maybe eight, seven, eight, maybe nine kids walk on that a day. Every morning and night, maybe. You have a crossing guard up here now. What the crossing guard is doing, he's bringing them across to that sidewalk. Now they're safe, they're walking all the way down that sidewalk to Corwin. You turn around and you make them put that sidewalk in, what you're doing there is, those kids are gonna be passing the entrance, two entrance to the park, okay? Now, you want something to happen, it's gonna happen there unless you've got crossing guards because people are not safest drivers anymore. So you have two of them there, then they walk up to the other end, which is no sidewalks there anyhow. It's a dead end, so they gotta cross the street. It's cross it on this side, across this side. So that's, it's a safety feature. Plus, I'm losing two driveways. Okay, i am lost one driveway completely. It's a short one, but I'm losing it. <clears throat> Plus, I'm probably lose two parking spots on the other one because of the way it's taking it up. They're raising the street, <clears throat> they're raising the street up, and nobody, I'm supposed to have a meeting on Friday with the engineer. They're raising the street up maybe four to five inches, maybe more. Now what they're doing is, they have to rip out all my driveways, curbs, and everything else. I'm, all, I'm willing to work with that, as long as I'm put back together and right. The only thing I'm asking is, we really appreciate if you put the sidewalk, leave, the, leave that sidewalk out, put it on the other side where there's one there already, fix that one up, it's disgusting that one. Because they had all the construction there, they broke it all up, and the city gets uh, paid, they hold back money for that. This house is there about seven or eight years old, right across the street from there. The sidewalk's been broke ever since, it's never been fixed. And not one spot, a few spots. So just fix that one up. Make it really presentable. And another thing too is, who's gonna snow plow the snow in the winter? Nobody. Because you know that the city doesn't always come in time to plow the, the sidewalks. So that, they're not gonna be snow plowing those sidewalks. That kids aren't gonna be able to walk them. At least on the other side, the people are cleaning the sidewalks themselves. So now they got to walk on. That's all I can say, thank you. Thank you. Uh, could we get a couple answers, Mr. Holman? So, uh, two questions. One is, we do plow the sidewalks if it's a school. Is that right? Yes, it would be added to the list. It would be added to the list. Just for clarity, that if there was a sidewalk, it would be plowed. Because school sidewalks, we do plow. It's a priority. Uh, last one would be work. No, uh, the sidewalk, that would be leading up to the school. Is that right, uh, Mr. Holman? Yeah. The one on the other side was not plowed, though. Yeah, across the street, right. But oh, wow. the, 
That's leading to the school. Right. Uh, the other question is, the people who did the development of those homes where the Boys and Girls Club used to be, is that the sidewalk you're talking about? Yeah. So if they broke the sidewalk during uh, construction, do we hold back so that we can get them to repair the sidewalks that they damaged? Or what's our policy on that? Yeah, so the, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, they were developed by Severance, right? That was the old Boys and Girls Club. Right. They were severed off into a number of lots. Uh, so each builder would have uh, had to submit a deposit. Uh, I believe there was a decision back in 2004 by City Council to install the sidewalk on the north side. So that would have been uh, constructed um, in some cases in advance of the uh, construction of Which? the homes. And so, uh, just come to the mic if so you we, like. We have the we have the ability to. Um, Go back and and use those deposits to uh, to fix the sidewalk, but given the condition of the road, those the driveway entrances are very steep there, so we have to we have to move the sidewalk oh. anyways. Oh. So as part of this uh, new design, we have to raise the road to improve the driveway ramps on the one side. There is an impact uh, on the properties on the <coughs> side, and. That's why the design for the sidewalk would be a curved face design, so that right. it would be uh, trying to contain any surface drainage that might be collected on the road, but on the road system, and not spill off into the adjacent property. Okay, thank you for that. Sorry, Mr. Yeah. Um, so are you saying that the north side sidewalks are going to be all taken care of? <clears throat> Yeah, Mr. Mayor, as part of this project, my understanding is that we're going to be uh, we have to we have to adjust the height of them anyways. So some of them are cracked, some of them have some uh, uh, deficiencies that need to be addressed. Okay, so you're saying that they will be taken yes. care of? Yes. Because I have some in front of my house, and when we built um, before any of the houses were built, I was surprised that I was told by the developer that the sidewalks needed to be done first before a foundation was put in. So if you look back at all the, the sidewalks that were built, that's what was told to us. All of them were broken because of the construction. So I lose my deposit. No, so what happens was there was a development agreement for the development of that site. And the and sidewalks that, went in first. That included, that included the installation of the sidewalk on the north side. It was already installed. Right. So the developer installed it. But as oh. each lot, e as each builder built on those lots, they would have had to give a deposit to make sure that there was no damage to that infrastructure. Okay, but the sidewalks were built first before any of the houses went in. They should have, yeah. honestly, to You're, save a couple yes, of dollars. Right. No, 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 no. This, for the city to save a couple of dollars, they should have waited for the construction. What do you mean? They got to redo the work now. That doesn't make sense. Well, we're going to have to redo it because of the grade now as it is yeah. anyway, right? Because okay. the road. Okay. So the north side of the sidewalks will be done. Yes. What about what about all these people that just put in concrete driveways? What's going to happen to their driveways? I'm there's, not sure. there's a few of them in there putting beautiful driveways now. Now you're going to lower it down or do whatever you're going to do. What's going to happen to their driveway? I don't. Do we know the answer to that, Mr. Schultz? Mr. Mayor, is the normal process, and the, this might have been discussed at the PIC, I apologize for not being there, but we'll, we'll be replacing that infrastructure between the property lines. So if you had an asphalt apron into your driveway or you had a concrete one, it would be replaced like for like. Well, yeah, it's not affecting me. I'm just bringing that up. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Okay, so does that address the questions on Culp Street? Okay, so... Mm -hmm. um, Want to make, we're going to make a motion, yes, uh, Councilor? Well, it, it's pretty clear, Your Worship, that if you don't want to have a sidewalk. On the south side. On that side. And yeah. the other side needs to be repaired. Let's repair the other side and let's forget about the sidewalk on the other side. As long as we've made sure that uh, the children's safety is number one. And everybody's shaking their head that that's the most concerning that it is. <coughs> so I uh, would move the... Well, maybe oh, Councilor Grader make the motion. You brought it forward. Uh, you want to make Sorry. the motion? You make the motion. I'll second. Sure, sure. Oh, okay. So I'm your worship. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but his was the sidewalks. His was to do the sidewalks. Oh. So is that, uh, that part of the report? 
uh, 8.8? 8.8? Yeah, 8.8, 28.18.10, um, the, for the sidewalk. <coughs> so I'm asking for the sidewalks not to go in on that side. And repair the other one. Yeah. And okay. repair the other side, that's it. That's my motion, thank you. Okay, and are you seconding that, Council Morocco? Yes. Yep, okay. So if there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you. So where are we now? 8.1, Niagara Compliance, Niagara Compliance Audit Committee for Municipal Elections. There's five recommendations. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Uh, 8.2. 8 .2 8 <coughs> okay, 8.2, 8.3, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Thank you. Yes, uh, 8.4. Uh, okay. Um, yes. Um, checks 414771, I'm sorry, I didn't find them in it earlier. Um, I have conflict <coughs> on both their reimbursements for FCM. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Crater, yes. Yeah, uh, for the clerk, uh, I had those three checks that I didn't have the account numbers, and they are 414-538-415-320, and 415-865. Thanks. Okay, and for myself as well, I've got my numbers here. Uh, two checks, Mr. Clerk, 414-959 and 416-035. Okay, so we are moving, is it 8.4 and 8.5? Is that what we're uh, moving right now? 8.4. Okay, 8.4, okay. All right, so that was moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Thank you, so that's approved. 8.5, schedule of fees for services for 2018. As presented, looking for a motion. Uh, moved by Councilor Cario. Second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? Thank you, it's approved. Uh, item 8.6, low income seniors water and property tax rebate. Moved by Councilor Morocco. Seconded by Councilor Thompson. All those in favor? Thank you, it's unanimous. 8.6, we already did, or 8.8 .8 rather, we just did. I'm sorry, 8.7, OLG uh, city amendment. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Cario. All those in favor? That's approved. That's for the overhead agreement. Yeah, I was just going to say that the new government should send our resolution through regarding the OLG. <coughs> I think they're already on it. Oh, yeah. 8.8, .8, we've already approved. 8.9, .9, emergency third avenue sewer replacement for Jepson and McRae. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Morocco. All those in favor? And that's approved unanimous, thank you. 8.10, <coughs> excuse me, request for removal of part lot controls. Mo moved by Councilor Thompson, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved, thank you. 8.11, deeming bylaw application on Stanley Avenue. Moved by Councilor Peter Angelo, second by Councilor Cario. All those in favor? It's approved, thank you. 812, proposed plan of condominium. Um, we've got, let me just call it up here. We've got four recommendations. Move the recommendation, motion. Okay. Second. Moved by Councillor Peter Angelo and seconded by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. Uh, 813. So moved. GNBA Ladies Auxiliary Concession Agreement, moved by Councillor Crater, second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. 814, recognition of Stanford Township. So moved, that's great. Yep, moved by Councillor Crater, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved unanimously. Uh, item 815, Dyson Avenue Heavy Vehicle Restriction. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Thank you, that's approved. Now on to communications and comments of the city clerk. 9 1 and 9 2. 9 1 and 9 2. Okay, Clifton Hill BIA and Fallsview BIA requesting approval of the 2018 budgets. 
Uh, moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. 9.3, Niagara Regional Council resolution respecting taxpayer affordability guidance requesting local area municipalities develop affordability guidelines. I'm sorry, which one, Councillor? Yeah, we did them both in one uh, one motion. I'm sorry, uh, yes, Councillor Crater? Uh, yes, uh, 9.3. What is it that you're telling us we're supposed to do when they can't do it themselves? <laughs> no, I'm not I'm being sincere. I, mean, <coughs> I, I am. They got huge problems. They spend money like water, they overspend, and then they're going to tell us. Yeah. Like, I mean, you're there. Why are they sending it to us? They're telling us. Is it mandated to? I think no. I just think this. we've got counselor. Um, uh, we've got counselor. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's really great. Um, yeah. Sorry. No, I, that was unfair. I think we should send it back. Tell them to take care of their own house, and we'll take care of ours. I think just by receiving it, I think they're going to realize there'll be no action. Yeah. Well, that seems too kind, but okay. Uh, you know what I want to say. All right. Just be kind, please. Right. Receive and file, Councillor Crater. Yeah. Second by Councillor Iannone. All those in favor? That's approved. Thank you. 9.4 Niagara Falls Community Health Center requesting approval of 90-minute free parking. The recommendation is to refer to staff for a report to uh, Mr. Dren. Yeah, I'll move the recommendation. Yeah, move it. Yeah. Like move it or refer move it. The recommendation. Well, we need to maybe get a comment on uh, from Mr. Dren on who's paying for it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, this, uh, this business has requested free parking on street, similar because they moved off of uh, Queen Street mm -hmm. and they moved over to this area. There is free parking available in the lot behind them. So there is, there's park, parking already free. And the Queen Street group are paying for that free parking. And um, so, uh, you know, I, I would suggest that we, that we uh, perhaps say that if you're willing to pay for it, we'll put free parking on there, similar to what we did for uh, the Queen Street, Street group. <coughs> but he does have free parking available, yeah. so that's the difference. That's so so what, what uh, I guess Mr. Dren. Right. 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 Okay, so you move the recommendation to refer to staff, you second it, okay. All those in favor? Okay, so approved. 9.5. 9.5 to 9.9. Okay. okay, so I'll read them really quick. <coughs> Nine point, excuse me, <coughs> five. Wellington County surrounding municipalities request council support to appeal to the MPAC regarding assessment of aggregate properties. 9.6, Niagara Health System uh, C Care Clinic, World Hepatitis Day in Niagara Falls be July 27th. 9.7, Taps Brewing Company requesting relief of the city's noise bylaw for a fundraiser July the 13th and from five p.m. until midnight. Uh, 9.8, Niagara Regional Housing requesting that quarterly reports be received for information. Those are the ones. And I'm sorry, and Chippewa Volunteer Firefighter, 9.9, .9, requesting relief of the city's noise bylaw, waiver of fees for road closure, permits licensing, and declare the event of municipal significance to assist with their liquor license through the AGCO. Okay, so we'll move all those in block. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thank you. Okay, 910 to 915. Uh, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, seconded by Councillor Cario. Uh, did you want to comment? I just want to point out that 913 is just a duplicate, so we can strike that. It's just a repeat of 912. Okay, so 910 is the report on the state of the aggregate resources. 911, report on development applications monitoring. 912 is report on climate change framework. Uh, 914 is Niagara Region report on the new regional official plan growth management program. And 915 is the Niagara Region report on the waterfront investment program funding recommendations. So we'll call that vote. All those in favor? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> That's approved. 916, the town of Pelham. Uh, number one, have a resolution to the province requesting a municipal audit and subsequent reply from Minister Morrow, Ombudsman investigation report and local transit project uh, as well. So I think uh, they're looking. 
Well, I, I'm not really sure if you just want to receive it. <laughs> okay, moved by Councillor Thompson to receive. <coughs> Seconded by Councillor Morocco that we receive. All those in favor? I'm not really sure. They send it to everybody and their, and their brother. 917, Communication Bill C-36, Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act. Public request for council's consideration. Uh, Mr. Matson, did you uh, have any comment on uh, that one? I see this one came from you. About, I don't know if this is gonna be a, another receive. People coming to us, telling us not to legalize prostitution in Canada. Well, not to put you back on the spot, Mayor, but this out, this request did come through from your office down to us, so it's just listed for council's consideration. Oh, thanks for that, Bill. Well, that was great. See how that works? I'm looking for a motion to receive and file. Motion by Councillor Thompson to receive and file. Second by Councillor Morocco. All those in favor? I'll vote for that one, too. Yeah, that was a good one. You got me. That was good, Bill. That was good. It'll be very difficult next meeting for you, mister. <laughs> 9.18, Arif Morani Fundraising Group. They're requesting a few things from us, folks. Their barbecue is going to be coming up on Sunday, August the 26th at Queenston Heights. They're asking for us to purchase some tables, um, or some seats, rather, uh, to help maybe wear aprons and help flip the burgers uh, at this fundraiser. Yeah, I say support because we've done that. At their, yeah. They go to the food kitchen, the soup okay. food kitchen. And I think they do a great job, and they yeah. raise thousands of dollars that go back to the community in, not, in name of their son. So I wrote. And this support. will benefit the city's hungry and homeless. Yeah. So uh, moved by Councillor uh, Morocco, second by, uh, by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thank you. 9.19, Niagara Falls Public Library. Okay, moving that the recommendation that we appoint Kathy Sinopoulos. How do you say it? Sinopoulos. Sinopoulos. Thank you. Uh, to replace Eric Sheridan on the library's public board. Uh, moved by Councillor uh, Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Thank you. 9.20, on street parking permits. Uh, Mr. Recruit, <coughs> yes, uh, Councillor Thompson. Yes, so we have Mr. Dren just comment on how we can help out uh, with this situation. Yeah. Is, yes. anyone here for Is anybody here for the parking? Uh, <coughs> no, I don't think. No. Uh, Mr. Dren, uh, did you want to just give a real quick sure. summary? Quick summary is that uh, <coughs> the, uh, the renters at 90 or 6342 San Mario Fiesta Drive came in to apply for some overnight permits. And when they submitted the original application, uh, they, re they request, they had nine vehicles that they were trying to get approved originally. Um, in accordance with our bylaw, we deal with hardship. So hardship is based on the fact that you have a household that has five drivers, only four spots in the street. So hardship would be there's one vehicle that a driver has to put on the street. They would, be, they would qualify for, for a overnight permit. In this case, uh, we determined that the, the applicant was applying to store vehicles. And uh, with, with the neighborhood the way it is, with the smaller lots, um, and, and the fact that the overnight, uh, relief from the overnight permit would, would not satisfy it because there's a 12 hour bylaw as well. Um, so we indicated that he could only get one additional permit and we approved that. And, uh, and so as well, there were excessive number of complaints dealing with overnight uh, complaints and uh, several infractions were issued. And so um, we're just basically say, bringing the council up to speed to say, you know, our bylaw says deals with hardship. This is not hardship, this is storage of vehicles. So, uh, that's not the story he told me. <laughs> No, oh, I, I thought he wanted uh, a couple of permits for, he has five vehicles in the house. Uh, <coughs> and everybody in the house drives a car five. So um, maybe somebody could uh, move, we have uh, our staff investigate and see what we can do to help them out uh, with respect to the problem. Okay, yep, Mr. Dutch. 
So what we have, just to let you know, there's five people in the house. Um, three of the five had, have a vehicle each. Two of the five have three vehicles each. And so what happens is basically it's, it's meant for the bylaws in place to deal with people and the, the daily use vehicles and not for the storage of vehicles. There's many people in the city that have trailers, that have other cars, that store them off site and it costs them money uh, to do that. And, uh, and the bylaw is pretty, pretty strict with that. If you're going to store, because of the number of complaints we received on, on that street as well, there's people concerned about the fact that, these, that there's cars parked on the road all the time. Um, and, um, and so that's why the bylaws in place to, to deal with that. And not for, not for someone to come in and say, I want to store my vehicle on the road, so therefore I want to buy a permit. And I think that's the intent originally. Well, if uh, somebody has nine vehicles, uh, if you uh, can't pass uh, legislation to solve that problem. Uh, if it's an additional permit, I, I don't have a problem with that. If it was two, but uh, maybe we could, you could report back to us, uh, sure. see if there's any solutions. Uh, um, nine vehicles, uh, maybe he should buy a car lot. <laughs> <laughs> Parking garage. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'll refer it to staff to see if okay. they can. So motion by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Crater that we refer this to staff to see what uh, options there may be. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. All, all those in favor? I'm sorry, that's approved. Okay, um, 9.21, MNP Corporate Finance, Canada Games Torch Relay will be making a stop in Niagara and they're looking for nominations. Um, I guess the recommendation is for the information of council and if it, Okay, so uh, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario. All those in favor? Thank you. And uh, on to the bylaws. Do we have any new uh, bylaws, Mr. Craig? Actually, just before we jump to bylaws, we should ratify uh, uh, in camera. Oh, right. Is it not on the agenda? Or no, it didn't list on the agenda. Oh, okay. Uh, Council did meet earlier this evening in camera after uh, passing the appropriate resolution uh, in open council. There was. Uh, one matter that uh, is reporting back, and that is on the uh, report RNC 2018-11 concerning the McBain Community Center revised cafe agreement. And it was moved that council authorize the mayor and city clerk to act on behalf of the city to execute a lease agreement with 1939099 Ontario Corp. Uh, Vince and Catherine Moyer, uh, the new cafe operations at this McBain Community Center, and that staff report back to council before any future RFP for a cafe agreement be issued. Okay, so uh, motion to uh, accept the in camera. Councilor Peter Angel, second by Councilor Cario. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Motion to choose the bylaws. <laughs> I'll entertain a motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario to give the bylaws a first reading. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Uh, bylaws 2018-59 through to 2018-69, read a first time. Second motion by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Cario to give the bylaws a second and third reading. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Bylaws 2018-59 through to 2018-69, read a second and third time and passed. Okay, thank you for that. New business, uh, Councillor Crater. Uh, thank you, Worship. Just a couple short things. Um, I've spoken to uh, to uh, Mr. Holman on this and, and indicated I'm bringing it to Council. Um, I met with a number of residents and it's out in the rural area. It's on King Road and Morning Star. And um, they're asking if it's possible to put in a street light at that intersection. There's a post there already. There's been a, some homes built out there and uh, there's no lighting out in that particular area. So I did speak with Mr. Holm and he explained to me that we have a process and there's only so many that can be done over the course of a year. And that they just bring it up to council and ask the council if they would just uh, approve. Post Morning Star and King Street. 
Yeah, it's our area too. That you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's our area. I was out looking at. It. In fact, we were just <coughs> patching the road, some more city workers road there. Right. So I'd like to make that motion. Okay, moved by Councillor Crater, seconded by Councillor Peter Angelo, uh, that we have Municipal Works look into a light at the intersection of Morningstar and Post. Morningstar and King Road. Oh, and King, King I'm sorry. Morningstar is a little open draw lot. There's houses being built out there now. Oh, on the other end. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so let's call that vote. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Um, the other thing, I just want to be on record, and maybe some of the other <coughs> councillors may want to be on record too. There's, we all must have been getting all the emails and phone calls from the people about this Starbucks drive through that's being proposed on the corner of St. James at Thorlstone Road. Yep. And I understand the history of it. Um, I think that at the time they got approval, maybe it did fit at that time, but now it's, it's a night, it's a, it's a it's, de it's very dangerous out there, the school, schools and is there any opportunity, and I've been told no, but I'm going to ask it in open council, because I would say do the residents have a chance to come and make their presentation to explain why they have huge concerns of putting a drive through right there, and the staff has said to me no, it was already approved a number of years ago, so the people who bought the land now are saying we're going to build what was already approved before. And so that's why they're going ahead. And then I saw an email from our solicitor that said that if we were to step in, there might be some legal, legal ramifications to us for denying something that was already approved previously for which they bought the land for. Actually, I didn't send an email of that sort. Well, that was from Alex. Alex, okay. Yeah. Uh, and he okay. asked me to, uh, in turn to look into it. So at the moment, I'm trying to sort out some sort of, uh, if there is any kind of legal avenue. I'm not optimistic. Uh, but th that was it was it was requested, and there seemed to be a number of uh, councilors <coughs> requested in particular. There seemed to be some support around the table, and uh, Mr. Todd has directed me to look into it, and that's what I'm in the process of doing at the moment. Right. So what they're looking for simply is there an avenue where they get to express and share their concerns <coughs> about how dangerous it's become in that area. Also, there's been some homes there being built down in that area too. I think, I think that went through committee of adjustment. I think I attended that meeting Small. or an open house. Some homes built there in that That's area. Right. Peter Angel, there's some houses down. Yeah, thanks, you, Your Worship. Um, I did bring this issue up at Council, I think it was six years ago. It was an application that was made to the Committee of Adjustments for a variance on the number of cars that the developer was putting in their site plan in the queuing line waiting at a drive through. I believe that the proposal was to go from 10 cars of queuing down to eight, so they were asking for a variance of two. We had uh, no less than probably 50 residents out at the meeting. Um, the Committee of Adjustments did not approve the application. They did not receive approval uh, at that meeting. I ended up bringing it up at Council at the, at the very next meeting just to say, listen, Council, there was a lot of residents out there's a piece of property there that's zoned, has a commercial zoning on it, and everyone in the area does not want to drive through. They cited traffic concerns as being their number one concern. I believe that we had staff uh, do a report back to council, <coughs> basically said that we were uh, in some way restricted in what we can do in that area. I remember at the time giving a suggestion that perhaps we should be looking at purchasing some land in the area so that we can get the buses that are servicing the school off the street and get some of the actual parents that pick it up, that pick up their children or drop off their uh, children off the street, have a proper kiss and ride program. Um, we never went down that avenue. The city never acquired land. The developer, I guess, would have resubmitted another application, not asking for any variance. Because there was no variance asked for, it's not something that came to the approval of council. As well, uh, I believe council changed the way that we approve site plans. We allow the director of planning to approve site plans, whereas back in, I think it was 2011 and before, uh, site plans were done at the approval of council. So if we still had that process in place, 
I know I've spoken against that as well. Um, if we still had that process in place, I think council would have been aware that an application was made. Uh, I think all of us were unaware, entirely blindsided by the fact that, um, you know, this was a proposal that was on its way to moving forward. Uh, so had we have still had approval of the site plan process, then at least we would have had a say in what that could have looked like. So <coughs> council decided to give that up back in 2011. Um, I was opposed at that, at that time. So I'm thinking, uh, Councilor Curry, because I've spoken with the neighbors too. They, I've met with them, I've talked with them, and uh, I, because I, I, my kids go to the school down there too. And it's a real, pardon me? My mother lives in Canada. Right. So it's a real difficult situation, but I think, no, no disrespect, but hearing from the residents isn't going to help us. We have to legally approach this. We already know it's a problem, but we need to know if our solicitor can come forward with any kind. And that's what I've said to the residents. I said, I know the problems. I'm in this area every single day. I said, um, I, we need to know legally if there's anything that we can do. So maybe we can just direct, we've that's already got to see it. Yeah. That's exactly, you're saying exactly yeah. what I was leading towards is that um, if we can't do anything, I want to be able to say to the residents, we can't do because of the legal, right. whatever they are. But if we can, then I want to be able to come back here. Yep. So I'll make that a motion just so it's on record that our solicitor investigated yep. and let us know is there an option that we can follow to take another look at this without being legally liable. Right, if we do. okay, so okay. that's the motion, the motion. by Councilor Crater, second by Councilor Peter Angelo. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Great. And um, just two more, and they're really short. This is a do with uh, Mr. Dren, <coughs> to do with uh, commercial parking lots. So a year or so ago, we passed a motion here in Council mm -hmm. to standardize yep. uh, commercial parking lots. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's an agreement that they want to, among the parking lot owners, they want to go ahead with this. Um, what they're asking is, could we, and maybe Councillor Peter Angel can, can correct me, but I think it's they're asking for a one year extension from the date that they have to implement the changing of the parking lots to meet our new standards. Some of them, for example, had upgraded their parking lots to meet the standards that we had in place. And they stoned it, they did everything, but now they don't need it. So they're asking for just one more year, they'll give them time, because it's pretty expensive to upgrade it. And there seems to be support among the, the owners uh, for that. So I wanted to put that yep. on the table. So we've got Carl. two, two staff. Uh, Car Mr. Dren, you want to deal with this one? Uh, Mr. Lewis, you had your finger in the air too? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, go ahead. Uh, just for clarity, I'm not responsible for the for the approval of the the lots. It's done through the clerks and through licensing. However, we're a commenting body, as as a group, we're commenting bodies. So with the licensing, and I, I have dealt with a couple of the operators that are deficient at this point. So so the intent is is that what we're going to be doing is sending uh, letters to the operators, advising them that here's where your deficiencies are. If there are current concerns, if there are real concerns, like they're missing uh, a handicap uh, space or, a, or there's a driveway, we'll ask them to correct them now. But we are giving them until next year to put in place every, which includes the asphalt, the drainage, and all of that. So those letters are going to be funneled out probably in the next couple weeks to, to the operators. So people like, you know, that are on, like, say, a Charlie Berlin, who has a great looking lot, but doesn't there's still drainage issues and some space issues. He'll have time to do it. And when I spoke to, to him, he was satisfied with that. Uh, so we are going to do that. Okay. Council, so that's, that's closed. And so oh, th oh, sorry. So no, Council, on again. that point? Yeah, on that point. What about the ones that have been not doing what they're supposed to be doing for years and years and years, and they're still not doing it? Because I've heard it from the neighbors of those people, and they're not happy at all. I can give you the address if you like. Mr. CAO? Well, Mr. Mayor, if I may, uh, I think it's fair to say that there's been a number of years that we haven't done proper enforcement on commercial lots. There was a meeting held late last year, I think it was, with all the commercial lot owners, mm -hmm. and basically staff, there was a report that had come to council, and it said we're going to enforce the bylaw. There was a meeting of all of the lot owners. That's when we gave them the, the indication that 
uh, there would be sort of a grace period for 18, but in 19, uh, they would have to comply with all of those provisions. So that's the letters that are going out. So as of 19, if you don't comply, you don't get a license. Perfect. And we've got a lot of pressure too from the BI, uh, particularly the, the Victoria Center BIA, uh, with all of the six million dollars in work we've done along Victoria Avenue, it's not fair. They're saying it's it's not fair that we've done all this work. Uh, so that's what Mr. Dren refers to. I know we've got the uh, acting clerk and Mr. Hurlovich and a lot of the staff have been involved with this, including all the enforcement people. In the meantime, uh, Mr. Spencer and the enforcement people are out enforcing blatant violations, uh, solicitation, and things of that with with you know, people out on the street with signs and, and trying to attract people in. So they are doing that kind of enforcement. But in terms of the physical enforcement, uh, with the licensing period for 19, everybody's gonna to have to comply or they're not gonna get a license. Thank you, and that's it. Thank okay, <clears throat> great, uh, new business. Uh, I've got Tom Councilor Thompson. Um, thank you. They, uh, the parking lots, um, the, the, the BIA, <coughs> which I sit on the Victoria Center, wanted something done with uh, the parking lots. And the two calls I got were Frank LaPena and Charlie Berlin, the best uh, lots in the area. So anyway, that's uh, the solution to give them a chance until next year. Uh, uh, for the other real bad ones. Um, I have two short things. Um, I had a uh, letter from uh, Paul Krochuk, uh, solicitor in Chippewa, and he brought to my attention, um, is there anything you could do to recognize uh, Al Fagan, uh, late oh, yeah. Al yeah. Fagan? who passed away uh, several years ago, but was a dynamic individual in the city, uh, involved in so many worthwhile uh, efforts to make the city a better place in which to live. Uh, he was involved in every political campaign that I can remember uh, and was uh, sincerely um, instrumental in making our community a special place to live. He was actively involved also uh, on the committee when we were trying to get a casino here. And uh, I have the letter suggesting it be referred to our staff to see if uh, one of the uh, new subdivisions, a contractor could recognize Mr. Fagan's name. So I would pass that over and pass <coughs> Make that motion? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll have that, make that motion. Yeah. Okay. Moved by Councillor Thompson, second by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? Uh, that we recognize Al Fagan in some way in Chippewa with one of the new developments. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, the other one, um, the last meeting we had a lot of uh, controversy about thundering waters and uh, the decision with respect to that, in my opinion, was made in uh, 2008 when it was set aside for residential development, but 200 acres of the wetlands and uh, the environmental area were set aside. And we made the same decision this time uh, with some development and residential. And uh, I think that that's uh, a good decision because Finally, that wetlands is not going to be destroyed with uh, four-wheel vehicles and everything else racing through there. But I, I had a lot of trouble with making that decision. And uh, over the next week out driving through the city, um, I was amazed at the number of uh, uh, treed areas that are standing in our community uh, that people don't think we have any interest in that. And while I was out looking around, I got an email from our staff indicating that uh, uh, we had set aside four or five 
uh, environmental bush areas with the names on them all. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't this be a report to council rather than just an email? <clears throat> because we are conscious of the environmental and the woodland areas, and I think we should have a report to council just to uh, update us on the new ones that have been set aside. Who sent that email out? Was that? Uh, or did send it or receive it? No, did anybody send that out? <laughs> Maybe you sent Why? it out. I, I, no, I just got it in the last uh, week and a half. Uh, somebody sent it to me and it outlined the parks. So I think we should have a report uh, because <coughs> the impression is out there that we don't have any interest interest uh, in preserving uh, wetlands. Uh, we legally have to, and environmental areas, we certainly take that seriously. So I'd like to have a report uh, indicating uh, the new ones that were mentioned in this email. <laughs> I'll see if I can find it. Yeah. And. Uh, all the other ones that we have out there, there it's, it's uh, substantial. So I'd like to have a report uh, at least giving us the email again. <laughs> okay, motion for, from Councillor Thompson, <clears throat> second from Councillor Creator. That we get a report back on wetlands and, and woodlots uh, in the city pertaining to the email that he received <laughs> once he finds the email. All those in favor? Okay, thank you for that. New business? Councilor Peter Angelo. Thank you, Your Worship. Do you just have a couple of short ones? Yeah, I just have a couple. I'll try not to be as long as Councilor Thompson. However, I did miss new business uh, from last meeting, Your Worship, so I got a couple carryovers. Um, first one I wanted to mention is the Youth Mental Health Center. I think it was back in May that the uh, Ministry of Children and Youth Services announced that Niagara was going to be the recipient of a new mental health center mm -hmm. for children. And I, and I think it's a great initiative. Uh, the one thing I was going to mention, obviously it's gonna be the region who is going to be um, in communication with the ministry. And so I wanted to see your worship if it was possible to pass a resolution over to the region. I feel very strongly that it needs to be at one of our major hubs. Um, we have the intermunicipal transit system and that intermunicipal transit system has a few major hubs, I believe there's four of them in St. Catharines, uh, one in Niagara Falls, and I think only one in Welland. But in order for someone, I mean, some of these services, the reason why I mention this is some of these services are on outer lying areas of different municipalities. And, and I'm not trying to be parochial. I don't think that, you know, I'm not standing up and saying it's gotta be in Niagara Falls, but I think it's gotta be on, that, on uh, one of those hubs for the IMT, simply because if you have someone from Fort Erie who's trying to get to that regional center, there's only one of them in the region, that person from Fort Erie has to take a bus to Niagara Falls and then catch the IMT to one of the major hubs in St. Catharines. If they then have to catch a further bus from there, then it would just be adding on time again. So it could take them possibly three hours to get to just to the center and then another three hours to get home. And I just don't think it's fair. So I really think that it should be a long one of the major hubs for the IMT, and I'll be happy whatever city it lands in, so long as it's easily accessible. So I'd be happy to make that motion that, um, that uh, I guess it get past the region and the region be in communication with the ministry responsible, and that would be the Ministry of Children and Youth Services, Your Worship. Okay, so that and that'd be, be on an arterial road with uh, direct uh, IMT access. Exactly, yeah. Okay, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, you already mentioned uh, opening up the parks and how the new parks have artificial turf, so I've already been asked by a couple of residents when their wood chips are gonna be replaced <laughs> with artificial turf uh, in their neighborhoods. So is there a plan, Your Worship? Like I know we're doing another 10 parks this year. I know it is our plan to update all parks but for those that have already been updated, do we have a plan yet to go back and take a look at the surfaces that the kids play on and maybe take out the wood chips and put in artificial surfaces? Maybe we should make a motion to have staff come back with a plan? As long as it's before the end of council, or at the end of this council term, the report I'm talking about. Oh yeah, well, I don't, I would, 
I mean, I don't want to make a motion that a report come back next time. Uh, well, uh, Mr. Mayor, through you, uh, the uh, there's no there's no budget allocation right now. It would have to be a 219 budget item. We got through the 20 parks over the last two years. I understand. The longer term plan is to replace all of them, but it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to just replace um, with artificial turf when you're going to be looking at replacing the playground equipment. Perhaps in those areas where there's newer equipment that's not going to be replaced, it, it may be viable, but um, you know, we could have staff report back, but I think it would be a longer term sort of capital, uh, you know, a, a 2019 capital item that we'd have to report. Okay. Like Jupiter Park, I know it's an example, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah, just redone. Just done, yeah. Exactly, yeah, I mean, I'd be happy with the report, Your Worship, <clears throat> just letting us know the status and, you know, what percentage we are in terms of changing over. I'll make that a motion. Okay, <coughs> excuse me, moved by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor Crater, that we have staff come back with a report on the status of our parks uh, and uh, the newer ones that could be upgraded with the uh, artificial turf instead of the wood chips. Yeah, right. While we're on parks, your worship. Um, Did you I'll want to make that? Can I call that vote? Yeah. Okay. Vote. All those in favor? Okay. I'm just trying to hurry up. Because Thank I you. Everyone's ready. I really appreciate yeah. that. Um, while we're on while we're on the issue of parks, um, there's a picture of Wayne Thompson, but it's not the article that corresponds with it, your worship. This is about the uh, this is about the parks and the policy that council adopted to get rid of a lot of the tennis courts. Uh, the people that live around Glengate Park have signed a petition, I'll hand it to the clerk. Um, their park is one of two parks in the city that council made the decision to simply get rid of their tennis courts and not replace it with anything. So uh, they would really like a multi-purpose facility or tennis courts. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that staff um, have a neighborhood meeting with them and ask them what they want and then sure council be invited and that then the report come back to council so that at least we can do what the residents want in their area for their park and i really think that that should be the standard throughout the uh, city so i'll make that a motion i'll hand the petition to the clerk moved by councilor pierangelo <coughs> seconded by councilor crater that uh, for the, so it was glengate and Glengate Park. Uh, just Glengate Park, okay. Yeah. We have a public meeting with the residents and that we come back with some recommendations for multi-use or tennis courts. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Okay, moving along with parks. Uh, trail connections, Your Worship. I, I, I got three that I identified. So first of all, the Millennium Trail to the Niagara Parks Commission. Uh, it, it's been years now. Um, we really, we need a connection there. Um, another one that, that, that I know is in the Gardner West subdivision. Uh, the trail meanders through the subdivision <coughs> and then it's cut off and then it reconvenes uh, another block down and goes in behind the woodlot or in, in behind homes where the woodlot is. Um, so there's a piece of the Gardner West Trail missing there. And then the third one that I can think of is um, the trail that winds through the Gardner West, comes to McGarry and then it's cut off. There's the city stormwater management pond and then it picks up again on the south side of McLeod Road, and there's no connection in between <coughs> McLeod and McGarry. I know these have already been approved through council. That's, that's what I'm uh, saying. Um, I don't know what the holdup is, but I mean, if staff could report back on the status of it and when it will be done, um, I would appreciate it. I'd be happy to make that a motion. Okay, so motion uh, by Councillor Peter Angelo, second by Councillor <coughs> Crater that we get an update on the trail uh, between McLeod and McGarry. Is that the one uh, that's already been approved by council? Is that the one? Yeah, there's three, uh, there's three connections mm -hmm. that, 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 one on the that I Parkway. think are missing. Yeah, on, on the parkway. Yeah. There's one in the Gardner West subdivision West. Um, that uh, I believe it goes from, I think it might be Upper Canada Drive over to in behind uh, where, we, uh, where we have that PSW um, in behind the homes. The trail actually goes in behind the homes. Okay. There's a connection missing there. And then the third one would be from McGarry to McLeod okay. in the same subdivision. So an update on the three, status of the three trails. Uh, all those in favor? Okay, that's approved. All right, next item is uh, GNBA, Your Worship. Um, meetings were held with staff regarding uh, the purchase of um, uh, batting cages for the Summer Canada Games. Um, this should have been in the report in May that came back to council regarding the um, uh, monies that we had left to spend from uh, 2017 OLG agreement. Um, 
the staff are supportive of it. Uh, <coughs> I'll make a motion right now that uh, that the batting cages be purchased. Um, if anyone would like verification, I'm sure you can have staff just simply comment on it. Okay. Second. Okay. Uh, second by Councillor uh, uh, Crater. All those in favor? Okay, and that's approved. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, next one I got is uh, Walk for Down Syndrome. I know an invitation came to um, your office. I just wanted to make sure that that invitation gets sent to all the council. So I believe that the walk is uh, sometime in September. In September? Uh, yeah, I okay. believe so. So I wanted to make it official. I believe I have to do things to motion in order for it to be official. Yeah. Um, but I want the invitation sent to all of council so that all the council is aware of the walk. Anytime anything comes to mayor and council, it always gets circulated through the clerk's office, 100% okay. of the time. But just to make sure, in case they never did it like that, the salutation, we'll just make the so that we'll make sure the. Uh, oh yeah, Not if they come. Oh yeah, if they do, if it says that on it, it always goes down. That's our policy. So uh, the Down syndrome walk in September, that it could be the invitations be extended to all of council. Do you have the date for that, councillor? Uh, I could look it up, but it would be on my in September. Summary. Yeah, okay. Be buried in my email. So that was motioned by you, second by Councillor Thompson. All those in favor? Okay, and that's a officially motion. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, next item was we all received an email uh, tonight uh, or this afternoon. It was in regards to. In regards, it's not 11 o'clock yet, and, and it's not even live. Um, He's only on page one. It was in regards to. Uh, it was in regards to LK, uh, LKQ, Your Worship. Um, What's that? L LKQ, I think, is the. Um, um, uh, the wreckers that operates out at uh, Willowdale and Marshall. Um, this is uh, this has come to <coughs> council before. I mean, I'm not sure if people actually remember the history of this, but um, uh, the the business was purchased. Um, the business owned land that was adjacent as well. Um, city staff uh, made the decision that um, the non-conforming use was available across all of the lands that were now owned by uh, LKQ. So therefore, the, um, the business expanded. The residents were not happy. They came to council. Council was told, we, we have no say in the matter. Um, there was an application to expand the non-conforming use that came to Committee of Adjustments. Um, that was approved as, 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 part of, as part of the condition. They, uh, they have to go through the site plan process. <coughs> um, one of the criteria for the site plan process is a survey. I believe we got an email from one of the residents saying, I just want to see the survey. Um, I'm not sure what staff's response is. Uh, I don't really want to um, say. It's in the email. Um, so uh, I'd like to see the criteria for the site plan process followed. Um, that means that if a survey as part of the criteria, then a survey should be provided and the resident should have the ability to see that survey. I think what the resident is saying is that um, you have to look at the whole of the lands instead of looking at just part of the lands in order to see the big picture. I know Mr. Herlovich will want to speak to it. Um, so uh, again, I, I just want to make sure that we're dotting our I's and crossing our T's. I know the residents in the area are not happy about it. Um, so, I just want to make sure that the process that we're following is correct. Okay. Mr. Erlebich. I too want to see the policy is correct. The Committee of Adjustment and the Councilor would know this, he's Chair of the Committee, said that the site plan was to apply to the portion of the lands next to where the building addition is, <coughs> not to the entirety of the property. So if the councillor is now asking that the site plan apply to the whole of the property, that's different than what the committee stated in their decision. In the meantime, I have asked our staff member responsible for site plans to get a survey from LKQ. Um, that hopefully will address that portion of the uh, complaint. Um, the other portion of the complaint was that the site plan as submitted did not show the buildings on the adjacent lands, the adjacent lands next to where the building addition is, is the Hilton property, owned by the family name Hilton, I don't mean the Hilton Hotel. Um, the other property is not next to that, it's next to 35 acres of land that's subject to a 
site plan that was approved by the MOE. Um, it has been the position of staff in the past that since there's an, <coughs> excuse me, a provincial um, site plan on a portion of the land, then that trumps a at the 2018 Canadian Gymnastics Championships. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that she uh, be recognized uh, by yourself and by council. Um. <coughs> uh, moved by Councillor Peter Angel, second by Councillor Thompson, that Ava get recognized here in council chambers. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. I'd like to as well acknowledge, I know I mentioned this one before, um, Matt Masterson coaches the uh, girls Adam hockey team. Uh, they won a bronze medal um, in the provincials this year. Uh, I know I talked about it at council. I thought they were going to be recognized. Apparently, um, staff made a decision to not have them recognized. Had I have known, I would have brought it up at council again, but no one informed me. Um, I, think, <coughs> I think perhaps staff should acquaint themselves with what a grading system is. Um, finishing third in the province is quite an accomplishment. So I will make a motion again to have that team down here to be recognized as well. And which team is that, I'm sorry? It's That's the uh, girls Adam hockey. Second, your worship. Okay, move by Ken. <coughs> yes, Ms. Holden, how are you? Yes. And through to the mayor. The um, current policy, just so council is aware of sports athletic recognition, is that we recognize the, um, the gold medal, the first place, it, it doesn't speak to um, silver or bronze on the provincial level. It's the gold level. Yeah, and that's why I said, I mean, maybe um, grading system should be something that, uh, um, that is looked at, Your Worship. Okay. I'll so, leave it at that. Okay, so you've got a motion. Um, second by Councillor Crater. All those in favor? Yeah. yeah. On that motion, did we actually issue an invitation to Ben Harper? Hockey's over, and they said no. I think you should reissue that now that hockey's over and he's actually located in one place, because we've tried this twice now. Yeah, my last item, Your Worship, oh. is is my last item, the Millennium Clock. Um, what are we doing with the Millennium Clock? It's been. Uh, it's been broken for probably a year and a half, hasn't worked. Um, there doesn't really seem to be much of anything. Uh, well, it's still there. Capped over. The thing is, I mean, that's what I mean. Like, it's really lost its prominence. Um, it seems like we're just kind of, uh, um, I don't want to say letting it go, um, but it would be nice to have a plan to do something with it. The corner that it's at right now, um, with the signs that have been built around it, uh, as I just finished saying, it seems like it's lost its prominence. It really should be in a park setting, which is where we originally had it, but then the redevelopment of Optimist happened. So it's kind of now sandwiched in between commercial areas. I don't even know that people recognize it anymore when they drive by. Um, a place like Fireman's Park, somewhere like that, uh, would be a much better location. Uh, somewhere where it can actually get some prominence. As I said, I know Paisley was uh, instrumental in getting that clock, um, very adamant about the clock. So part of my motion would be that staff reach out to uh, Paisley as well and to have a conversation. And I, I just want to know what our plans are for the clock because I think that we could have better plans than what we're doing with it now. That's all. Ms. Smith, you, is the councillor suggesting we relocate it? Is that what you're looking for? Uh, I think we should look at all options, but yeah. Because we've had it on the capital list and it just hasn't made the list. I mean, it's there. We had quotes on it and it just didn't make the priority list. We had other priorities that were higher <coughs> than that. Uh, we can dig we those. Relocate. Well, that's what I'm suggesting. Well, I don't know if we can, but I mean, as I said, I think we have to look at options. Well, oh. I've so, all the plaques are there and everything else. We have to have a and game plan for it. It hasn't worked in a year and a half. <laughs> but if I may, Mr. Mayor, the, the, clock, the clock estimate was done. Uh, I think we had reported to council before that we took the old clock out and capped it. Uh, we've had estimates. It's been on, I think it's been on the tab 10 list for probably two years now. It's just never made its way up the list to a priority. We've had other priorities that 
that took precedence over it. So we're happy to report back, but I just want to make sure we're clarified the motion you're suggesting that we look at the cost of relocating it is what you're wanting. Well, sometimes they move a house. They move a whole house. Could they move it in one big? Well, that's fine, Mr. Mayor. I'm just like, I mean, if staff's going to investigate it, we just need to know if that's the intent. I just think it's lost its prominence. So we got a motion by Councilor Pierangel that we look at the option of moving the, yeah, we, we're still good. We're just good. But just look at options for the Millennium Clock, including the idea of moving it to Fireman's Park. But I think we need to reach out to Paisley. And reaching out to Paisley, January. Yeah. Sorry, but do we have four? We've got five. Yeah. So yeah, one, two, three, four, five. Yep, we're good. So uh, second by Councilor Crater. All those in favor? Okay, that's approved. Can we adjourn? Okay, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody.